Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The senator, oh, there being none, I'll call the clerk. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement um, of no more than five minutes, in fact it won't be anywhere near that, to seek clarification about the government sitting program. In two minutes, yeah. Leave is granted for two minutes. Uh, thank you very much. and I do thank um, uh, senators for giving me leave. Um, look, the opposition would like to understand the intentions of the government in relation uh, to two bills in particular, acknowledging that we sat last night to deal with time critical bills. There's a number of time critical bills to be that are listed on the program today. I'm conscious that there is um, also limited uh, time for government business over Wednesday and Thursday, and the opposition would like to understand how the government intends to deal with the environment protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment, Streamlining Environmental Approvals Bill 2020 and the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Standards and Assurance Bill 2021. We know that those bills both require substantive debate. They're not listed on the program today. Um, we would like to understand from the government how they intend to deal with those bills um, before the, the Senate adjourns at the end of uh, tomorrow's sitting. Government wish to Respond, Senator Birmingham. I seek leave to make a short statement of not more than two minutes. The leave is granted for two minutes. Thank, uh, I thank the Senate. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, well, I thank Senator Gallagher for uh, for her question uh, and interest in that regard. Uh, the government certainly welcomes interest from uh, from the opposition in relation to the EPBC uh, amendments. Uh, those amendments, as uh, as we've traversed in the Senate in different ways and well known, uh, seek to try to streamline approvals processes between. Commonwealth jurisdiction and state jurisdictions, and to ensure uh, that the cost and impact uh, of, uh, of getting uh, a development approved uh, is reduced uh, without undermining or reducing the environmental protections. Uh, the government would very much welcome uh, the Labor Party uh, indicating uh, its support uh, to pass that legislation, and, uh, and if that were the case, uh, then of course we would cooperate uh, to ensure its swift passage uh, to provide that certainty for Australian business uh, and to ensure that Australian business and to ensure that Australian business had the certainty and has the uh, has the opportunity uh, to get projects off the ground at the least possible cost with the least possible waste of time with the least possible duplication whilst ensuring whilst Order. ensuring so I'm hearing uh, I'm hearing the opposition is uh, is ready to uh, debate it. And what we would like to know is whether they are ready to support it, as Senator Gallagher has indicated, Order as the senator has indicated. Uh, there are a series of time-critical bills, and I thank the opposition for their cooperation in the passage of a number of those last night. And we look forward to working through a number of others today and tomorrow. Uh, should the opposition uh, be willing to indicate its support for the passage of the EPBC reforms, then of course the government would list it for tomorrow and work with the opposition to secure its passage. Uh, but if you're not Order. supporting it, Senator, uh, then of course we must prioritise those time critical bills, and that is what the government will do. All right, I'll now call the clerk to call on business. Government clerk. business order of the day number one, biosecurity amendment strengthening, strengthening penalties bill 2021, presumption of second reading debate. Yes, 
Um, I do have Senator Stirl on the list, but I, am I calling Senator Keneally on the biosecurity? Uh, I have Senator Stirl, but he's not here. I can go to. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Labor will be supporting this bill. As outlined in the explanatory memorandum, the purpose of the Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Penalties Bill 2021 is to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 by increasing the maximum penalties that a court can impose for non-compliance with requirements under the Act. Penalties will be increased for specific existing civil penalty provisions to provide a proportionate regulatory response to the conduct covered by those provisions and increases the penalties for specified criminal offences to ensure uh, appropriate punishment for those who jeopardise Australia's biosecurity uh, status by breaking the law. The explanatory memorandum states, in the face of growing regional and global threats such as African swine fever and hitchhiker pests, such as the capra beetle, the current penalty regime needs reinforcement to provide an effective deterrent against non-compliance. The explanatory memorandum also states that with trade and travel expected as part of the economic recovery from the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it is expected to accentuate the threats making it imperative to send a strong message that breaking Australia's biosecurity laws is not worth the potential commercial gain. Under the Act, penalties for a contravention may include either a civil penalty, a criminal offence or both. The increases to the civil penalties are intended to deter non-compliance with the Act and to ensure the maximum penalties available reflect the gains that individuals and businesses might obtain or seek to obtain from gaining, engaging in conduct that jeopardises Australia's biosecurity status. The civil penalties will be set at a level that means the penalty is not merely perceived as a cost of doing business. This is particularly the case for corporations. There are 28 separate penalties being increased. For example, some will increase from 120 penalty units to 300 penalty units. Others will include increases from 300 penalty units to 100 to 1,000 penalty units. It is noted that the explanatory memorandum states the bill would have no financial impact on the Australian government budget. But of course, uh, Madam Deputy President, Labor has concerns about the bill. It's clear the Morrison government has shifted away from a biosecurity levy that was recommended in an industry review back in 2017 and moved to a penalty-based system that relies on a court determining if a civil or criminal offence has taken place. The bill appears to be just another ad hoc measure reliant on the court system to apply penalties rather than a genuine attempt to upgrade Australia's biosecurity arrangements. Labor has spoken to many farmers and other stakeholders across the agriculture sector and they continue to raise concerns about Australia's biosecurity system. It's clear there's been a huge policy void over the past few years when it comes to the Morrison government doing anything of note around strengthening Australia's biosecurity system. This has been extremely disappointing given the significant risks pests and disease could have on Australian produce. Labor also wants to take this opportunity to put on the record our ongoing concerns in relation to the Morrison government's current management of Australia's biosecurity system. We know that Australia's biosecurity system underpins more than $60 billion in agricultural production, $53 billion of agricultural exports, as well as $42 billion in relation to the country's inbound tourism industry. It is estimated that the cost of a single outbreak of disease or pests have been conservatively estimated to exceed $50 billion. So, with so much at risk, where has the government's urgency been to update Australia's biosecurity system over the past eight years? We've already seen the Morrison government axe a biosecurity levy. As already mentioned, this levy was a recommendation made in 2017 as part of the Craik Review. This report included 42 recommendations and found that the system was underfunded. At the March estimates, the department revealed the government's progress in relation to the Craik Review. In four years, the government has only completed 17 of the 42 recommendations. 12 recommendations require enduring effort. Eight 
are in progress, and four require no further action, and one recommendation is on hold. Given the serious risks to Australia's agricultural sector, this slow response from the Morrison government is not good enough. So this brings me to the biosecurity funding that was included in the budget. The budget's commitments to biosecurity make up, just makes up for what the Morrison government was planning to take away after the biosecurity levy failed. It's not good enough that farmers were left for years waiting to see what the government would do to update Australia's biosecurity arrangements. This budget is a missed opportunity and Australian farmers deserve better. And we've also seen a number of amendments needing to be made to legislation regarding biosecurity. There was a bill that's now passed the parliament last month that was essentially fixing a past drafting issue. There must be confidence in Australia's biosecurity system, given it protects the agriculture industry from pests and disease. But the Morrison government, having to amend the Act over past drafting issues, reduces the confidence the agriculture sector has to adequately maintain Australia's biosecurity framework. And further reducing confidence was the publication last week of the Australian National Audit Office report around biosecurity. The findings of the ANAO report are extremely concerning. The ANAO concludes that the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment's arrangements to respond to non-compliance with biosecurity requirements are largely inappropriate. What does this say about the Morrison government's interests around biosecurity risks? The ANAO's findings in relation to the inadequacies of Australia's biosecurity system must be taken seriously. A biosecurity system that is deemed to be inappropriately managed has massive implications for the agriculture sector and it puts Australian farmers in a very vulnerable position and that is totally unacceptable. The ANAO report also validates numerous and serious concerns raised by farmers and the agriculture sector. As already mentioned, biosecurity threats and inadequacies of the current system are issues that are consistently raised with Labor and no doubt MPs from all parties. Incursions of pests and disease are of great concern to farmers who know the significant risks if and when Australia's biosecurity system fails them. The Morrison government must do better for the agriculture sector when it comes to Australia's biosecurity system. Of course, Madam Deputy uh, President, we know there are other issues impacting on the agriculture sector that the Morrison government uh, has failed to address, even though the government knows the impact these issues are having on Australian farmers. For example, the Morrison government has known that there is a structural reliance on migrant workers to pick produce on Australian farms. This reliance has been occurring for some time. The COVID-19 pandemic further highlighted this structural reliance given the issues of travel and quarantine arrangements over the past year. Labor has written to Minister Littleproud three times now about our concerns around the agriculture workforce shortage first in January, then in February, and another letter in April. And why have we written so often to Minister Littleproud? Because he promised to fix the workforce shortage because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The minister has admitted there are 25,000 pre-vetted and work-ready Pacific Island workers. The minister promised these workers were ready to go, but clearly they were not. It's one of those classic Morrison government marketing moments. All announcement, no delivery. Where are these 25,000 pre-vetted workers? How many of them are working on Australian farms? There are obviously not enough workers because produce is rotting on Australian farms. It's just another broken Morrison government promise. And what's in the budget? Well, the Morrison government has mi again missed an opportunity to properly fix Australia's uh, agriculture workforce issues and set the industry up for growth. The question for the government is, what measures in the budget will help farmers pick their produce today? Not next year, not the year after, but today. 
There's a grab bag of half measures and pilot programs that will not solve the serious issues in Australia's agriculture workforce today. The minister said in March that the government will continue to address the immediate needs of our, farm, of our farmers when it comes to workforce. But where are the budget measures that go towards addressing these immediate needs? There are none. When you look at the funding in the budget for employment in the agriculture sector, it is either over two or four years. No funding to help farmers now. Even the minister's media release didn't give workforce any attention. That gives you an idea of the lack of attention this government has given to the workforce shortage in agriculture. In the budget, there's no substantial response to the agriculture workforce strategy that was handed to the Morrison government more than six months ago. The budget predicts COVID-19 restrictions that have caused huge labor shortages and crop losses on farms will last another year. But there's no plan to deal with this issue in agriculture now. We know the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to a serious shortage of workers across Australian farms. However, the Morrison government has long been aware of these structural issues with the agriculture workforce, long before COVID, and they've done nothing to address this chronic labor shortage. What is clear is the minister continues to turn his back on the seasonal worker program and quarantine arrangements, both of which are the responsibility of the Morrison government. The government has done nothing. The latest figures from the National Crop Loss Register indicate that these labor shortfalls have resulted in around $50 million of crop losses to date. $50 million of crop losses. That is a national shame. Produce is rotting and being dumped by farmers because this government couldn't deliver on their announcement, their promise to deliver 25,000 pre-vetted workers. So nothing from this government for the immediate workforce issues for, uh, for, for farmers, and that is a great disappointment. Over the medium to longer term, we look forward to seeing the Morrison government's formal response to the National Agriculture Workforce Strategy Report. Given the strategy has been on the desk of the minister since October last year, we really should be seeing a response sooner rather than later. On top of the bushfires, the drought, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the workforce shortage, we know we have another crisis that farmers and regional communities, particularly in my home state of New South Wales, have to face, and that is the mouse plague. The mouse plague is now impacting across multiple states. Is there a national response from the Morrison government? No. The response from the nationals is not to come up with a plan to deal with the mouse plague, it's just to come up with a plan to deal with their former leader and install a new leader in Barnaby Joyce. Has there been a request from the Morrison government to fix the mouse plague with a national response? Yes, there has. Labor has written to the minister calling on him to help the states fix this crisis. Instead, the nationals have been too busy fixing the crisis inside their own party room. The New South Wales Agriculture Minister, the Liberal Agriculture Minister in New South Wales, the Liberal uh, Coalition Agriculture Minister, has written to the Morrison government asking for it to provide assistance with the mouse plague. So we've got the Nats and the Libs in New South Wales asking for federal help from the Morrison government to assist with the mouse plague. We have no response from the Morrison government. I'm concerned about the impact the plague is and will continue to have across Australian farms. New South Wales farmers have already estimated that the plague has already cost $1 billion, $1 billion to lost crops. The mouse plague has to be discussed with state and territory agriculture ministers. I hope the minister puts the mouse plague at the top of the agenda when he next meets with them. Madam Deputy President, Australian farmers must have confidence and certainty that the Morrison government will manage the biosecurity system so we can protect and mitigate any risks to our agriculture industry from pests and disease. It's a huge risk to our agriculture sector, with production being more than $60 billion. It is clear from the experts that the Morrison government has more work to do to make sure that our biosecurity system is well-resourced and not at risk of failing. Labor will be keeping a close eye on how the Morrison government continues to manage 
are vital for our security system. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, the Greens support the, uh, the intention of this bill to raise penalties to make sure that um, compliance with biosecurity laws or lack of compliance with biosecurity laws aren't just a cost of doing business for some, uh, for some enterprises or, or some individuals. Uh, we accept that uh, higher penalties provide a level of uh, increased deterrence or, uh, I suppose, uh, a push to get more compliance. Uh, however, um, the, uh, the punitive system uh, of applying penalties still relies on uh, court cases, potentially in the case of criminal offences. I understand this covers civil and cri criminal offences, but certainly this requires, the, uh, firstly, uh, resourcing so that non-compliance can be detected, uh, which can be through a whole range of different uh, measures. Uh, through to actually uh, levying the penalties and then, of course, getting convictions in courts. So it's a long and difficult process, and I think it's already been alluded to in here. The alternative uh, was a, a levy-based system, uh, which has been uh, rejected by the government. Um, being a Tasmanian, I uh, am especially aware of the vulnerability of uh, my uh, agricultural community uh, and our clean, green and clever exports. Uh, to the world uh, and to the nation are very vulnerable to uh, biosecurity risks. Uh, we uh, only very recently saw a fruit fly outbreak in Tasmania that literally brought um, the stone fruit and, uh, and other industries to their knees for, for well over 12 months. Uh, and uh, The potential uh, biosecurity outbreaks like that can cripple uh, our agricultural enterprises. Um, I commend uh, the, you know, the collaborative approach uh, with regulators to stamp that out. Uh, it took a, lot, a long time and there was a lot of work done on compliance, but eventually it was successful. But it's not the kind of thing we want to see uh, in future. And uh, I note that it, uh, with that outbreak, it's still very uncertain as to what was the source of that. And having uh, had my own agricultural enterprise, having had a vineyard, um, I'm well aware of uh, the pests and diseases. Uh, across many horticultural and other agricultural industries that farmers are constantly having to, uh, to fight against uh, to be sustainable and to produce uh, crops. Uh, of particular concern to me, uh, working uh, in the wine industry, was uh, European wasps. And If you want an example of a biosecurity breach and a risk, uh, and once again, nobody still can to, to this day point to exactly when European wasps made their way into Australia and, and Tasmania. It's believed they came in on cargo shipments uh, in, as, as early as the 1960s uh, and went undetected. And of course, they are a massive problem, and not just agricultural uh, crops uh, like grapes. I've, I've had my entire, in one year, I had my entire Riesling crop stripped by European wasps before we could pick it. And I know that wasn't uncommon. Uh, but they uh, are also a massive threat to biodiversity in Tasmania because they are capable of stripping an entire area of its insect life uh, as they go through uh, a protein phase, then they go into a sugar phase uh, where they tend to go into agricultural crops. So it's, it, is a, it is, I think, the textbook example of uh, why we need to have much stronger compliance on biosecurity and the kind of uh, unintended consequences of having a system that allows pests and diseases to spread. Um, I uh, also note uh, what's been uh, talked about in the chamber today, that uh, this, uh, this bill that we have before us today has come uh, many years, like eight years, into a process of looking at how we can better manage biosecurity risks in this country. There doesn't seem to have been any urgency at a federal level at all to update our biosecurity system. Um, the Craik Review, which was released in 2017, included 42 recommendations and found that the system that we had in place, and I remember being on the RAC committee when this exact system was being looked at, and I remember, crikey, do I remember some of the criticisms of uh, Senator Bill Heffernan from this place about the biosecurity system and what we needed to do to update it. Um, but out of that 42 recommendations, I understand that only, uh, only, only eight recommendations have been implemented. 
eight recommendations out of 42. Um, and yeah, this is this is kind of window dressing when we look at the the, the bigger picture. Um, what is one of the biggest vectors for the spread of biosecurity risks for pests and diseases? It's climate change. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that today because I think uh, if we're talking about biosecurity and future threats to biosecurity and how we manage those risks, we need to talk about how we're going to manage climate change. And I've got, a, uh, I've got an interesting panel discussion here that was reported in the Farm Online National, uh, and this was back in, uh, back in April 2017. Um, and it was a panel discussion at the New South Wales Farm Riders Conference, Biosecurity, National Strategies and International Challenges. And uh, had a number of interesting speakers at it, including uh, Rennie Lear, Pastoral Company Director Lucinda Corrigan, who was formerly a Meat and Livestock Director, Australia Director. And she said altered weather patterns had changed the biosecurity challenge for her cattle enterprise, located in New South Wales. Climate change is a major factor for the spread of pests, weeds and diseases which have spread south from hotter areas, said Mrs Corrigan. Uh, an example she gave was Thialaria, a blood cell-destroying parasite carried by cattle ticks, which had appeared in their region over a, a short period of time. A virulent, a virulent form of the disease appeared in the Murray Valley 10 years ago, and some people lost 10 per cent of their stock, calves and cows. She went on to list flea blain and subtropical weeds, which she had said had spread into her district, uh, with changed rainfall patterns, which of course uh, had significant impacts on the viability uh, of their operations. Um, that panel then went on to uh, discuss other challenges from climate change. Professor Tim Reeves from the University of Melbourne Primary Industries Climate Challenges Centre uh, said climate change will bring an added degree of difficulty to the already onerous task of biosecurity and managing biosecurity risks. Climate change is really important when modelling likely incursions and where and how they might spread, said Professor Reid, uh, who is also a Crawford Fund board member. While some very good research is being done, climate change brings a third element to the task, he said. If we manage biosecurity with a and this is really important, Senators, if we manage biosecurity with a steady as she goes approach on climate change, business as usual, it is highly unlikely that we'll get satisfactory outcomes in biosecurity management in the coming years. And Senators can read more of his contribution on that article themselves. Uh, if you want. He talks further about the balance between summer and winter rainfall patterns uh, across the continent and how that uh, has led to changes uh, and, of course, around uh, extreme weather events, which he said uh, uh, create the spread of plants with high wind events, while changing rainfall patterns could alter the range of pests, bringing new biosecurity threats into different regions. It will impact on the number and type of exotic pests and diseases that can survive and thrive in certain regions. For example, northern Victoria is no longer a winter-dominant climate but has a uniform rain throughout the year. A shift of moisture conditions of that nature will change many things, including the ability of pests and diseases to encroach on new areas. Now, sharing the panel at that event uh, with uh, Ms Corrigan and the professor was Australia's uh, inaugural Inspector General of Biosecurity, uh, Dr Helen Scott Orr who is also coordinator of the New South Wales Crawford Fund and its training program and the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. Uh, Dr Orr said the focus of her role, to which she was appointed on a three-year term—this is going back to 2017—within um, the Federal Agriculture and Water Department's performance and biosecurity functions. Uh, she said that reviewing uh, incursions into Australia's pests and disease over the past 10 years, hitchhikers and contaminants that have come into cargo, which is not subject to onerous quarantine regulations, invasive exotic mosquitoes and the military's application of biosecurity regulations for when its own forces return from overseas, as well as our regulation of overseas forces that travel to Australia. She added um, a number of uh, comments there that she added about biosecurity risks that need to be managed around climate change. Uh, what is my point here? My point, it's, my point is really obvious. Um, we have a party in this Senate, in this country, that has 4 per cent of the national vote, the Australian uh, the National Party, that is in coalition with the Liberal Party, 
that has a gun to the head of the Liberal Party, that is clearly a climate-denying party, that doesn't represent farmers, purports to represent farmers but doesn't represent farmers, that have just toppled their previous leader, Mr McCormack, in the other place and inserted uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce in the other place, who is openly a climate denier, who refuses to uh, entertain the idea of even weak 2050 emissions targets. We hear this morning that he's come, there's come some kind of secret deal done behind closed doors to keep their coalition together, uh, where the farmers will be paid to take climate action, which they already are, and they certainly were under Greens' Labor uh, climate action plans. But what, what's my point? Climate change is a threat to biosecurity. It's a threat to farmers across a whole range of factors. It's a threat to farmers because of changes to rainfall, because of extreme weather events, because of extreme heat waves. It's a threat to farmers because of biosecurity. And yet we have a, a party in this place that doesn't represent farmers, that doesn't believe that climate change is a threat or a risk, doesn't believe in taking climate action. How are we going to manage biosecurity risks if we don't take effective action on climate change? How do we even expect to do that as a country? When you consider what we've got before us today, which the Greens support, I'll re reiterate that, it really is a band-aid on a severed limb when you consider the challenge that we face as a country and the challenge that's not being acted on by this government. Farmers around the country need to stand up on climate change, and many of them, thankfully, are. There's been a big outpouring of sentiment across many organisations and from many farmers around the country, uh, disgusted, quite frankly, at the role that the National Party are playing and have continued to play in this government after the last eight years to hijack any action on climate change. Let me say this very clearly. The National Party do not represent the interests of farmers in this country. If they don't have a plan for climate change, if they don't even believe in climate change and they don't want any climate action and they're prepared to do whatever it takes to undermine and blow up climate action, including uh, this coalition, this unstable coalition that they govern in, then they don't represent farmers. They certainly don't represent the future of farmers. Farmers know climate change is a threat. They know it's one of the biggest threats they face. One of the biggest threats they face. And climate action is good for farmers. And it can be good for farmers in many ways. The costs of inaction by far outweigh any costs of action. The costs of inaction are severe, and farmers understand that. But we know that with uh, discussions with the EU in a potential trade deal, that EU want to see carbon tariffs. And I know the US are talking about this, the world is talking about penalising countries that don't take climate action. And it seems as though our farmers are going to be penalised because of this government's stupidity and downright self, short-term self-interested politics that has delivered no climate policy in this country for the last eight or nine years. So by all means, bring in a biosecurity bill to try and help farmers to help spread the risk uh, of biosecurity outbreaks. But don't kid yourself for one minute that this bill before us today is going to have any major impact on managing biosecurity risks if we don't manage one of the main causes uh, and of future threats of biosecurity, which is climate instability. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, like uh, so many times uh, this week, Labor's support for this imperfect piece of legislation comes after eight years of neglect by a tired, self-obsessed government that has uh, lost its way. Uh, and in biosecurity, that neglect has led to failure. That failure has led to an obvious crisis, and it's only in an utter crisis that this government can be provoked to action. And in the midst of that, Australian agriculture suffers, Australian family farmers suffer, uh, there are risks for our exports risks to food safety uh, and to public health. 
Our biosecurity system is fundamental for $59 billion worth of agricultural production and $45 billion worth of agricultural exports. The ambition of this government is very narrow in agriculture. There is no ambition uh, really to, uh, to lift Australian agriculture up. There is no ambition in particular to lift Australian agriculture up the value chain uh, because that's where the good jobs are uh, in food processing and value adding in agriculture. Uh, it is inescapable, even this government can't escape the fact that federal biosecurity is a federal government responsibility. It keeps out critical threats to our agriculture, like African swine flu, uh, foot and mouth disease, uh, and other, other diseases or pests that would be catastrophic uh, for farmers. As trade and travel resume after the pandemic, uh, if they do, if the government can get its act together on vaccines, the government can get its act together on quarantine, if we can finally open the country up after the government's manifest failure in these areas, it is indeed a critical time to re-evaluate our biosecurity regime. This bill increases civil and criminal penalties for breaches of the Act. The penalties send a clear message that breaking these laws is not worth the potential commercial gain. But what this bill doesn't do is establish consistent funding for our biosecurity arrangements at the border. Strengthened biosecurity laws are only as useful as their enforcement. So you require stiff penalties, but effective enforcement also requires certainty uh, amongst potential perpetrators that they will be caught. Uh, and there is a long history for this government, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government of neglect in this area. In the 2014 budget, the Abbott government abolished key biosecurity agencies, the Biosecurity Advisory Council, the National Biose Committee, Biosecurity Committee stakeholder engagement consultative groups. Those cuts meant that there are simply fewer biosecurity officers on the ground enforcing these laws that we're strengthening in the chamber today. The consistent solution expressed by farmers and every stakeholder in the industry was a biosecurity levy it, that importers that necessitate the biosecurity enforcement effectively pay for it. The levy, that proposal, was the product of a comprehensive review of biosecurity arrangements, which found that said there is broad concern that existing funding and researching are inadequate and ad hoc and, if continued, won't support the national biosecurity system into the future. The proposal was simple. $10 a container for shipping, $5 a container for air freight. Now, there's a familiar pattern here. The coalition government made a big announcement. They set a deadline, and then they comprehensively failed to deliver it. And they failed to deliver it uh, it's hard to understand why they would fail to deliver it. Perhaps because the National, Council, the, the, the National Party spends a lot more time listening to the Minerals Council than they do to farmers who rely on biosecurity. And who was the agriculture minister during this period who put Australian agriculture and our biosecurity at risk? It was the member for New England. The member for New England uh, in his usual orgy of self-promotion uh, and his usual approach, where he responds to the sort of stimulus around him rather than thinking about the national interest, very, very focused on a fight with American actors about their pet poodles. But under his watch, we saw lapse after lapse after lapse in biosecurity terms. Cuts under the member for New England's watch meant that our biosecurity scheme saw 39 per cent fewer seizures of items from air passengers, 56 per cent fewer mail articles seized. His ideological commitment to cutting public services, which you can hear him talk about in any pub throughout the New England where he denigrates public servants, 
has put our biosecurity regime at risk. Is it, it is, is it any wonder that we have seen a series of harrowing biosecurity scares since the Joyce cuts came into effect? The tomato potato psyllid, discovered in Australia for the first time in 2017 in a suburban garden in Perth and in a commercial capsicum crop north of the city. This pest has the potential to reduce tomato and potato production by 20 to 50 per cent. Cucumber green model mosaic virus, discovered on watermelon farms in Catherine and Darwin in September 2014 and rediscovered in Western Australia in 2016. Panama TR4, an existential threat to our banana industry, discovered in Tully in Queensland in 2015. It has already cost the Queensland government $26 million in their eradication efforts. Russian wheat aphid, discovered in South Australia in 2016, has the potential to affect adversely 75 per cent of our grain crops. Pacific oyster mortality syndrome, discovered in Tasmania in 2016, destroyed $50 million worth of Tasmanian oyster crops. The white spot disease, first discovered in the Logan River near Brisbane in 2016, immediately did $25 million worth of damage to the prawn industry. It's highly infectious, kills more than 80 per cent of prawns in an infected farm. Now, all of these things happened over the miserable tenure of the member for New England in the in the, as the Minister for Agriculture. He has never accepted responsibility for these biosecurity lapses that happened under his watch. There was an, a, a, an, an ANAO report. It becomes harder to say ANAO over and over again the more tired you are, but the ANAO report uh, into biosecurity arrangements released last week, it found the department's arrangements to respond to non-compliance with biosecurity requirements are largely inappropriate. In the absence of frameworks, plans or targets, sound familiar? Sounds a bit like the vaccine process. In the absence of frameworks, plans or targets to determine the desired outcomes of its regulation, the department is unable to demonstrate that its response to non-compliance is effective at managing biosecurity risks. The department's compliance framework is largely inappropriate to support its response to non-compliance with biosecurity requirements. Now, did this abject failure of our biosecurity arrangements cause any upset in the National Party this week? No, nope, it's all been about themselves. Instead of concern for farmers, this week's coup was the product of the Deputy Prime Minister's naked ambition and nothing else. Farmers family farmers, Australian agriculture, uh, agribusiness in this country cannot trust this Deputy Prime Minister to advance their interests. Remember his work as the drought envoy. As farmers suffered through a catastrophic natural disaster, the member for New England in a sop to his ego was appointed to a position whose sole responsibility was to listen to farmers and report their needs to the Prime Minister. He held that position for nine months. He helped himself to $675,000 worth of expenses, including two staff who apparently were engaged with him on that project. And how much of that nine months did he spend doing the work that he was engaged to do? About three weeks. About three weeks. And how did he convey the needs and requirements of Australian agriculture to the Prime Minister, who forked out so much public money uh, into this utter boondoggle? Was it through a report that was tabled to the parliament? Nope, no report. Was it through formal communications to the Prime Minister or the Cabinet? No, not at all. It was conveyed to the Prime Minister through a series of texts apparently, text messages. 
$675,000, an absolute national crisis for Australian agriculture, and all this bloke can do is three weeks' worth of work and a couple of text messages. That was how seriously he took the hardship Australian farmers were facing. As regional Australia faces a housing crisis, as thousands of people struggle to find a permanent home in country towns, as biosecurity risks lap at our doorstep with an inadequate biosecurity regime, as we're trying to recover from drought and flood, uh, as we're trying to deal with the uh, impacts of uh, challenges in our export markets. We're losing markets to key competitors overseas. How can we expect the Deputy Prime Minister to take his responsibility as a public uh, servant, as a, as, a, as a person whose job is to serve his constituency, which for the National Party is allegedly country people and country industries? How can anybody expect that this particular leopard spots have changed? Because there is only one person whose concerns the Deputy Prime Minister takes seriously, only one person whose interests he serves, and that is, of course, the Deputy Prime Minister's interests himself. It is self-interest all the way down with this lot. Uh, and that is why, when we come to this chamber to support this legislation, we do it with no confidence, no confidence at all, that increased penalties and the improvements that are set out in this bill will result in any change in terms of overall biosecurity arrangements uh, for Australians and, in particular, for Australian agriculture and Australian family farms. What this country needs, what Australian agriculture needs, is a government that's got some ambition for rural Australia. What this country needs is a government that's committed to fixing the biosecurity arrangements, that's about pragmatic responses to problems, that's about solving the issues in the interests of Australian agriculture, uh, of importers and exporters, about making sure that we deal with our public health challenges, uh, not a government that is obsessed with itself, that is obsessed with its own naked self-interest, that can only ever make announcements and never deliver, because the only thing that matters to Mr Joyce or Mr Morrison is the glare of the cameras and the headline the following day. It is never about the hard work. Uh, of working with Australians to fix the problems that it's absolutely in our national interest to fix. Uh, I commend uh, the legislation to the Senate. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, uh, speak on this bill and to give support to the bill. Uh, I will uh, be brief in my remarks. It is clearly important for, uh, for Australia to maintain its biosecurity. We have a fantastic uh, agricultural industry that would be put in jeopardy if, uh, if, if we uh, don't uh, have strong protections in relation to biosecurity. Uh, however, I will uh, just foreshadow I'm moving an amendment in, uh, uh, in the committee stage, and I'll talk to that amendment now. Uh, the amendment I'm, I'm moving seeks to deal with the situation we had uh, a, a few weeks ago uh, where, the, where the government sought to use biosecurity measures to prevent Australians from returning home. In fact, to make it a criminal offence for Australians who may be overseas during a biosecurity uh, emergency to return back to their home country. And that is just something that is inconsistent with the idea of the rights of citizenship. Uh, it's inconsistent with the moral obligation the government has to assist Australians when they are overseas and find themselves in difficulty. Uh, my amendment uh, will make it very clear that the power that was exercised uh, by the Health Minister uh, uh, to, to prevent Indian communities or Indian uh, 
uh, people, Australians who are in India returning home can never be uh, exercised again in that manner. It's an example of what happens when a power is granted and uh, you know, granted for good measure, and I went back and I read through the explanatory memorandum when the power was initially granted by the, by the, uh, uh, by the parliament. Not a mention of uh, that sort of uh, use of the power uh, that was uh, requested of the parliament. So it was an abuse. And I think the government knows that they made a big mistake in the exercise of it, but you just never know with the coalition government what they're going to do next. Uh, they are you know, secretive in the way they do business. They don't respect uh, the Senate. We saw that uh, yesterday when we were talking about uh, you know, the provision of information to, uh, to the Senate. Uh, just quite disrespectful in terms of openness and transparency. We saw last night last night the, uh, when we were dealing with an arena uh, regulation where the government had uh, uh, had uh, tabled an amendment in relation to uh, uh, to arena that was 180 degrees from the intent or the objects of the act it was unlawful the Scrutiny of Bills Committee had made it very plain and clear that that was an unlawful amendment. It would have been struck out uh, if uh, someone decided to take that measure to court, but you know, the, the Senate uh, should never uh, have allowed that regulation. And thankfully, uh, we find ourselves in a situation when, at the recommittal of, uh, of the vote, thanks to uh, an injury uh, with Senator uh, Wish Wilson. Um, uh, that uh, the, the, the Parliament, uh, the Senate, did its job really, really well last night. But it just shows you what happens when governments stray off the the pathway. They stray uh, away from the powers, the proper use of power granted by the Parliament, when they, uh, in legal terms, uh, act ultra vires beyond beyond power. That's what we saw in relation to uh, the use of the biosecurity uh, laws uh, uh, in, in the pandemic. Now, just so everyone's clear, my amendment makes it very clear that you cannot prevent an Australian citizen returning from, uh, fr from overseas during a biosecurity measure uh, on the basis of a biosecurity concern. It doesn't affect other measures uh, that we have in law related to, to terrorists and, and other people that we may wish to keep from this country. But any Australian who's overseas, in trouble, wants to return home can. And of course the minister uh, or the government can apply other measures such as the requirement to quarantine and uh, to issue other directions to make sure that the community is safe. We bring our people home. We put them uh, in, a, in a place where, which doesn't endanger the community and make sure they have the best medical attention uh, that they possibly can. So that's what my amendment seeks to do, just to clarify that that power which was exercised is not, uh, uh, to, is not to be exercised in the future, uh, that it would be on, be un, uh, uh, unquestionably be on power, and uh, I will be asking that the Senate accept uh, and support my amendment. Senator Van. Thank you, Deputy Ch Acting President. Um, I rise to uh, speak on the Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Penalties Bill 2021. This bill is about sending a clear message to individuals and companies who put at risk Australia's $61 billion agriculture industry and over $1 trillion in environmental assets by contravening the Biosecurity Act. A strong biosecurity system <coughs> pardon me, is critical to Australia's prosperity. Remembering that we are a trading nation, we need to protect our trade at all times. So our biosecurity laws protect agriculture, tourism and other industries, plant and animal health, the environment and our market access, and they are necessary to allow us to trade and for our nation to continue 
to thrive. Agriculture continues to be one of the nation's economic powerhouses, despite the effects of droughts, floods, bushfires COVID and the COVID-19 pandemic. And as the world recovers from COVID-19, it won't be business as usual. Trade has changed forever and will be more competitive than ever. Keeping Australia free from pests and diseases is key to maintaining Australian agriculture's clean and green status. The government's 2021-22 uh, budget announcement of $400 million of new funding for biosecurity confirms this government's long-standing commitment to safeguarding Australia from exotic pests and diseases before they reach our shores. The Australian government is introducing these biosecurity measures, which will deliver lower costs for producers and support market access. Effective biosecurity systems aligned to the whole of government initiatives for simplified trade and reopening our international borders benefits Australia's trade and travel supply chains. We are stepping up our resourcing and our efforts to stop pests and diseases such as African swine fever, carpra beetle or foot and mouth disease establishing in Australia and potentially devastating our livestock crops and, more importantly, our environment totally. On average, over 2.5 million shipping containers arrive in Australia each year. So we are improving the arrangements for clearance and risk management, which will have substantial benefits for government and importers. We will ensure Australia's biosecurity system supports our agricultural sector to contribute to both Australia's national economic recovery and industry progress towards its goal of 100 billion dollars in value by 2030. We are addressing increasing global threats by better anticipating and interpreting risks, enabling rapid detection of pests and diseases before they reach Australia. This bill is urgently needed to strengthen the penalties for a number of civil penalty provisions and criminal offences under the Biosecurity Act. The proposed increases to, to maximum penalties will more appropriately reflect the impact these contraventions may have on Australia's biosecurity status, market access and the economy than the current provisions. The increased civil penalty amounts will more effectively deter non-compliance with the Act and provide a proportionate regulatory response. Increased amounts for criminal, financial for criminal financial penalties will provide for appropriate punishment for those who jeopardise Australia's biosecurity status by breaking the law. Large number of pests and diseases currently pose a high risk to Australia's biosecurity in an increasingly complex import environment. In late 2020, we had several detections of the carpra beetle that I mentioned previously including in the packaging for refrigerators and high chairs sold to consumers. And we are currently seeing the emergence of a new variant of African swine fever overseas that we must protect our nation against. Although African swine fever has not been detected in Australia due to, due to our strong biosecurity controls at our borders, either variant could have a devastating impact on our pork industry and associated businesses within that industry. The potential entry and establishment of these pests and diseases is an ever-present threat to the livelihoods of farmers and associated industry participants. In the face of these kinds of growing regional and global threats, the current penalty regime needs to be significantly enhanced to provide an effective deterrent against non-compliance with Australia's biosecurity requirements. Growth in international trade and travel as the economy recovers from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic is expected to increase such threats, making it critical that the increased penalties are in force as soon as possible to send a strong message that breaching Australia's biosecurity laws is not worth any potential commercial gain. 
in breaching Australia's biosecurity laws can have serious consequences for the country's biosecurity status, market access, plant, animal and public health. The economy and the environment are all at risk. It is critical that individuals and companies who choose not to follow the law that the penalties are appropriate and adequate. This bill will amend the Biosecurity Act to increase maximum financial penalty that a court could impose for non-compliance with certain requirements under the Act. It will increase the penalties for specified civil penalty provisions to deter non-compliance and will increase criminal penalties to provide for appropriate and proportionate punishment in the sentencing of offenders. The increased penalties relate to the assessment and management of biosecurity risks of goods that are brought or imported into Australian Territory and the carrying out of biosecurity activities in accordance with an approved arrangement. This bill, Mr Acting Deputy President, increases a number of civil penalties that a court could impose from 120 to 300 penalty units, or in dollar terms, from about uh, $26,640 to $66,000, such as for contraventions relating to the assessment of biosecurity risks, e.g. failing to comply with a direction not to move goods under Section 128. Where the contravention is committed by a corporation or a body corporate, the maximum penalty may be up to five times this amount. This is because the corporate multiplier that can apply to penalties for bodies corporate under the Biosecurity Act because of the operation of Section 82 of the regulatory powers. The targeted increase to civil penalties in this bill will offer the flexibility to respond proportionally to those individuals and companies who should be aware of their obligations under the Act. The increased civil penalties will deter non-compliance with the Biosecurity Act, so breaching the law cannot be seen just as part of the cost of doing business. It's otherwise, it's not worth the risk. The Strengthening Penalties Bill will ensure that the maximum penalties available to the courts, uh, available to the courts reflect the profit and gain that individuals and businesses might believe they could obtain or seek to obtain by breaking the law. The increase of, uh, of criminal penalties for the fault-based offences would allow for proportionate and appropriate punishment for offences under the Biosecurity Act and align with maximum penalties across the key provisions. This bill does not add any additional administrative burden on industry, which is very important, or introduce any new civil penalty provisions or criminal offences. It strengthens the existing penalties under specified provisions of the Biosecurity Act, and I commend it to the Senate. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, well, this bill that uh, we currently before us, the Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Penalties Bill 2021, will amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 to provide stronger civil and criminal penalties for those who expose Australia to biosecurity risk through non-compliance uh, with the Act. The bill will increase the maximum financial penalties that apply to a number of civil and criminal penalty provisions across the Biosecurity Act. The increased penalty, civil penalties will serve as a deterrent to anybody considering undermining our biosecurity laws, and the criminal penalties will allow appropriate and proportionate punishment for offences under the Act. The penalty amounts in this bill more appropriately reflect the impact that contraventions may have on Australia's biosecurity status, market access and economy than the current penalty regime. Deterring non-compliance with the Biosecurity Act will help maintain Australia's favourable biosecurity status and protect our $71.2 billion agriculture, fisheries and forestry industries and valuable uh, and unique environmental assets. This is particularly important in anticipation of growing biosecurity risks with anticipated growth in international trade and travel as the economy recovers from the effects of the COVID pandemic. I thank senators for their contribution to this bill and I commend the bill to the Senate. I put the question that this bill will now be read a second time. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Is it the wish, sorry, Clark? 
a bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. Ring the bells. He's on, his, he's on his way. Quorum is present. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Patrick. Uh, I move uh, my amendment on uh, uh, Amendment 1 on sheet 1306. Senator Patrick, are you, you intending to make any further contribution? Um, I, in, in fact, in my second reader, made yes. my contribution in relation to this amendment. I just urge that people uh, have a look at this. It's about ensuring government doesn't abuse a power to keep uh, Australians from uh, returning to Australia during a biosecurity emergency. It doesn't stop the government imposing other restrictions on, uh, on the um, uh, on those Australians returning, such as quarantine or giving them a direction as to where to, to go. But we must look after Australians who are in difficulty overseas, and especially so during a pandemic. Senator Still. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise just to let Senator Patrick know that Labor will not be supporting your amendment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wishwithson. I was to say the Australian Greens will be supporting the amendment of uh, Senator Patrick, um, and yeah, we look forward to the vote. Are there any other contributions before I call the minister? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And um, uh, in response to um, Senator Patrick's amendment, um, the government won't be supporting this amendment, although we do acknowledge um, the intent of the amendment. Um, during a human biosecurity emergency period, the Health Minister may, in accordance with um, sections 477 and 478 of the Act, determine an emergency requirements that he or she is satisfied are necessary to prevent the control of entry, emergence, establishment or spread of the declaration listed human disease uh, in the relation to COVID-19 in an Australian Territory or part of an Australian Territory. Um, and a person who fails to comply with requirements may commit a, a criminal offence. The Australian government has established protocols uh, for the exercise of emergency powers under the Act to ensure that the emergency powers are only used where necessary to protect the health of Australians based on expert health advice and following appropriate consultation. The bill contains existing provisions uh, to ensure that the powers are only used 
where appropriate and necessary, and therefore the amendments are not necessary, proportionate and could impact on the government's ability to respond to this uh, and future health emergencies. Are there any other contributions? Because I intend to put the question. Senator Patrick, I'm intending to put the question. I put the question that uh, amendment on sheet 1306, moved by Senator Patrick, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question before the Senate is that Amendment 
on sheet 1306, moved by Senator Patrick, be agreed to. The ayes pass to the right of me, let the noes to the left of me. I appoint teller for the ayes, Senator Patrick, and teller for the noes, Senator McCarthy. Senators, there being 10 ayes and 30 noes, it's resolved in the negative. Does any other honourable senator have a contribution in the committee stage? So I put the question that the bill stand as printed. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Put the question that the bill that now is the question now is that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. Hence, no, the ayes have it. I report that the committee has considered the Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Penalties Bill 2021 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. I put the question. Those with the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Minister. Will now be read a third time. Put the question. Those with the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. Second reading debate.
Oh, Senator Steele. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I rise to make my contribution to the Water Legislation Amendment Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. This uh, amends the Water Act to effectively split the Murray-Darling Basin Authority to create a new agency with a responsibility for the compliance function and to create a new position of Inspector General of Water Compliance to head this agency and establish new offences and civil penalty provisions for unlawful conduct relating to contraventions of the Basin Plan, taking water when not permitted and insider trading with water. And I should state from the outset, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, that Labor supports this bill. It's a long overdue and much needed addition to the regulation of this country's largest river system. Unfortunately, this bill does nothing to address one of the principal threats to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and to communities and ecosystems up and down the river. The threat is the junior coalition partner, the Nationals Party, under the leadership of Mr Joyce. Now, one of the first acts of the National Party after Mr Joyce's re-elevation to leadership was to vote against a motion on Monday supporting the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in full and on time. Minister Pitt may well say that the government is committed to implementing the full Basin Plan, but let's wait and see how long he maintains that portfolio or indeed his party maintains that position. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan includes 450 gigalitres of additional flow that was supposed to be secured through efficiency measures. It was a key part of the plan. In fact, on some views, it was this commitment that secured South Australia's participation in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. That additional water was supposed to be delivered by 2024. But here we are, just three years out, with no clear pathway forward. The government has ruled out on-farm measures and buybacks and would be looking exclusively to off-farm efficiency measures to find the additional 450 gigalitres. The problem is that the government's list of infrastructure is almost exclusively for irrigation infrastructure in New South Wales and doesn't specific, uh, specify sorry, how much water, if any, would be saved by the investment. In fact, only two of the 450 gigalitres have been delivered so far. This outcome seems relatively unsurprising when you take into account the ongoing antipathy towards this additional water allocation by the Nationals. Back in 2016, Deputy Prime Minister Joyce, as he was and once was again is, wrote to the South Australian Water Minister to say that the 450 gigalitres couldn't be delivered without hurting river communities. He was more blunt in other comments, saying there wasn't, and I quote, hope in Hades of South Australia getting the water. Mr Joyce's comments were so alarming that the Nick Xenophon team, to promise to block uh, everything that came through the Senate, prompting then Prime Minister Turnbull to confirm in writing the government's commitment to the plan. Well, Prime Minister Turnbull's gone and uh, Deputy Prime Minister Joyce is back. And with that, the water allocation for crucial ecosystems is under threat. As Senator McKenzie explained to the Senate on Monday, the Nationals believe that the 450 gigalitres was never guaranteed. And apparently, and I quote, the science is now pointing to a complete rethink of how we manage the lower lakes in South Australia. Even the coalition government in South Australia is spooked with Liberal State Water Minister David Spears quoted as saying, I would be extremely disappointed if a change in the leadership for the Nationals saw a change of approach. The time for talk is over and we will continue to push all basin jurisdictions to get on with delivering what's already been agreed." Unquote. The problem is that delivering what's already been agreed, as quoted earlier, hasn't been a strong suit of this government. And this bill is the perfect example. It is worth reviewing how this legislation came to us. Compliance has been an issue of concern for a long time and was considered in reports including 2017 Murray-Darling Basin Water Compliance Review conducted by the MDBA. The issue registered on the public's attention, though, with the 2017 Four Corners investigation into water theft that went on to spark 
no less than the Royal Commission. In 2018, the government in effect accepted the recommendation of the PC to create a basin plan regulator when it appointed former AFP Commissioner Mick Kelty as Northern Basin Commissioner in 2018. A year later, the government scrapped that role and replaced it with an Inspector General for the Murray-Darling Basin. That appointment was on an interim basis. It's supposed to be a statutory position. It was supposed to have powers attached to it. In fact, the role was supposed to be able to refer matters to a Commonwealth Integrity Commissioner. In fact, Mr Kelty spent his entire time in the role without any of these things happening. It is only now, years later, that the government has introduced legislation to do any of these things. Mr Kelty's replacement in the role of Inspector General of Water Compliance is still performing his functions on an interim basis until this legislation is passed. This hasn't been an omission without consequences. It has meant that the regulator meant to be charged with protecting the basin has been without the powers needed to properly investigate water crimes. It's meant that prosecutions have depended on state bodies and authorities. And it's meant that the Murray-Darling Basin Authority has been left to, as the Productivity Commission put it in its review, and I quote, mark its own homework. And so although Labor supports this bill, we are disappointed that it has taken eight years for this government to get to this point. This government has consistently failed to put in place the regulation, the regulation sorry, needed to support the plan. It has failed to make the investments needed to make the plan work. The river, its communities and ecosystems would be better off if the government were half as interested in delivering the Murray-Darling Basin Plan as the National Party under Mr Joyce were in turning it into a culture wars issue. Australia's longest river system deserves so much better. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise today to contribute to this debate, and as I do, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I want to say with a heavy heart how disappointed I am that two days in to Barnaby Joyce being appointed as, as Deputy Prime Minister, uh, we now have a new war being launched on South Australia and the Murray Darling Basin by the National Party. Two days in, and Mr Joyce, as Deputy Prime Minister, the Deputy Chief of Sheriff to the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and they're wanting to take water out of South Australia, off the Murray-Darling Basin, and screw over the environment. Two days in, and the National Party have said to South Australia, not nothing. You can be left at the bottom of the system with nothing. And why, Mr Acting Deputy President? Because they're more interested in looking after their big corporate irrigator mates up north. Barnaby Joyce, Mr Barnaby Joyce, last time, of course, he was in government as water minister. He told South Australians that if they wanted more water, they should just move. This is a bloke who has never, ever supported the management and the fair management, the sustainable management of the Murray-Darling Basin. He's never supported a plan that would have this river system managed nationally and fairly and for the long term. He has never supported making sure that at the end of the system where South Australians rely on a healthy river, that we would be able to have access to the water to keep the river alive. In the midst of the, the drought, uh, the millennial drought, he, of course, snubbed South Australians and basically said tough luck while his big corporate mates were sucking and sucking and sucking the river dry. So forgive me, Mr Acting Deputy President, as I stand here today thinking that this government is going to do anything that betters the management and the, uh, <laughs> the uh, transparency, uh, the accountability of management of the Murray-Darling Basin, because, boy, the track record shows something different. The whole reason we need an inspector general and a cop on the beat is because of blokes like Barnaby Joyce and his cotton-growing mates. That's why. I mean, it is just absolutely appalling 
that as I stand here today, this morning, debating what is meant to be an accountability measure, we have the National Party in the Senate moving amendments that take water out of the, out of the river system, take water from the environment to give to the big corporate irrigators and to leave South Australia running dry. So forgive me if I think, as many South Australians do, that this government will never, ever be able to manage the Murray-Darling Basin properly, fairly and in a way that makes sure we look after the environment and the small users all the way throughout the system. Under this government, we've had rotting, we've had water theft, we've had public money spent and used as a slush fund for the mates of the National Party. The only reason we need some, a, a cop on the beat is because the National Party think the Murray-Darling Basin is their river of gold for themselves. The amendments moved by the National Party today that rip water off the environment, that cut water from the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, which, let's remember, was designed because the Murray-Darling Basin has been mismanaged for decades. Too much water has been extracted. Greed has dominated. And if we want a future for our nation's food bowl, then we have to manage this water more sustainably. And of course, with a drying climate, there's less water available all round. But of course, the National Party don't care about that because they don't even believe in climate change. They don't give us two hoots what the science says. It's just take, 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 take. The whole point of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was to try and put in place a system where the river would be managed fairly, for the long term, sustainably. And that meant water needed to be returned to the river because too much water was being taken out. And now, nine years later, we see Mr Barnaby Joyce as Deputy Prime Minister and his supporters here in the Senate wanting to blow a hole in the plan, steal more water, thieve from the environment and leave, up, uh, leave downstream users and downstream states worse off. Now, there's a few other elements of this piece of legislation which is meant to be about putting in place an inspector general uh, for water compliance. <laughs> Just imagine if Barnaby Joyce makes himself the water minister again, who, who will he put in place in this job? You can't trust the National Party to manage the Murray-Darling Basin and you certainly can't trust the National, trust the National Party to, to, to put in place a proper watchdog. This Inspector General bill uh, has uh, some good elements but some very worrying elements. And there's some other amendments that have been moved today uh, in relation to trying to fix the bill that we will be supporting. But we need to make sure that the integrity of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is kept intact, that the whole purpose of returning water to the environment to save the river from death, to ensure the survival of the Murray-Darling Basin, the nation's biggest river system, the lifeblood of our nation. We need to make sure that extra 450 gigalitres is protected, is delivered in time and in full. We need to make sure that if we need to return water to the environment that we can still do it through buybacks, the most efficient mechanism, environmentally, economically, socially, 
to actually return that water that the river needs. But of course today, as we stand here debating what is meant to be an integrity measure, we have the laughable farce of the National Party wanting to undermine the whole damn thing. Now I tell you what, as Mr Barnaby Joyce is in negotiations with the Prime Minister right now over the ministries of the National Party and his new team. If the Prime Minister Scott Morrison has any metal, he will deny the water portfolio to the National Party. They have shown themselves over and over and over again to be inept, to be shady, to be tricky, to misuse and mismanage the water portfolio. And there's serious questions about corruption. They can't be trusted with the water portfolio, and Mr Barnaby Joyce cannot be trusted to be in charge of the Murray Darling Basin. And I say to the Prime Minister directly today. Be a proper national leader and strip the National Party of the water portfolio. Put it in the hands of someone who actually cares about the survival of our river, the sustainability of our environment and all of the communities that rely on a healthy river from top to bottom. Don't allow the National Party to continue to use the Murray-Darling Basin and the billions of public dollars attached to the plan as their own personal slush fund. I tell you what, if Scott Morrison, Mr Scott Morrison as Prime Minister allows the National Party to keep hold of the water portfolio in today's negotiations, the Liberal Party are going to suffer in South Australia and suffer hard. We've got two front benches in this place from the, the Liberal Party. Senator Birmingham and Senator Rustin, proud Liberals. South Australians, how are they going to fare going back home to South Australia after Barnaby Joyce, as Deputy Prime Minister, has just flipped SA the bird after in this place today they have moved an amendment to steal water from South Australia? When are the South Australian Liberals going to stand up to this nonsense? So it's a challenge now to the Prime Minister, to Senator Birmingham, Senator Rustin. Stare down this wacky, crazy, untrustworthy mob and make sure they do not get their mitts on the portfolio, on the public money and on any more of the water. Now I know in this place, thank goodness, South Australia has such a strong wedge of representation from our crossbench and the Greens, members of the Labor Party, and I call on our Liberal South Australian colleagues, do not let the National Party steal from our state again. Now, in this piece of legislation today, if this is going to go forward, it needs to be fixed and we need to make sure that the National Party don't get their mitts on any more water.
any more money or any more power. All right. South Australians are horrified, horrified of what's transpired over the last 48 hours. And if you're a member of the voting public in Boothby right now, think about what you want to do with your vote at the next election. Would you really want to trust a member of the coalition when they are thumbing their nose at our state and our river and our environment? at the future survival of our state. And of course, every South Australian gets to vote for who they want to represent them in the Senate. And I'd be thinking pretty clearly right now, it is not worth your time, your faith, the future of our state to be voting for this mob when the Deputy Prime Minister himself is prepared to sanction such an attack on South Australia, such an attack on our environment and on our Murray-Darling Basin. So you've got one job today, Prime Minister. Tell the National Party to back off, hands off and lay off attacking SA, stealing water from the river and cutting water to the environment. Senator, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, and I thank the Chamber. Um, well, this morning the Adelaide, the Adelaide Advertiser was printed. I'm glad Senator Mackenzie has come in here. She can come in and explain how much she doesn't support the Murray-Darling plan, how much she is uh, acting against the interests of South Australia, and how much she is being permitted to do so by the man who has just been elected the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. The Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, who is allowing you, as the leader of the Nationals here, to attack South Australia. I'm very happy to have a debate with you on this any time. Why don't you come down to Adelaide? Why don't you come down to Adelaide and have a debate with us on water policy? You, me, and Senator Birmingham. It'd be quite interesting to see who's on which side. Anyway, I come back to the paper this morning, the Adelaide Advertiser. Printed a headline, Bad News for the River Murray. Barnaby's gnats won't back the basin plan. Bad news for river, the River Murray. Barnaby's gnats won't back the basin plan. And you know what? That story sounded the alarm on what we all already know, what every South Australian knows. The coalition, particularly with this new Deputy Prime Minister, cannot be trusted to do, deliver for the Murray-Darling Basin. The coalition cannot be trusted to deliver the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. You see, the fact that Barnaby Joyce, Mr Barnaby Joyce, and his nationals don't support the plan is actually no surprise, because he never has. This is not news. This bloke has never supported the fundamental principles behind the Murray-Darling Plan, which is that we have to return the river to health, that we have to return water to the river, and there are a whole range of mechanisms, including buybacks, efficiency measures, changes to water rules, integrity measures, many, many uh, other reforms which are all about recognising what Malcolm Turnbull recognised, what John Howard recognised, that this river system is desperately in need of reform. But they don't want to hear that down there because all they're interested around is paying a bit of uh, internal politics a bit of power politics with the Liberal Party, and guess who loses out? South Australia. Always South Australia when it comes to Barnaby Joyce. We, we all remember, everyone remembers in Adelaide and, and in the regions, uh, what Mr Joyce said 
when he was last leader of the National Party. He said to South Australians who are worried about the River Murray, move to where the water is. Move to where the water is. This is his great plan to resolve the environmental and economic challenge of the Murray-Darling Basin. You just tell South Australians to move easy. Well, that went down well. That went down really well. Despite this, this weak Liberal Party, who go to South Australia and pretend they care about the Murray-Darling, this weak coalition, this weak Liberal Party, handed control of the water portfolio to Barnaby Joyce. I, unbelievable. The bloke who didn't support the plan got to deal with the plan, got to implement or not implement the plan. And then we see again today, if anybody thinks there's been any change, you know, we remember Mr Joyce, when Deputy Prime Minister, he said to South Australia, there's not a hope in Hades of getting the 450 gigalitres of water secured under the plan. Not a hope in Hades. This is the bloke who was supposed to be uh, implementing it, and then the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia saying to a state of the Commonwealth that something the Commonwealth agreed to with every base in state, not a hope in Hades of being delivered, like he was proud of it. What sort of cabinet minister does that? I know we signed up, but not a hope in Hades, mate. Apart from anything utterly disrespectful. And if anybody thought that was an aberration, we have Senator McKenzie today in the Adelaide Advertiser. Labor has forgotten the 450 gigs was never guaranteed. Oh, we just agreed it, but it was never guaranteed. I mean, give us a break. Give us a break. I mean, basically, you don't care about South Australia. You don't care about the downstream communities. You just came here about upstream irrigators, and you always have. You always have, and that is how you will always play this. And until the Liberal Party decide they are going to stand up to this, this sort of vandalism, you will be condemned. You will be condemned. The plan was supposed to end a century of infighting between basin states. It promised the equivalent of 3,200 gigalitres back to the basin. And I am proud. They were pretty critical of me. I'm proud as water minister of securing nearly 1,000 gigs for the river. Something, yeah, here we go. She didn't like that, did she? Something, yeah, here we go. She's even interjecting as she's walking around the chamber. I mean, get a grip. Senator Seriously. McKenzie. Yes, I purchased almost 1,000 gigalitres consistent with the plan in order to help restore the basin. And you know what? You know what? They, they're critical of it. They want to stop it. They don't want to do anything like that. They don't want to do any of that. They don't want to restore the basin to health. They just want to play to their constituencies in the upstream irrigation communities, and they want to lie to them. They want to pretend to them that things can be as they were. Well, they can't. John Howard knew that. Malcolm Turnbull knew that. Frankly, Liberal and Labor people in South Australia, people across the political divide know that. We have to change. That's why you've had Senator Rustin in here. We, we're committed to um, delivering the plan on time and in full. And then the next day, the Nationals leader in the Senate comes out and moves amendments which are completely contrary to that. Completely contrary to that. And I, I would say this. We expect the National Party to be like this. We understand what they're like. We understand it's all about the politics of a few seats upstream. It's all about the internals. It's all about Senator McKenzie getting a cabinet seat back. That's all this is about. It's not actually about what's right for the plan. But you know who I am most critical of here? It's the Liberal Party of Australia and their weakness. Their weakness. They know Barnaby Joyce is no friend of South Australia. They know his first priority as, lead as leader is shredding this once-in-a-generation plan. They know what the nationals are like. Well, they have to stand up to them. They have to stand up to them. So, Madam Deputy President, this is a test today. Not only on these amendments, which the Liberals are very embarrassed about, it's a test for Scott Morrison. It's also a test for Stephen Marshall. And I look forward to Premier Marshall of the Liberal Party of South Australia standing up today <clears throat> and calling on the Prime Minister to stop the vandalism from his coalition partner. But I say this to Mr Morrison. This is a test for you. Three things you need to do. Strip the nationals of the water portfolio. Mm -hmm. Secondly, give 
a clear commitment, re a commitment that you as Prime Minister will deliver the plan in full and on time, and thirdly, give a public commitment that there will be no change on water policy as part of the secret coalition agreement. Because that's where these deals get done. That's where these deals get done. Well, then table the agreement. Go on. You stand in here tell me, oh, it's very unlikely. Well, you know, I, South Australia should be absolutely, you know, be, be very happy to just, you know, take Senator, Senator McKenzie saying, oh, don't worry, Penny, it'll be very unlikely. No, no, Senator you know what you McKenzie. don't want to hear? You don't want to hear about your dishonesty. For years and years you pretended to people things did not have to change and you knew Senator they had to McKenzie. change. And you have fought, you know you have fought and undermined water reform at every stage. At every stage. It's the easiest thing to do in the world, isn't it, to go to communities and say you don't have to change. It's all Penny Wong's fault. It's all Malcolm Turnbull's fault. It's all it's X Y Z's fault. The reality is it is unsustainable. It is unsustainable. And the South Australian Liberal Party know that. Most of the Liberal Cabinet know that. But you don't want to hear it. And Mr Joyce just wants to play politics with it. And the people who will, the people who will suffer most are the people who elect me to come here, and that is the people of South Australia. They are the ones who will suffer most. And we always have because of the interests of the upstream states. Well, what I'd say to Mr Morrison, you've got a test today. Are you going to do the right thing or not? Are you going to allow Barnaby Joyce to run your government or not? And the choice of Mr Morrison is either lead the nation or be led by the National Party. Thank you, Senator. Senator Davey. Well, thank you. And it is absolutely clear that Labor, that the Greens, and Rex Patrick's always been very honest about his position, so you know, I, I applaud Rex Patrick, but Labor and the Greens who sit there and purport to represent Australia, and they are only focused on one state when it comes to water, one state, the state of South Australia. Now, we are not about stealing water from South Australia. We are not about stealing water from South Australian farmers, who I applaud, the farmers of the Renmark Irrigation Trust, the farmers of the Berry Irrigation Trust, the South Australian Murray Irrigators. I support all of them. And that is why we have flagged amendments to legislate the social and economic test applied to the 450 by all Basin ministers, including the South Australian minister. And the South Australian minister agreed to that because the impact on those very South Australian irrigation communities that I've just mentioned would be horrific if all of a sudden they woke up and a big checkbook was being waved under their nose, supposedly in the name of their environment. Because when we're talking about the Basin Plan, apparently it's only the South Australian environment that matters, but not even the South Australian environment across the state. Only one environmental icon site do the Greens care about. Only one does the Labor Party care about? Well, I care about the Narran Lakes. I care about the Dharma Millowa Forest. Yep. I care about the Chowla floodplains. I care about the environmental sites within the Renmark Irrigation Trust that that company did a great deal with the Commonwealth Environmental Water Hold with to ensure that you can get water to it, that the water doesn't just flow past their gates and out to sea at the expense of the environment throughout the rest of the basin. That's right. Now, Senator Wong was absolutely right when she said she purchased 1,000 gigalitres of water. Can I remind people when that happened? She purchased 1,000 gigalitres of water in the middle of the millennium drought when people were desperate, before we had a basin plan before there was any indication of where the water was needed to be used or where the water should have come from. That's right. She purchased that water at a time when farmers were on their knees looking for help. And she came to help them all right with a massive cheque book. She closed the cotton gin of Burke. 
sending hundreds of people into unemployment queues. That's right. Because yes, the farmers got their money for the water, but nothing was done for the communities where those farmers supported businesses, supported local businesses. <sighs> now, Senator Wong, Senator Hanson Young say that we're doing this today because of Barnaby Joyce, because of our new leader. I will remind I, you, Senator. Sorry, you Mr. Barnaby Joyce, the, the member for New titles. England. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify that that is not why we're doing this today. We are doing this today because we have been listening to our communities. We have been. And this was flagged at a Senate committee of inquiry last year on the 23rd of September when the New South Wales Water Minister, Minister Pavey, sat down before the commu committee, the only state minister to front that committee, despite invitations being sent to all, and she said there are problems with this plan. That's right. We are all committed to a basin plan. We are all committed to our environment, the whole environment, not just one icon site, but the whole environment. But we're not going to achieve the good environmental outcomes that we can achieve if all we're focused on is a number printed in black and white in a schedule of the Basin Plan. That, that is where we have all got lost over time. And I was involved as a stakeholder representing irrigation interests, I will put my hand up, back in 2010 when we were negotiating the Basin Plan. And I applaud Minister Tony Burke, who at the time did listen. He came out to Daniloquin. He fronted 3,000 angry people. But let me put that into perspective. You might sit here and go, 3,000 people, that's nothing. I'm talking about 3,000 people in a town of a population of 6,000, 7,000, in a regional area with a population of 30,000. Ten per cent of the whole regional population came together to front Tony Burke that day, and he stood there and he listened. And he took on board what they said, and he did make changes. And then at the 11th hour, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Gillard did a dodgy deal with South Australia That's right. for 450 gigalitres to ensure, because I'm convinced that Minister Tony Burke understood the ramifications of that. And that is why, in the Basin Plan, there were tests set. 450 gigalitres could only be recovered on two provisos. The first was that it was voluntary, that farmers came forward offering their water. The second was that it had no negative social and economic impacts. Well, we have had report after report after report telling us that we've already seen negative social and economic impacts. We've already seen the demise of some of our most vulnerable irrigation communities. In my area, I have seen dairy farmers walk off the land in droves because of the impact of buyback. Senator Hanson Young says it's the most economic and the easiest form of water recovery. What a farce. I mean, if, if, if your economics is based on if your economics is based on what is cheapest, good job, then maybe. But Order. what is Order. the most effective and the most efficient with the least economic damage? It is not buyback. It is not buyback. We need to get better and smarter about the way we manage our water. We have been accused here today of stealing water off the environment and stealing water off South Australia. We are not stealing anything. We are not proposing to take the water that is already allocated to them. We are not proposing to change the Murray-Darling Agreement, which distributes the water between the states. 
And we are not proposing to take any of the water out of the accounts held by the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. What we are proposing is to stop and say they have enough. Now let's look at how they manage it. Let's look at how they get the water to those environmental sites. Let's make sure the whole environment to top, from top to bottom is taken care of. We have heard through the Senate Select Committee on the Murray-Darling Basin, and I note that Senator Hanson Young, even though being a member of that committee, has not attended uh, any of the. Uh, Senator, you are aware that it's not appropriate to reflect on a senator's attendance in here or Sorry, at the committee. Sorry, I withdraw. You. I withdraw. Um, I, I have, through that committee, we have travelled to basin communities in Moree, in Gundawindi, in Shepparton, in Daniloquin. My colleague over on the other side, Senator Deb O'Neill, heard firsthand the pain of these communities, heard from them that buyback has to stop, that the impact on the water market has affected their businesses. So people who haven't even participated actively in the Basin Plan are getting impacted negatively by the Basin Plan just as innocent bystanders. That is poor public policy. So, In one of these hearings, it was put to us by a witness, stop with the games and actually legislate what you tell us is your policy. Mm. We have government statements saying we want no more buyback, we will focus our water recovery off farm. All our amendments today are doing is actually putting that into legislation. We know the Basin Ministerial Council have agreed to a strong, robust social and economic test for the 450. All we are proposing is to put that test into legislation. We know that both the New South Wales and Victorian water ministers have asked for flexibility with the sustainable diversion limit pro projects. And that's what our amendments propose, so that those state governments have the capacity to make sure that the projects they undertake will actually deliver the environmental benefits that they're meant to, that we want them to. We also know that climate change—I've been accused of being a climate denier today, but I am not—we know climate change is happening. We know there is an incredible risk for sea level rises, and we know that while everyone is looking upstream and saying, give, give, give more water, no one is looking downstream to say what's going to happen when sea level ri levels rise above the scope of the barrages. Nobody is looking at how to manage that risk, and that is a significant risk. We have heard from scientists who have told us that, yes, the lower lakes are Ramsar listed, but Ramsar is not a fixed point in time and you can apply to adjust it in accordance with what's happening. We've heard from scientists that those lower lakes in the Coorong, their ecology is changing due to climate change. But everyone, everyone, instead of looking at the lower lakes and looking at what can be done to help and save them, everyone is looking upstream, accusing farmers of being greedy, accusing the very people who produce your rice, your wheat, your potatoes of being greedy. They are all painted as greedy corporate irrigators. My husband works on a corporate farm. If it wasn't for some of those corporates, there would be people in rural and regional Australia without jobs. But I have also sat around the dinner tables, the kitchen table and the coffee table with farmers at breaking point because they are so scared that the government's going to come out with another big checkbook right. and that their neighbours are going to sell out from under them. Their costs of doing business will continue to rise exponentially and they will have no choice but to walk away from the job that they love. 
from the family homes that they've been in for generations. This is why we're doing enough this. is enough. We need to respect our people, our farmers. I don't care whether they're South Australian farmers, New South Wales farmers from the north or the south. I don't care if they're irrigators or dry land. What I do care about is those farmers deserve the right to farm. They were given a property right, and they have seen that being slowly undermined because we're fixated on a number. That's right. I want to get back to the intent of the Basin Plan. It's not about a number. Order. Yes. Order. Thank you. I will take the introduction, Senator O'Neill. We have been in government for eight years, Order. and the challenge was put to you, you can support us today and we will Senator get the change Davey, that our Senator people Davey, want. Senator Davey, resume your seat. Senator McKenzie, stop the interjections. I note that you are listed as a contributor. You will have your opportunity to contribute. I ask that Senator Davey be heard in silence. Please continue, Senator Davey. <coughs> Thank you. Senator O'Neill, uh, I take your interjection. We've been in government for eight years. Um, and I welcome you supporting our amendments so we can get the change that you heard yourself from witnesses that is needed to give our farmers and our communities that rely on farmers to buy their coffees, to get their hair done, to go to their shops and support their, their towns so that we can give those communities some certainty into the future. I commend the Inspector General part of this bill, which I haven't had a chance to cover off on because I've been addressing everything else. I commend our amendments, and I would welcome the chance to take our amendments to a committee so people can consider them thoroughly and understand where we're coming from here. This is not about blowing up the Basin Plan. This is about getting it right. Thank you, Senator Davey. Um, Senator Wish Wilson, um, I've got Senator O'Neill, unless you're on a point of order. Or... I just want to foreshadow that Senator Hanson Young will be moving a second reader amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, um, Deputy President. And uh, after the contribution uh, we've just heard from Senator Davey, I've got no doubt about her passion for the community that she lives in. But I cannot believe the, dis this, the disingenuous nature of the way the National Party uh, come into this place and act as if they're not a party of government. You'll resume your seat, Senator McKenzie. Uh, the previous acting Deputy President, Madam Deputy President, made a ruling about reflecting on senators, and I would seek you to consider what Senator O'Neill just said in calling. Senator Davey, who actually lives in the basin, who has raised her family in the basin, uh, Senator McKenzie, uh, disingenuous. Uh, please resume your seat. Um, I didn't hear the comment, but I would in. I uh, bet I uh, don't argue from the chair. You've asked me to rule, and I intend to, and my rule stands whether you like it or not. Um, Senator O'Neill, I didn't hear the contribution because I was seeking advice from the clerk. But I would invite you, if you made a remark about uh, Senator Davey, to withdraw it. So I, I would do so if that was the case. But my comment was about the National Party, and I, in fact, was quite complimentary of Senator Davey's passion because I know she lives in the community. So um, I, I will withdraw if it assists. But I do deny that it was directed at Senator Davey, uh, and I think the record would show that. Thank you. Uh, I want to be very clear. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Yep. Um, I'll take your invitation to. Uh, withdraw, and I note uh, the comments you've made, and I invite you to continue your contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I will state again that when we hear these comments from the National Party in here that we need to respect our farmers, farmers need to hear that in the context of eight years of them being in government. If farmers are feeling disrespected, they're feeling disrespected because of this government, the Liberal. National Party government, which has left them hanging and abandoned and failed to do their job. And this piece of legislation is happening because this government failed to do its job. 
I'm speaking on the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill of 2021, and I welcome this because it is long overdue. This is a legislation of an investigation and penalties framework for malfeasance in the Murray-Darling Basin. And if they'd got on the job when they came into government, instead of waiting to two minutes to midnight for seeking a fourth term of government to start bleating and moaning about what's happening in their communities. The people who are out in rural New South Wales and Queensland and Victoria and in South Australia wouldn't be feeling as abandoned by this government as they currently do. It has taken far too long for this government to listen to the communities that it claims it represents, and it's taken far too long for them to come to the table and legislate for this position of an Inspector General of Water Compliance. In fact, in terms of getting the timing wrong, they were more than happy to give this job of the Inspector General to their New South Wales former member of the National Party, a former politician, a minister in the New South Wales Liberal National Party government. From 2011 to 2019, he was in parliament. They employed him on $2,000 a year. and They employed him when his job didn't have any powers or official role. He's been in the role for six months. They got the guy in the job. They made the announcement, but they're only bringing the legislation in. The government's legislation, which the national parties are seeking to amend today, just lodging amendments today. That's how out of control and haphazard this government is. And the tension between the national party and the Liberal Party is on show well and truly here. This is a government that has not stood up for Australians in the regions. They've played some sort of a con job out there, but they haven't been doing the job here in Canberra. All we've seen from uh, Mr Grant, and I, I do hope he can undertake this task with vigour and vim and integrity and get on with it because it's desperately needed, he's been moving up and down the river, travel up and down the basin. That's what he declared. And I wonder what bang for the buck the Australian people got for the $100,000 already spent in the last six months for a man who's you know, whose capacity to do the job will be seen in retrospect, has been placed in a position without any powers or authority which this bill is seeking to introduce today, six months after he got the job. It's just not up to par, not for a government of a country. The bill just scratches the surface of the issues that are rolling through the waters and the, Murray, and the communities of the Murray-Darling Basin. This gargantuan public policy has been mishandled and mismanaged by members of the coalition at state and federal level from the moment they took office. The rationale for the plan, which they agreed to—let's be clear about this—what Senator Davey was railing against is a bipartisan plan that her government voted for. The rationale for the plan remains. We must ensure that agriculture, the environment and the river communities are all able to live in the basin together and in a sustainable fashion. And communities could not have made that clearer in their comments to the joint uh, the, to the Murray Darling Basin Committee that, that uh, is chaired by um, Senator Patrick, oh Senator Rob, uh, Rockman. But I know that uh, Senator Patrick here is in the chamber, and we've been all over New South Wales and uh, Victoria, and we're heading to South Australia in, in coming weeks. As we approach the 2024 deadline for the Basin Plan we must continue the great unfinished business that is still before us. But even though they've been in for eight years, one of the amendments that we've got on the table from Senator McKenzie is to push that date out to 2026. They've stuffed it up for eight years and now they're going, please, miss, give me an extension. That's what they're trying to do here today. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. And the people of the bush cannot continue to swallow the nonsense that this National Party are dishing out to them on water. You have very few champions in this place, and they're not in the National Party, despite what they say. They've been looking after you for eight years. How's it look out there? Well, you're telling us it's not looking too good. Floodplain harvesting, regulation of the water market and the achievement of water recovery um, projects in New South Wales, all of those issues still not fixed. They need to be fixed to ensure that the Basin Plan works for all communities equally, and that water use is sustainable and ecologically 
sound. The CSIRO da data actually put some facts on the table, and it now shows that there's been a huge fall in inflows over the past 20 years, nearly halving to around 4,820 gigalitres. That means less water for the irrigators, less water for rural communities, and less water for the precious ecosystems that depend on the flows. As the effects of, the climate change continue, uh, of climate change continue to creep up and further disrupt weather events in the basin, we need to further examine how that will affect flows for the environment and crops. We've had reports, uh, we, we had evidence in Shepparton from the Victorian Farmers Federation who said, well, 10 years ago we didn't believe in climate change and we weren't engaging with the basin plan with, through that lens, but now we absolutely do. And they are much clearer about their policy for a sustainable business practice in the part of the country that they live in and they love and they actually farm in, they are much more committed to a fact-based response than the National Party in this, in this government. The ABC reports now that rice growers have gone from receiving regular flows through the general security licence to years of low or no water. In fact, that's evidence that we received that in 2019, despite Australia's sense of how much rice we grow in the Riverina, we actually, in our country, imported all our rice from overseas because rice growers could not get their hands on water in Australia to provide high-quality rice for the Australian market and overseas. That's what it looks like in the Riverina after eight long years of multiple leadership under the Liberal National Party. That's what it looks like on the ground. It's a debacle out there. Over the summer of 2018, we all watched in horror as decades of old fish gasped their last, gasped their last breath in a mass death event that looked like they were really written out of the Book of Revelations. Hundreds of thousands of fish suffocated to death as fluctuating weather and the death of algae and lack of critical flows created a crisis situation. Water birds are also in long-term decline in the Menindee Lakes dropping every good wet year since 1985. The fact is, our environment isn't bouncing back. We have to look at better ways to manage the water to preserve our precious ecosystems and the communities that thrive and live up, up, along the river. Sadly, the concept of thriving is something that people, too many people who rely on the river are starting to fear may never happen for them again. We also need much greater scrutiny of the damage made by humans to the basin plan. Greedy humans. The plan's been rocked by scandals such as meter tampering in New South Wales, the debacle over floodplain regulations called overland flows in Queensland and floodplains in New South Wales, the rotting of on-farm efficiency programs and countless inquiries that have documented these failures in the course of the eight years that the Liberal National Party has been in control of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and its implementation. They have got a failed record on this important national asset. They cannot be trusted. They should never have been trusted, and their record reveals that they cannot be trusted into the future. People all up and down the basin have little or no faith that the plan is working for them, and it's on this government's watch that it's become apparent. Through my involvement with the Select Committee into the multi-jurisdictional management, there's great belief that the plan is rigged against ordinary farmers and that they've complained to the government who failed to, response, to respond. They they all, you voted for a bipartisan piece of legislation that you are responsible for managing over the last eight years. You are responsible for the management of the Murray-Darling Basin, Senator McKenzie. You know it. People in the know are making massive profits while long-held family farms are shuttered. In Moree, I heard from a farmer, John Gordon, who described the practical reality of the mismanagement under this government. The school bus to Burke. From, Bur to, to, from Burke to Burrawarrina used to be full. Now that bus, in its last year of his son going to school, had only one child on it. The total decimation of farming communities on the watch of this Liberal National Party government. We've seen massive corporates like Webster's flourish in this new regime, while other communities have withered on the vine. 
The independent assessment of social and economic conditions in the basin released a draft report last year which found that, and I quote, there is a growing sense of hopelessness within the communities across the Murray-Darling Basin. We heard from people caught in a one-way conversation, over-consulted over -consulted and under-listened to. Over-consulted by who? The government of announcement, under-listened to and under-serviced by the government who fails to deliver in Order. every policy area. Here in Canberra, we see it day in and day out. And the people who sent the Nats here to stand up for them know that they have been profoundly let down by this government and their representation through the National Party. The ACCC also released a report this year into the water markets, which noted that there are very few rules governing the conduct of market participants. There is no specific agency to oversee trading activities, and that the complex nature of the basin water markets are best understood and leveraged by professional traders and large agribusinesses with the time and knowledge to analyse and navigate them. We've heard evidence of people who have such speedy capacity because of their particular internet speed access and their digital capacity to trade water ahead of farmers trying to move it from one part of their farm in one valley to another, taking the power and control from the farmers. The government's known about it. This Liberal National Party government has known about this and had eight years to do something about it. They have failed on every measure. This area of water management, water access and the water market needs a significant and considered reform, and it can't be delivered by a rolling litany of ministers going through the door as the, as the National Party try to sort out who's in and who's out from time to time. No one has proper care of this vital resource in the country. The Nats say it matters to them, but it only matters to them until it's politically expedient not to matter to them. And that's why the people in the regions of New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and South Australia are poorly represented here by this National Party. They're just pawns in their political games. While out there, people who live off the land, who live in those communities, who love those communities, First Nation people who have documented cultural flows and their importance to cultural identity and the, and the benefit of their nations and the entire community, have been completely ignored, completely ignored by this government, deaf to the pleas of the constituents that they claim they stand for. Currently in New South Wales, two-thirds of irrigators are non-compliant with new water metering laws. And this is now four years after a Four Corners report that found huge irrigators were tampering with their metres. They were dodging it all up, pretending, reporting incorrect figures, turning metres off, turning metres on, turning metre dials back to indicate they'd taken less than they. All of that was going on. The plundering. The plundering of billions of litres of water from the Darling River on the watch of the Liberal National Party governments of New South Wales and of this government here in Australia. A massive eight-year failure, a log of failures by those who are not standing up for those in the regions of Australia. As a former manager of Department of Primary Industry Strategic Investigations noted in that documentary, he said it was clear that just, not just one property was involved, there was basically an entire river system that was seriously lacking in accountability and compliance with the water legislation of New South Wales. These issues have to be resolved. They cannot be resolved by this government. It's failed for eight years. There's nothing different now. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak about uh, this bill, which has been a, to there's been a total distraction in, in the chamber in respect of the purpose of this bill, uh, because of the actions of the National Party, because of the weakness of the Prime Minister to control uh, the, the new National Party, the new Joyce National Party, that is so against the river that uh, it's incomprehensible. And uh, uh, the government need to recognise ex exactly what is going on here, they, and, and uh, they best not support the Nationals' amendments. The Murray-Darling uh, Basin is a national resource. It serves a number of states—Queensland, New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria, South Australia. It 
it, it is a national river system. It does not belong to any particular state. And for a long time, for a very long time, in fact, since federations, uh, the federation debates talked about the river system. And uh, South Australia, very aware of its importance, and we know that for South Australia, and, and you know, being a, a senator from South Australia, much of the South Australian population rely on the river. That is the people of Adelaide who use it for drinking water, but all throughout regional South Australia, all the way through to places like Wyala, Piri, all rely on, uh, on the Murray-Darling uh, to, to uh, supply their water. And the Murray-Darling, that resource, must be managed effectively. It must be managed fairly. There are a number of stakeholders that, uh, that have uh, an interest in the river. They include irrigators. I don't think anyone in this chamber is anti-irrigation. It includes uh, the environment, it includes indigenous people, it includes tourism operators. It in includes a whole range of people who uh, have an interest in the river. And again, everyone is appreciative of the balance, the need to assist all stakeholders except the nationals who only look and say this is about irrigation. And they cut their nose off in spite of their face by working to destroy a river. It's a river system that if you extract too much from it, it's pretty simple, if you extract too much from it, 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 uh, it dries out, you don't have water flowing out of the, uh, the Murray mouth. Uh, that, that causes all sorts of problems in terms of salt level. And guess what? It's a pretty simple concept. Rivers flow to the sea. This is just craziness. And if we go back to the history of the plan and how we looked at it, it was, it was supposed to be developed, and in fact the law requires it to be developed, on the basis of best available science. And we know that when the plan was first proposed and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority did its work, that uh, in order to make the river sustainable, we needed to reduce the amount of water take, and we needed to reduce it by somewhere between 3,900 gigalitres and 7,600 gigalitres. They were the scientific numbers. They were the scientific numbers, and uh, immediately when that science came out, best available si uh, science came out. So too did the political interference, and predominantly from uh, the National Party, and indeed I might add from uh, Troy Grant, who at the time was a member of the National Party, working against the best available science. And of course, he's going to go on and become the Inspector General. And everyone's alarm bells ought to be uh, ringing now in relation to that. We're seeing what the Nationals are doing today, uh, and we've got a, uh, a National that's now. Uh, about to be, or in fact is the acting Inspector General, and uh, all of the events of the last uh, 48 hours just uh, uh, put fear into my spine in relation to what is happening. We were supposed to have, again, between 3,900 uh, 3, gigalitres and 7,600. It got whittled down. It got whittled down to 2,750 uh, 2, gigalitres well below what was required for best available science. And I know that's something that the national parties aren't really interested in, best available science, but that's what, the, um, that's what happened, down to, to 2750. And so as a result of that, in order for South Australia, protecting its right, protecting its, its people, agreement was reached for an additional 450 of what is called upwater, of an additional 450 gigalitres. And if you look at the Act, the Act actually specifically directs that through section uh, 86A, uh, 86AA at South Australian um, environmental sites. It's important. And what we're seeing here is the nationals, who are not represented in South Australia, and it's understandable why they're not, trying to make a play trying to make a play. And that's, just understand what this is all about. It's about politics. It's about what happened over the last 48 hours. Barnaby Joyce 
Barnaby Joyce. Uh, Senator Patrick, I remind you to refer to the member uh, from the other place Mi by his title. Mi Mr Joyce, the now act uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, uh, committed a coup uh, in, in, uh, in this building. He's a person who has caused nothing but difficulty uh, with the Basin Plan, who has actively uh, stated that he doesn't believe we will ever get the 450, even though it was agreed. It was the compromised position between all of the stakeholders, between all of the states. That was what was agreed. We now have a deputy prime minister in a government that purportedly supports the plan who doesn't actually support the plan. And we're now seeing that getting played out. It's getting played out by uh, the nationals here who have self-interest manoeuvring themselves for a position in the cabinet. That's what's happening here. Okay? It's all about self-interest. It's about self-interest over national interest. That's what's happening here. No question. There is no sensible reason as to why uh, th this, uh, th the amendments of the, of the nationals should get any uh, support at all. None whatsoever. There's no scientific basis. What it's about is the nationals supporting not irrigators but big irrigators, alpha irrigators, alpha irrigators who think that any any drop of water that flows past their property is wasted water. Is wasted water. And I don't even understand why Senator Davey is 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 uh, standing up for this. She knows that in her community that. Uh, uh, they are suffering, and I, I share her concerns. They are suffering because uh, they are having to bear all of the load to get water to South Australia because it's all being taken in the Northern Basin, and you allowed that to happen. It's your minister that allows, has allowed that to happen. That's the problem. That is the problem. So we've got, we've got Victorian senators in here trying to break the plan when, in actual fact, what is going wrong is that the, uh, in the Northern Basin there is just too much water being taken out of the river system so that none flows down the Darling River. None flows down the Darling River, which means the Victorians have to bear all the load. And I feel a bit sorry for them. But the solution is not in the amendments that have been pro proposed by these Victorian nationals. The remedy is in dealing with the over-extraction in the Northern Basin. That's where the problem lies. It's absolutely true, Senator, Senator McKenzie. But you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know about science. I'll just go to uh, I'll just go to Richard Beasley, who wrote a book recently on the on the on the river system. Let me read what he said. Several people involved in agriculture and in other basin states, and some of the politicians they support, consider any water that flows out of the Murray. Uh, river to be an exercise in irrigating the Southern Ocean. These people are idiots. And I will let the, the Australian public make their own mind up about who the, these idiots are, but it's pretty obvious and it's pretty present. Okay? This, uh, this is just complete stupidity. We have a plan. Look, it's not the best plan for South Australia, but it's a compromise plan. And it's a compromise between all of the different users of the plan. It's not perfect. It requires commitment from everyone. It requires sacrifice. But everyone understands, everyone understands that if the sacrifice occurs, we'll end up with a sustainable river system or something that comes close to, noting that already the numbers have been compromised. We, you know, the, 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 the original plan was 2750. We went to, uh, for an extra 450, which is owed to South Australia and agreed by everyone, but the real number ought to have been somewhere between 39,900 39, um, 3, gigalitres and 7,600 gigalitres. And I've got uh, Senator McKenzie uh, interjecting, suggesting that there was no science in those numbers. Absolutely there, there was. That was the finding of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Uh, it just it didn't suit the politics of the nationals. The, the politics of the nationals, who every second week in New South Wales threatened to leave the, the basin plan. 
the petulant child that is, the, that is, that is New South Wales uh, in, with, with uh, uh, various ministers, national ministers, in, con in control of the water system there. Okay? This is what they like. No regard for sustainable uh, agriculture, simply looking after big irrigators. That's all they're doing. And uh, it's not acceptable. And what has to happen here is the government needs to take charge. I can tell you, uh, and I know that my fellow South Australians in this, in this place, and indeed I've had a talk to uh, some of my uh, 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 parliamentary colleagues in, in the other place, if the government supports this, there will be uh, extreme difficulty. I can tell you right now I will block my phone from every minister in the, in, the, in, the, in the federal government. I won't be talking to them about any legislation. They can play Russian roulette if they want. This amendment cannot go through. It cannot be supported by the government. And you know what? If the government doesn't support that, that tells you something as well. It tells you something. There's a split. There's a split in the coalition. And the last thing you can do when you've got a split, when you've got a, a party that is not complying with the policy position of the government, the last thing you can do is let their, their um, uh, politicians, their members, be the minister. You can't have the coalition, say, or the Liberal Party saying, we support the plan, but we're going to give the water um, um, portfolio to the nationals when they don't support the plan. The evidence of that is clear. The previous statements about Barn for, that, that have been made by Barnaby Joyce and the, the, the amendment that's been uh, circulated today by the Nationals. It tells you there's a split and it can't be allowed to stand. And you, the, the Nationals need to be stripped of the, the water portfolio. They cannot be trusted with the, the water portfolio uh, and it's inconsistent with coalition policy. It's quite unbelievable. Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, now has to show leadership and remove uh, the Nationals uh, from the portfolio, replace uh, the Water Minister with someone from, the, from, the, from the, the Liberal Party. I don't say it has to be South Australian, it just has to be someone sensible. just has to be someone sensible. I just can't, I can't believe uh, what is going on. This is a disgrace. This is a disgrace. Look, at the end of the day, I support, I support the, the, uh, the idea of an inspector general because that will give strength to the, pro to the program. I note that we used to have a commission that looked after uh, compliance that was stripped by the Abbott government. Now it's coming back. That was a huge mistake that they made. And throughout that process, throughout that process where we didn't have that compliance, we had rotting on the river rotting and theft on the river. And that does no one any good, including other irrigators. So um, you know, that, that's, that's uh, the, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in. Okay? Uh, we've, we, we've now got to get back to the point where we do have uh, an inspector general. And I will point out, in terms of amendments, I have circulated one that does seek to remove authority uh, in, uh, or, or remove an overreach where the Murray-Darling Basin Authority is seeking extraordinary powers. Uh, I will also uh, advise the chamber that I do not intend to move my second reader. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Today I rise very proudly in this place, not just as the National Party Senate leader, and I do foreshadow second reading amendments. Um, and I'll, I'll step the chamber through those. But as a Victorian senator, and as a senator that lives in a basin community, was raised in a basin community, and a senator that was actually in this place uh, when Penny Wong was water minister and when the Labor Party went into our communities, purchased buybacks during a millennial drought and devastated not just families and communities, but industries as well, who are only just now recovering. And what really galls 
National Party senators, and you heard it from Senator Davey, you'll hear it from me, is those that choose to portray us as somehow not interested in a triple bottom line, not understanding how important ecosystems and environments are to the sustainability and health of the river and of our communities. Uh, it, it is incredibly galling because we live there and we know it. What you're seeing here today is a repeat of the debate that we had 10 years ago and the preceding two years before that as uh, it was mooted around a bald set of numbers that we know weren't based in science. We know that. That really were just picked out of the air. There was no modelling behind them. And really it was about winning city seats for the Labor Party and supported by the Greens. We knew the river needed work and we were prepared to put in place a plan that was going to be adaptive and flexible, that was going to rely on science and that actually delivered great outcomes for everyone. We don't need to be a rocket scientist, and you've even heard from Labor senators today, about the trauma that the implementation of this plan has riven right throughout the northern and southern basin communities. And it is our job as National Party senators and MPs to do something about it. Now, we know that the Ministerial Council of Water Ministers is responsible for the operation and management of water at a state level. But we are. We do. Our communities have been ripped apart, and it is Senator Davey that hears it day out and day in. It is Senator McKenzie that has to hold the hands of farmers who have to sell up because they cannot afford their water because of this plan. It is us that deals with the human and the economic toll that this plan has wrought on our communities and industry. And it is incumbent on us to try to do something about it. And so, and I will take the interjection, Senator O'Neill, we are in government. And that is why we are moving amendments today as the second party of government, and I look forward to your support, Senator. I look forward to the Labor Party supporting these amendments. Now, the plan was continually described as an adaptive plan, objective. The Basin Plan was never to remain static. That is actually what our communities were told 10 years ago. We were supposed to adapt to new information as science came because we knew we hadn't metered all the rivers. We didn't have the data available as a Commonwealth and as states to really map it out. So the plan was supposed to gather, gather the science, gather the data and adapt uh, along the way. And today is an example of the plan adapting as we considered the establishment of independent office for the Inspector General of Water Compliance. I believe it's important to correct a number of falsehoods suggested by Federal Labor and the Greens regarding water recoveries in the basin. They would have you believe the environment still needs more water. That's their primary argument. The environment needs more water. Volumes as high as 40,000 megalitres, because this was the figure quoted in the Basin Plan Guide back in 2011. The guide's figure were just a guide, and that's a direct quote from the guide. They were based on a rule of thumb of environmental requirement at pre-development levels. There was no science behind these numbers. This was unrealistic approach, given there were no plans to remove the many dams, weirs, locks and barrages that regulate the basin and have for 100 years. The MDBA modelling reviewed by CSIRO in 2011 found that, and I quote, 3,200 gigalitres plan delivered few additional benefits relative to a 2,800 gigalitre option. So I stand here today, as I stand here today, the Basin Plan has recovered over 21,000 gigalitres for the environment. That is 21,000 gigalitres of water no longer used by agriculture to pr produce food that is now flowing to the environment. We need to be proud of that. And given these numbers had no scientific basis, that is a hell of a lot of water. A hell of a lot of water. It, is, it has devastated the Southern Basin. Labor and the Greens would have you believe the pain endured by these communities 
have been for nothing and that the Murray River is still dying? Well, it's not. Go check it out. I'm here to correct those falsehoods. The MDBA, in its 2020 evaluation, Senator O'Neill, through you, Madam Deputy President, stated, and I quote, the Basin Plan has enabled delivery of water for the environment to support the Coorong, the Lower Lakes, the Murray Mouth ecosystems through the drought, substantially avoiding the environmental degradation that occurred during the millennial drought. It's not me saying it. It's the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that's saying it. The 21 100 gigalitres that have been recovered has done what it was supposed to do. Devastated our communities, but the actual um, environmental degradation that would have occurred hasn't through the last drought. Today I put forward a number of other adaptations required for the Basin Plan, incorporating the latest science and new information. The National Party have listened to rural communities and the pain caused by the plan and believe we are long overdue in putting people back into the plan, putting them front and centre. Our rural communities in the basin have been producing the bulk of the nation's food for home and overseas, and food production keeps people in jobs, keeps our rural communities thriving. Just as our farmers adapt their practices based on there new information, no the basin plan the has to adapt, and it's required to ensure food production can continue with confidence and certainty. As I said, there are four amendments, uh, that, key amendments, that, as National Party Senate Leader, we will be foreshadowing in this second reading uh, speech. They are to remove the 450 gigalitre water buybacks. Get off the table, get out of the legislation the notion that government can just walk back into our communities and grab the 450, because we know the socio-economic detriment. That's number one. Two, we're going to put confidence back on the table for irrigators and remove the threat of buybacks. If Labor Party has the water portfolio, they'll be racing back into our communities to buy back water, decimating irrigation systems. They're proud of it. They can't wait to get their hands on the checkbook. The third one is to allow new 605 projects to put that flexibility in there for states so that they can meet those targets, because right now they can't. The, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan has them so wrapped tight in a quite legalistic interpretation of the plan that there is no the flexibility required now that we have more science and more data. And no further water is to be taken from our communities when the Basin Plan is reviewed in 2024. So those people that want to flag the 2024 review, we're going to get Basin Plan 2. No, you're not. You'll never, ever be able to come back into our communities and take water, ever, because we have the science, we have the science and the data to ensure that the water we have right now, the 21 gigs I, 2100 gigs I spoke about, to use it better to water environmental assets differently so that they get the environmental outcomes that they need and our communities continue to produce food. It's about being smarter, not using the blunt instrument of numbers alone to justify your commitment to the environment, which is what you're doing. What you're doing. The 450 was never guaranteed, as Labor and the Greens would have you believe. It was always conditional on no socio-economic impacts as negative. And when we actually did a review into the socio-economic impacts of the plan on our communities, you know what the Sefton Report came Senator back with, and I directly quote, page nine, Davey. the need for change is pressing. These are our own government reviews. The need to change this plan is pressing. So that's why we are here today. There's no use for us as National Party senators you know, uh, drafting a private senator's bill to sit on the notice paper in some pious uh, approach Order. to actually dealing with the substantive issues. Senator we have been waiting patiently, not for a change of leader, as they would have you believe. We've been waiting patiently for the Water Act and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan Act to come before the Senate so that we would have the opportunity 
to move the amendments our people have sent us here to do to save our industries and our communities from the devastation impacts of these plans. The science underpinning the requirement for the 450 for the Murray Mouth and Lower Lakes in South Australia is flawed. We learnt in 2019 of Professor Gell's work in 2007 had been altered by other scientists in 2009 to support their claim that Lake Alexandrina was a freshwater system. However, recent scientific reviews have shown us that Lake Alexandrina was always an estuary for over, wait for it, 7,000 years. 7,000 years it was an estuary. But here we are decimating communities and families for some purpose that's not even backed by science. It can only be defined as a freshwater system based on construction of the barrages in 1940. So you're not returning it to its natural state, you're returning it to its warlike state. This led to an independent review of Lower Lakes science in April last year, which found that, and I quote, without the barrages, the Lower Lakes would be seasonally estrine with prolonged periods of high salinity during droughts. Not me, not the National Party, scientists. So it makes sense to, no sense to send all the fresh water from upstream that's being used to produce vital food to South Australian lower lakes that will evaporate over 800 gigs every single year. Wetland ecologist and adjunct associate at Charles Sturt University, Max Finlayson, is arguing for change. Another scientist. I heard firsthand from him at our Senate hearing in Shepparton, along with local communities, about the devastation of uh, the plan on our communities. The hard truth science is telling us that salty water entered the lower lakes over the top of the barrages. The 450 is not achievable and therefore we are proposing it's removed from the legislation. Buybacks, as Robbie Sefton's report into socio-economic impacts quotes, have exacerbated the reductions in drier years, and this effect worsens the price impact on irrigators and irrigation communities. The difficulty for local communities is where buyback leads to long-term loss of economic resources and community wherewithal and increases exposure to risk that are not offset by other compensatory gains. So the milk factory closes, the rice mill closes, the cotton gin closes, and then when you can afford water again, you don't have the local infrastructure to employ people. So we are asking that water buybacks must be removed. Abair said in September, buybacks reduce the supply of water available for irrigators, so therefore increase allocation prices unless there is a proportional reduction in demand for irrigation water. Rural communities remain fearful that any shortfall in the plan will see water buybacks back on the table. And we've heard it straight from the mouth of Labor Party MPs in the other place. They can't wait to get their hands on the checkbook and enter our communities and purchase that water. Flexibility, our third reform, relates to uh, the sustainable diversion limit adjustment mechanism, and we want to see much more flexibility for that. We've time and time again heard from rural communities that we need flexibility in these projects, and the ledge doesn't allow for that. We need a more common sense approach that allows us to back the science. And certainty. Our final amendment focuses on ensuring farmers and communities have certainty about the plan. John Howard said back in 2007 that these reforms were a once-off, so we cannot continually be going back into communities, reviewing the plan, Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV. We've got the water. The assets are being watered appropriately. That's a triple bottom line. I'm committed to putting people back in the plan. The National Party is committed to putting people back in the plan. Thank and you, I look Senator forward McKenzie. to moving Time my has amendments. Expired. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, this is what an emboldened National Party looks like under the leadership of Mr Joyce. Here we have it, because one of their very first acts, one of the very first acts of the National Party under Mr Joyce's leadership was to vote on Monday against a motion calling on the Murray-Darling Basin Plan to be delivered in full and on time. And the whole agenda is laid bare, isn't it? Because for eight years they have obstructed, delayed, told falsehoods, misled their own communities, misled people in this place about their intentions in relation to the plan. But here it is, in here now, just 
bald faced statement. We do not intend to deliver it. We are not interested in delivering it. We are going to destroy the architecture that has been created to deal with the very real problems in the Murray Darling Basin. A healthy working river does meet the needs of the ecological communities, the birds, plants and animals that depend on this river system. And it meets the needs of the rural communities that live and farm in those regions. And it meets the needs of the Australian economy. But that is not what's being proposed by these people. The National Party simply want to destroy the base and they want to pretend we can go on over extracting it without limit. And that is simply false. And there is no science that will support that. And there is no reasonable person who, looking at the state of the Murray-Darling Basin today, will support that either. So today I want to indicate that Labor will be moving a second reading amendment in this place. And I am seeking the advice of the Deputy President that I am in a position to do that at this point. I don't believe there are any other amendments before the Chair. Yes, and so I uh, seek to move Amendment 1340 standing in my name. Thank you. So the question is, the motion is... Well, there's been a second reading amendment, but we're not... Oh, we'll do that at the end. Beg your pardon. Right. And um, I'm aware that Senator McLaughlin wants to speak. He has informed me. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, for the call. Uh, I rise to speak on the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. Uh, those of you that were listening carefully to my maiden speech would have we will recall uh, that I have raised the importance of the River Murray to each and every South Australian. The, um, every South Australian is committed to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and its successful operation. And this bill, which I am strongly in favour of, provides the compliance mechanisms which are much needed to ensure that we all have the surety that the plan is working and that everyone who relies and lives on the river has an opportunity, the opportunities um, not degraded, and that each and every person in their interactions with the river is transparent and fair. The, I believe the river itself, we talk about environmental flows, but I think the river itself should be seen as being given a voice. And I believe the 450 gigalitres is effectively its voice. Because as a South Australian, we have the custody of the Coorong, one of the jewels of this country. And the management of a river in a, in a manner as the plan does is not a new concept. It's, un it's, probably, it's management is unique. But it's not a new concept. Ancient rights always were allocated to those living by a river or relied upon a river. And they weren't just rights, they were obligations. Every community not only has rights but also obligations. But so does the river or the environment itself. The river has to have a voice. And that is what the plan ensures. Um, I'm going to ignore the interjections of my South Australian friend, whose passion, though, I share for this river. As a lawyer, I take uh, great comfort from the structure, the structure of this accountability mechanism, there are particularly the enforcement provisions. I think this is what has been lacking in the management of the, of the river. Now, there are many different views along the banks of this river. But I ask honourable senators to spare a thought for those of us that live at its end. It is the, the sole purpose of our community. It is our lifeblood. It is the representation of our aspirations. If it is sick, we are sick. If it thrives, we will thrive. We understand better than anyone the importance of responsible management of this river and the importance that the environment, the community, the wildlife, the biodiversity is to the health of this river and also to the communities. I do not see them as binary concepts. 
It's had a long history, the development of this plan. We've all invested as South Australians in the success of this plan. The, and it is disheartening to ever hear from any quarter, no matter where from, that there is a similar lack of commitment elsewhere to the success of this plan. We, want, we do not want to be, as Australians collectively, to degrade what is one of our greatest national assets that weaves across, in essence, artificial borders. And this plan is also, and its success, is in essence underwriting the success of the Commonwealth itself. If this federal parliament, if this Commonwealth, if the collections of states and territories cannot agree on the successful and healthy river that plan that delivers a healthy river, then how can we expect to be credible trying to help all other, South, all other Australians, no matter where they come from or what their, what their issues are? Now, the Inspector General replaces and assumes independent assurance functions of the non-statutory interim inspector. And I thank the interim inspector for, for his work. But like all positions, it needs the authority of statute and enforcement mechanisms. Importantly, the bill, if enacted, will create real deterrence around water theft and illegal water trading offences by establishing criminal and civil offences. Compliance is at the heart of any water sharing system, and this will be a strong independent regulator and give comfort to all those that see the river as important to their lives. A key priority for the Inspector General will be to encourage greater consistency in the guidelines and standards across the basin so that all water users are held to the same high bar. Consistent standards and guidelines will provide the Inspector General with a framework to evaluate the performance of basin jurisdictions, including the Commonwealth, in delivering the basin plan. I understand that the bill builds on many years of engagement with communities and stakeholders. All community members, and I emphasise all community members, will have greater protection from water theft and water trading as a result of the passage of this bill. It is often said that sunlight is the great disinfectant. And in this case, this is the necessary piece in the puzzle to support the future operation of this plan, but not just its operation, but its success. Each and every South Australian is not only economically committed and tied to this river, but emotionally as well. It is a sacred water path to us all. One only needs to spend time near Goolwa and on the lower lakes to see that its beauty should never be compromised. Our Indigenous people have a deep and abiding connection to this place. Practically, if the Murray mouth fails, then salination will be a problem up further up the river, into Victoria and ultimately New South Wales. South Australia as a state is committed to every tool required to keep the health of this river. So I return to the ancient and magical doctrine of common interest, which I first read about as a Scottish studying law at the Edinburgh University. This plan puts the skeleton and also the flesh on that ancient concept. Rights, yes, but also responsibilities. It, the people that live off the river are extremely important, but their livelihoods will not be secured if the river itself 
as an entity, as a, almost as a living being, is abandoned for rank commercial interests. South Australia may not, never have been settled if it was not for this river. It is the one political issue that binds every South Australian, regardless of their political stripe. And we will continue to advocate for this plan. The Murray-Darling Basin plan for us was a compact for our future, a compact where we could be a participant in this Commonwealth, this federation of states and territories, as an equal partner, and not one under the sword of Damocles, constantly under threat to the actions of others who would otherwise be self-interested further up the source of the river. These problems of various communities around, around or living off rivers, weaving through countries, are not new. But we should show the world that you can come together as a community, as a commonwealth, and deliver water justice for all. And I employ honourable senators, I employ them, implore them to have regard, particularly those upstream, that you have obligations, ancient obligations, to the people of South Australia, not just legislatively, but moral. And therefore, I would like my plea to the Senate to be seen not just as an endorsement of the legislation that underpins the plan and this bill that seeks to enforce it, but also making the moral case for one community to show compassion and care for another. Otherwise, what is the, po what is the point of the Commonwealth? What is the point of this parliament? And what is the point of this Senate? I recommend this bill favourably to my honourable senators. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to discuss not only an addition to this plan to give it this bill to give it some teeth, but I want to discuss the current state of the Murray-Darling Basin to understand the context in which the inspector will be working. And I want to discuss the cause and the core issue before providing an interim solution. Senator Sarah Hanson Young declares it's war on South Australia, this legislation. War on South Australia, and then she adds personal attacks. Why the continued lack of data and facts? Why the continued smears and personal attacks? Why the continued appeal to emotions? Because she lacks data, lacks the facts as a solid base for her position. The Water Act of 2007 and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan are an attack on Australia. The aims are repeatedly specified throughout the Water Act three or four times that the aims include compliance with international agreements. What are we doing specifying compliance with international agreements as an aim for a Water Act governing our country? I know of prominent Liberals who now regret voting in favour of the Water Act. The war on Australia through the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is based on lies and misinformation. The South Australian drains taking water straight out of the basin and dumping it into the, into the Great Southern Ocean. The Coorong, as a result, becoming polluted. And Lake Alexandrina, a mess because they've gone away from the natural state and continue to abandon the science. Devastating southern Queensland, devastating southern New South Wales, devastating northern Victoria. And the Murray-Darling Basin Plan now appeases large corporate agriculture, devastates the Barmer Choke, the Murray River itself. So much for giving life to the ba basin. So we've travelled across the whole basin, overflown the whole basin, gone across the basin on the ground listening to people, the South, the North, South Australia, Queensland, New South Wales. I have felt the frustration 
the anger, the, the credible hopelessness, the devastation, the stunned incredulity in people in southern New South Wales, towns like Mulliman, where I was nearly brought to tears just listening to the people. In Derrimbandi, similarly, in Wilcannia, people feeling devastated, angry, frustrated, hurt and lonely. People are needing honesty and integrity, support, understanding, certainty, some security, some reassurance, some confidence, some competence. They cannot see the competence in the way it's governed. Leadership, care, hope, respect. And they want to be free to get on with their lives and live fulfilling livelihoods. And above all, the people right across the basin want to be heard. And they want to be treated with respect and with objective data so that they can see what's, what's coming. Farmers, families, communities, whole regions need this care. So I want to thank the many people who turn up at community gatherings to voice their concerns to us and give us their ideas and solutions. Hundreds of people at a time. Whole communities turn out because we listen. And they know through our actions here in Parliament, on social media and in person, that we care and we work and we take action. And we thank the people across the Murray-Darling Basin for their support and their encouragement. Let's look for a minute at what others are doing in creating a bigger, deeper, messier mess. The Greens, environmental vandalism, stealing more water and saying to frogs, this is environmental water, this is farm water. It gets into the environment, but it doesn't matter. They just destroy livelihoods. And causing environmental problems in South Australia, and have been since 1864. Labor is seeking votes in South Australia, sacrificing our country in a grab for power. The Liberals are looking after their moneyed mates in corporate agriculture and around Lake Alexandrina. And the Nationals sleepily awakening after One Nation has exposed the Murray-Darling Basin Plan's flaws for five years. First of all, the Nationals tried to ignore us. Then they tried to ridicule us. Then they tried to misrepresent what we exposed. And then they pretended to address what we exposed in their sham actions, which we exposed again. All we do is we get the facts. We keep on getting the facts. Now the Nationals are desperately trying to bring back Mr Barnaby Joyce, the counterproductive, to counter Mr Michael McCormack, the unproductive. The ultimate cause of this mess is decisions, policies and party positions based on ideology, emotion, state partisanship, grubbily and dishonestly grabbing votes and ignoring data, contradicting the data. This lack of objectivity makes it ripe for diversions and misrepresentations. The core issue is atrocious governance. Well, let's look at Mr Barnaby Joyce's behaviour. You decide for yourself. Ask Queensland farmers what they think of him selling, out, selling them out and being a circus performer to get media attention while a senator. He was the most colourful speaker, and I give him full credit for his, his words against the climate scam. Then he entered Cabinet and let Malcolm Turnbull steal $400 million of taxpayer funds on wind turbines, splash them across his electorate to try and beat Tony Windsor. Then when we entered the Senate, the same person who had been a sceptic, then became a climate alarmist, call, we called him out and he eventually went quiet. Then he exited Cabinet and now he's whispering messages implying he may be a sceptic again. Really? He's now indicating he may be thinking of standing up because One Nation is attracting sorry, people sorry, who put Senator, Australia Senator first. Roberts, uh, Senator Canavan, a point of order. Uh, 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 um, on relevance, um, I know One Nation are incredibly worried about the return of Barnaby Joyce, the leader of the Nationals Party, but I hardly see how his positions on climate change relate to this bill on the Murray-Darling. Uh, Senator Roberts, on the point of order, or well, Senator Canavan, it is a, a broad-ranging debate so far, so I think I will let Senator Roberts continue. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I note I have the support of the Greens and Senator Lambie for my comments, uh, because they are su the, supporting the truth on this. He's now he's my right to speak. Mr Barnaby Joyce is now indicating he may be thinking of standing up because One Nation is attracting people who put Australia first, who put data first, who know that climate alarm is a UN con to control. Then we have his mate, Senator Canavan, climate sceptic initially, climate alarmist, with a speech 
proclaiming that humans are, are, are hurting the climate. Senator Ian Macdonald pointed it out to me. I held Senator Canavan accountable. Now we've got whispering from Senator Canavan implying that he's now a sceptic again, climate sceptic again, talking up coal and pretending to support coal while voting for Liberals' anti-coal policies. Four years Mr Morrison has been talking about coal but putting policies in place that oppose it. So let's step back in the Murray-Darling Basin plan to their predecessors, Mr John Senator, Anderson. Senator Roberts, stealing Senator Roberts uh, the debate is interrupted. You will be in continuation. I shall now proceed to Senator's statements and I call Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I want to talk, I want to talk about the uh, Marangupan family from Billawoola. But before I stay, let me say this. I'm not a bleeding heart, but the courts have decided that prayer and aides aren't owed protection as refugees. They fled a civil war. That's no longer a civil war. Wrongly or rightly, that's what our system has found. They've come to Australia without a valid visa, claimed asylum, found not to be owed asylum, so they're without a valid visa. If their youngest daughter doesn't get granted protection, none of the people in the family will have a legal claim to stay in Australia. That's what the law says in black and white. The letter of the law is crystal clear here. But there's a part of that law that allows the Minister for Immigration to use his or her discretion when it comes to decisions like this. It's a power that lets the Minister say, when there's a clash between the law that says and what common sense would tell you, the minister's got the chance to use some common sense. Surely now surely now's one of those times. Because if you stick by the absolute letter of the law, you're threatening to send two little kids home to a country they've never been to. You're deporting two little kids from a country they've lived in all their lives to a country they've never even seen and telling them they're home. That's what the law would have you do. I had to resign from Parliament in 2017 because I was found to have a dual citizenship with Scotland. I've never been to Scotland, and if you asked me to shut up shop here in Australia, ship off and live in Scotland, never come back, I'd be lost. I wouldn't know where to start. I'd feel like what, I, what was being asked of me wasn't fair. Here's the country I've lived in all my life, I've paid my taxes in, that I've grown up in, I've served, in, served it in uniform and I've represented my state in its federal parliament. And now that country is telling me to go home, home to a country I've never called home. It wasn't my choice where my dad was born. Those two girls, it wasn't their choice either. You don't choose your parents. Those girls didn't choose their parents. And I don't know how you look at those two girls in the eye and tell them, hey, Sorry, sweethearts, it's nothing personal, it's not your fault, but there's no home here for you. Pre and natives are not owed our protection, but just because we don't owe them this little bit of mercy doesn't mean we can't offer it to them. When you give something away and it's not out of obligation, that's what you call generosity. That's the Australian way. We have the ability to be extremely generous here, not because we have to, just because it's a decent thing, it's a decent Australian thing to do. And it's not, re it's not going to restart the people smuggling trade. That is absolute rubbish. And God, if I hear that once more, look out. What kind of message are we frightened of sending? That if we show a little bit of kindness, a little bit of the Australian way to this family, then other people will look at that and go, I'll sign up for the same. They'll all make the life-threatening trip across the ocean in a sinking boat. They'll all arrive in Australia, try and put down some roots, get put in detention, get put in detention in another place. They'll all sign up to be left there until their own child's blood turns poison in their veins. Even if you believe that, even if all that were true and people were signing up in droves for a deal just like that, they'd still have to invent a time machine or bring in Doctor Who and the TARDIS and come here before 2013. <sighs> I know, it annoys me. Because since then we've had turnbacks, we've had offshore detention, we've had Operation Sovereign Borders and it's stopped the boats. The Minister for Immigration has announced that he's letting the Tamil family reunite in Perth under community detention. 
Good on him for doing that. But he's drawn the line at allowing them the chance for permanent resettlement. He's got the power because Parliament's given him the power and he won't use it. He says, he's saying he can't ever use it full stop because if it does, it'll create an incentive for people smugglers to start up again. I don't know what planet this minister's on, but he may want to get some national security briefings because obviously he's been missing in action. Either that or he's got no life experience and has no idea what he's yapping on about. I'll be brutally honest there. Your power minister is sitting there and it's unable to be used. It creates false hope for families. It's unnecessary. And by the way, here's a news press release for you. It's redundant. I would suggest you do something about that, Minister. I would suggest you use it or lose it, I reckon. And the minister's told us that he can't use it. Fine. If he doesn't want to use that power, he doesn't have the courage to use it because he wants to play a noddy and think that's going to give him points out there for an election. Once again, I don't know where you live, Minister, but you ain't living in the real world. So, in saying that, if you are not going to use that power, Minister, I have no problem in putting up an amendment to the Migration Act to take that power off you and so trying my luck in here just to see whether or not I can remove it. So either show some courage and show some mercy on these two young ladies and their family or try my patience, because that is where we are at. I can assure you this act, this act to these young ladies and their families would have to be one of the most ungodliest things I am yet to see in this parliament. Show some mercy. Show some courage. You want to make a mark in this place? You want to show much, you want to make a mark in this place and show some heart and show what Australia is really about? You want to show some values of our own upbringings here? You have the perfect opportunity. You have the perfect opportunity to make your mark right now. You have the perfect opportunity to do what is the right thing to do. Because let's be honest. It is the right thing to do here. You cannot keep going around this circle. This, you have no other choice. I mean, you can keep going if you like and you can look the worst in the world and you can continue to do that. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. But while you're doing that, I want you to think about those two girls who have spent nearly every day of their lives in detention so far. I want you to think of the harm that you've already brought those two ladies before they've even gone, before they've even basically started school. You have a good think about that. Let me know how your conscience goes with that. Why don't you stand in front of me and tell me how your conscience is next time you see me? Because if you don't want to tell me, I intend on asking you. And we'll see who wins that debate one on one. Let's see how much courage you really do have. Let's see. But right now, if you are not going to use that power, and use it to its own, to the ability it should be used, for good or bad. Use that power, or I'm going to come after you, and I'm going to try and take that power off you. I will try it. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And before I start, can I concur with the comments from Senator Lambie? And I think Senator Lambie, your passion—you can see your passion—and everything you said makes sense. And 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 I want to reiterate to the disgraceful comment that by letting these children and their mum and dad here into Australia where there's plenty of room will open up the people smuggling. I don't know what goes through ministers' heads, where they, what goes through their head at night where they think that that's a really intelligent, smart thing to say when they get in front of the cameras. Disgraceful. Good on you, Senator Lambie. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, I've got a couple of things I want to talk about today. But the first one I want to bring to the attention of the chamber, and I think it's a magnificent 
timing of this because we've sat through this Senate chamber in the last couple of weeks debating the transport amendment bill and you've all heard my thoughts around shipping foreign shipping and foreign flags of convenience but I was talking to my very 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 good friend today Mr Ian Bray from the ITF he and I go back many many years and proudly I say at every forum I stand in Ian is a mate, Ian is a comrade. We have stood together shoulder to shoulder on battles on the waterfront in Western Australia. And uh, he gave me some figures today and I said, well, look, I, I want to put it to the Senate. So the International Transport Workers Federation operate a global inspectorate that looks after the welfare of the international seafarers. And in 2020, the ITF globally managed to recover some 45 million US dollars. Now let that sink in. 45 million US dollars in unpaid wages and entitlements of some of the world's most exploited and vulnerable workers, the seafarers. The world relies on seafarers, as we know as an island nation, to keep the global economy afloat. And I do ask to be excused for the pun. And this is how they are treated. Now, the Australian Inspectorate of the ITF operates with a team of five full-time employees. This team of five attempts to hold ship owners to account, particularly the ship owners that hide behind the flags of convenience nations. In 2020, the Australian Inspectorate of the ITF conducted no less than 512 inspections around Australia and recovered two million US dollars of stolen wages for international seafarers. In 2021, to date, the Australian Inspectorate of the ITF has conducted no less than 211 inspections nationally and has already recovered $2 million US, that's US, in stolen wages. Given we are only halfway through the year, this is a terrible sign and further demonstrates the exploitation of international seafarers is on the rise. On the rise. Sorry, something we've talked about in this building for many, many years. I'm also informed that the ITF Australian Inspectorate has identified a further 57 million US dollars of wage theft and other entitlements that they are currently trying to resolve with three companies. Now, hear me out. 57 million US, three companies. Now, these companies are all preferred charters of Alcoa. And whilst not all this wage theft has occurred in the Alcoa supply chain, a fair chunk of it has. Let us sink in. 57 million US dollars. And I'll remind the Senate that Alcoa is the same company that used security guards to remove Australian seafarers from the MV Portland in 2016. I remember vividly dragged out of their bunks in the dark of night, marched down the gangplank to be replaced by exploited foreign seafarers, Alcoa. Now, the MUA warned us that wage theft and exploitation would feature in the Alcoa supply chain going forward, and given the figures reported from the ITF Australian Inspectorate, how right they were. These figures of wage theft are a national embarrassment, and this government, you mob over there, needs to stop supporting this shameful theft and exploitation. Companies like Alcoa need to take stock and re-employ Australian seafarers in coastal trade and, at the very, very least, take control of their supply chain and clean up this chronic exploitation and wage theft. Now, on another note, Mr Acting Deputy President, I now want to bring, the Senate, or bring to the attention of the Senate a infrastructure spend in Queensland. So you know two of my passions are standing up for Australian seafarers and strand in my second and in no particular order, and my other passion I should say is standing up for Australia's road transport operators. Now up in Gatton, that's out of uh, Queensland, um, they, uh, the federal and state governments had a bit of money, and they, uh, uh, this was after the Toowoomba bypass. Um, they had about 18 million dollars left that they were putting towards building a what, this is the terminology of today's um, bureaucracy and governments, decoupling facility. In my days, we used to call them a road train assembly area, but anyway, let's call it a decoupling facility. Now, it's called the um, Gatton Heavy Vehicle 
decoupling facility and its location is accessible from Warrigo Highway adjacent to Houses Road in Gatton. And good on the two governments getting together to provide these road train assembly areas. Let's talk normal language, shall we? Okay, so our truckies can get out there, chuck the second on the third. I don't know what they actually do out in Gatton, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. I don't know where, you know, what's going in and out of there, but I know that this is where road trains are hooking up and unhooking and all that sort of stuff. And see, they've told me there's about 30 truck parking bays, so on saying that, it's not a very big one, it's quite small. So what actually happens is you'll have dog runners coming out from Brisbane, dropping out to Gatton, where the road train will, the other driver will follow, hook up the dolly and the other trailer and off they go, chuff, chuff, head east, and this is when we're keeping the uh, road trains out of the uh, metropolitan area for obvious reasons. But you see, I want to congratulate the two governments for having the NAUS to actually do something like this, and they would have done it because there would have been a fair bit of pressure, not only from the community but from the trucking industry. But one would think, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to spend $15 million of infrastructure to do the truckies a favour, as part of the favour, wouldn't you not consult the transport industry and would you not say to the road transport industry, hey, we're going to build this facility and I'll tell you what we'll tell the community. We'll tell them that it improves safety. I'm not going to argue that it improves safety. We'll tell the community that it increases capacity, whatever that means, anyway. Uh, we'll tell the community that it improves network efficiency and the road transport industry, right? Diggity boot, no worries. Uh, it reduces travel time as an old truckie, magic. Absolutely magic. Reduces travel time. Get home to see mum and the kids earlier. Even better. Contributes to the economy. Oh well, you've got to expect that line thrown in. Yeah, I don't know how because the more cheap freight, the bigger the trucks get, the more cheap freight we cart. Okay, that's anyway. That's the world according to Still. And it contributes to regional growth. Duh. Okay, good, fantastic. But now we've got a campaign being led. It's come to my attention over Facebook by uh, Mr Wes Walker. Now, Wes himself, I don't know Wes, but I reckon he's a damn good bloke. So Wes Walker is not a truckie, but he's got a lot of his mates who are truckies. So they've been talking to Wes, and he's absolutely had a gutful. So you know why? Because they spent $15 million in the best interest of our truckies, but there's no toilet. Now, senators in 2021, let me let that sink in. We have a road train assembly area. We spent $15 million, but no one thought that the truckies might actually like a toilet. And if they had one ounce of uh, uh, significance to understand what us truckies do, they would have come and asked the truckies. But don't worry about that. If the milk's not on the shelf or the loaf of bread, they'll soon tell us what they think of us truckies. But anyway, so the guys are here and they're uncoupling. And you know what? They even might want to have a shower. Now, I remember running the campaign back in the 90s to get the Woburn Road Train Assembly area done in WA, and I've got to tell you, we were pretty proud. We actually got a big hunk of dirt and we put some bitumen on it and we put toilets and showers in it. God help us. We even put lighting. We even wanted our truckies to be able to come in, unhook, pull the, pull the airlines out, pull the light lead out, drop the, drawbar, the, the leg of the drawbar and the dolly. You beauty, three hours from home, I might even have a tub. What is wrong with that? What is wrong with expecting our truckies, our, tr tr our truckies, to actually want to have a shower? But something as basic as a toilet, we can't even get that. In the article on the big rigs, and let me tell you, that is the best publication, the best transport pub publication in this nation is big rigs. You want to know what's going on in the trucking industry? Just get hold of James Graham and big rigs; he'll tell you. But there was one lady they spoke to, a, a, a female truck driver, and God help us. I'm doing everything I can to try and get more females, more women into the trucking industry. She's quoted in this article because she's gone into the road train assembly. This is disgraceful. But uh, she said that she had to go the other night. So she was squatting, I'm quoting from the Big Rigs article, was squatting down and another truck came down and shone their lights on her as he came round the corner. I mean, really, in 2021, do I have to stand in this Senate to plead with someone with half a brain, go and talk to the truckies who are using these facilities before you spend our taxpayer dollars and get what they want? Senator McKean. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last Sunday marked the 15-month anniversary of Australia's international border closure. In the first few months of the pandemic, the chaos and the lack of a plan was understandable. We were facing a once-in-a-generation pandemic, a scramble to keep Australia safe and to get the pandemic 
under control. But here we are now, 15 months on, and still no plan from the government. No plan for how to reunite Australian citizens and permanent residents separated from their partners by the border closure. Loved ones remain separated because their relationships don't meet the right definition or they don't hold the right visa. And while we welcomed the Senate passing part of our motion yesterday calling on the government to make holders of prospective marriage visas automatically exempt from the inbound travel ban, this partner visa class should never have been excluded in the first place. These 593 couples should never have been kept apart by this government. The reality is our partner visa system is broken. Couples wait up to 22 months for their visas to be processed, and that was before the pandemic. Their pain and despair is palpable, with no end in sight. The government also has no plan for how to reunite children on temporary visas who are separated from one or both of their parents by the inbound travel ban. We don't even know how many children are separated under existing guidelines because, according to the government, providing that figure would involve an unreasonable diversion of resources. My office alone is aware of 70 children that are separated from one or both of their parents. 30 of those children were living in Australia before the borders closed, and 15 of these children were born in Australia. The onshore parents that are already living and working in this country as skilled workers, professionals, tradies, students, contributing alongside everyone else to our society, to our economy and to our COVID recovery. Labor and the government couldn't even bring themselves to support the second part of the Greens motion in the, se in the Senate yesterday, which may have enabled those 70 children to be reunited with their parents. The government tells us that the parents in Australia, separated from their children, should pack up their homes, quit their jobs, give up on their futures in this country and leave Australia. That's what the government is telling them. And yet the government let 160 personnel, technicians and media into Australia for the Australian Open earlier this year, not to mention the 869 tennis players and eight family members of those players. And that's not to mention the wealthy people who hold investor visas in this country who can come and go as they please due to being completely exempt from the inbound travel ban. The hypocrisy here is despicable. If you aren't rich or famous or a sports star, the government doesn't want you here. If you are rich and famous or a sports star, come and go as you please. So I ask the government, what are we doing to these vulnerable children and their parents? What harms are we inflicting on them now and into their futures? And what does this say about us as a nation? The government also has no plan for the parents of Australian citizens and permanent residents who are desperate to reunite with their children and grandchildren living in Australia. More heartbreaking stories. Australians suffering from severe, life-threatening illness, mental health issues and postpartum depression, all needing the support of their parents. Last week, I tabled on behalf of the Greens a petition in the Senate signed by over 70,000 people calling on the government to make parents an exemption category. A third of Australians have parents living overseas and their plight can no longer be ignored. And yet this government continues to ignore it. And what about the thousands of other temporary visa holders stranded overseas and unable to return to Australia through no fault of their own? Again, the government has no plan for them. The 145 people stranded overseas who are waiting for their 887 permanent residency visas to be processed. If this government processed visas in a timely manner, these people would already be 
permanent residents and back in their homes with their families in Australia or have the right to come back here. The 8,463 people stranded overseas on 489 and 491 visas. These were meant to be Australia's next group of permanent residents, but their futures are now at risk because they might not be able to meet their permanent residency requirements. Years of hard work, years of planning, slipping away before their very eyes, thanks to the government. And the 3,835 people stranded overseas on expired bridging visa Bs who own businesses and have lived in Australia for many years while waiting for their substantive visas to be processed, locked out of Australia in a visa limbo. Then there are the 14,475 people on 485 visas who have invested thousands of dollars studying in this country and who are begging the government to provide automatic extensions and visa reinstatements so they can return to Australia when the borders reopen. Not to mention the 1,443 people on 476 visas, recent engineering graduates that Australia desperately needs to fill critical engineering skill shortages across a range of sectors. They are also begging for their visas to be extended. And we have international students, many of whom have worked their guts out to afford their degrees in Australia and contribute to the tertiary education sector. They too need visa extensions and a pathway to return. They too want a plan. So I ask the government yet again, where's your plan to address the heartbreak of loved ones and immediate families separated by our border closure? Why won't the government extend people's visas and outline a plan for their return and a time frame within that plan? You were very quick, Minister, to roll out your plans for the rich, for the famous, for the sports stars and for the wealthy investors who can come and go as they please. But what about everyone else? Doesn't their lives count for you? Families should be together. I honestly think we can all agree on that. But we cannot continue to ignore their pain and we should stop ignoring their pain. Australia's temporary visa holders have built lives or want to build lives in this country. So many of them have got jobs here, run businesses here, their kids go to school here, they pay their taxes here and they have a future here. They deserve so much better than the absolute disdain and lack of care and regard they have been shown throughout their crisis. I demand of the government, on behalf of all of those people I've mentioned here today, tell us and tell them what your plan is. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Australia is a nation that has a reputation of being true to our word a nation that plays by the rules, a nation that seeks to ensure those rules are fair and enforceable. This is the case when it comes to emission reductions. The facts are we're meeting and exceeding our international obligations by reducing emissions by over 20 per cent based on 2005 levels. We're cutting emissions faster than other like nations, such as New Zealand and Canada. And it's also true when it comes to free trade. Last week we celebrated signing the UK-Australia Free Trade Agreement. This wasn't always the case. After World War II, the world opened to a liberal free trade agenda to build prosperity and, importantly, to build peace in what had been a very traumatic start to last century with two horrific world wars. That framework was not initially in Australia's best interest and advantage because it was being favoured and negotiated and constructed by large, already industrialised nations like the United States and the United Kingdom. We back then were a relatively undeveloped economy. We uh, actually became wealthy on literally the sheep's back. We did a lot of wool 
We did a lot of butter, we did some lamb, and that's about it. We did not have a manufacturing sector. My party back then, the Country Party, because of leaders like former Trade Minister John McEwen, made sure Australia's best interests were secured at international forums, ensuring trade relations had to be mutually beneficial. Fast forward to today and Australia faces not a dissimilar challenge with regards to emissions reductions and the push to commit to net zero. We recently saw G7 member nations pledge their intent to accelerate plans to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions by no later than 2050. And in light of this, we have seen plenty of calls at home and abroad for Australia to do the same. Yet it is one thing for politicians to promise anything on the international stage about net zero in a far distant future when none of us will be around to be accountable for that decision. And it's quite another to be able to deliver on that promise, especially when it ignores the realities that some of the world's biggest carbon dioxide emitters, like China, currently have a green light to increase their emissions for years. You don't hear much about that from the Greens. Or where other countries are setting more ambitious targets while failing to actually meet the targets and pledges they made under Kyoto. Nowhere near their targets on Paris. But here they've got these hyper-ambitious pieces going forward. And countries like Canada. Rich industrialised nations may have the luxury to demand that others do more on emissions, but this ignores their competitive advantage of established, no low emissions dispatchable technologies, technologies such as nuclear energy, or the fact that these countries are endowed with large sources of hydroelectricity, or both. And they can run that alongside intermittent technologies. For example, in 2019, France generated 72 per cent, the US 20 per cent and the UK 17 per cent of their electricity from nuclear power generation. Affordable, reliable, zero emission electricity means you can have affordable electricity bills and feel good at the same time. It means you can have a manufacturing industry employing millions of people uh, and also do your bit in lowering emissions. These are luxuries we cannot afford, especially when we continue the paradoxical practice of prohibiting nuclear energy while exporting uranium for others to generate zero emission electricity. That is why Australia must be wary of calls to set emission targets which cannot be met without destroying hundreds of thousands of jobs in the communities I represent in agriculture, mining, manufacturing. Or, to demand, or are demanded by those who seek to coerce us into setting targets by imposing carbon tariffs on our vitally important exports that underpin our national economy, like iron ore, like coal. That's what Europe wants us to do. This is simply a non-tariff barrier, trade barrier by another name, one that my party will vehemently oppose. Because let me be clear, it has been rural and regional Australia that's done the heavy lifting to date on reducing emissions and supporting energy transition. And as the energy room of the Australian economy, regional and rural Australia will continue to shoulder the demands of any further emission reduction commitments that may come in the future, should anyone seek to have the conversation with the National Party. In the end, I've always been confident that technology will be the solution to reducing emissions without costing jobs. And as each year passes, my confidence grows rather than diminishes. And while some may believe in silver bullet solutions, my party and I do not. We do believe that some bullets have a larger calibre than others when ensuring that Australia uses reliable and affordable energy and reduces emissions. And that's why we support a range of technologies alongside intermittent renewables, nuclear, carbon capture and storage, high efficiency, low emission uh, coal fire. Nevertheless, my party and I are also realists. We recognise, because, not because we eat coal for breakfast, but because the experts tell us that coal and natural gas will continue to remain essential for decades to Australia's energy needs if we don't want to see blackouts. 
Why? Because coal and gas, particularly coal, have provided decades of cheap, reliable energy for our industries and households, and they remain our biggest exports and continue to underpin the prosperity that pays for our schools, that pays for our hospital. And we also recognise that Australian energy resources continue to underpin, underpin the prosperity of our neighbours, the developing countries in Asia, who need to also lift their populations out of poverty uh, through industrialising their economies and providing jobs, uh, well-paying jobs. The International Energy Agency highlights in the past 20 years that Southeast Asia energy uh, demand has grown by more than 6 per cent per annum. And meanwhile, China continues to add 30 uh, gigawatts of new coal capacity, or 3 per cent of its current electricity generation capacity. That's equivalent of adding New South Wales and Victoria's electricity capacity every year. This insatiable appetite for energy is expected to continue as they want to meet their energy demands and lift their own people out of poverty. The US Energy Information Administration, in their International Energy Outlook 2019 project, project uh, a nearly 50 per cent increase in world energy use by 2050. That's a fact. It's not going to be led by already industrialised rich nations like ours in Europe and the US and the UK, but it's going to be led by Asia. It would be therefore absurd to turn our backs on the needs of our neighbours and others who want our high calorific coal, as some in this chamber would suggest. To do so would only see Australian coal substituted for dirtier, lower quality alternatives from people we compete against around the world. And you know what? We'd end up increasing global emissions. So if the goal is to lower global emissions, because this is a global problem, and these are the things you have to think about before you churn out glib phrases of zero emissions by 2050. Because some of the things you're wanting to shut down in this town, in this country, actively contribute to lifting people from poverty and lowering emissions around the globe. That's how we account for it. Australia needs to ensure the rules and methodologies that underpin this move by the globe are fair, are actually enforceable, so we don't have people promising the world and delivering nothing, are agreed and, importantly, are in our national interest. The post-World War II free trade regime took an enormous amount of hard negotiations and unrelenting work. Any genuine, transparent, rules-based system to reduce emissions will require the same effort from our nation. We must therefore deploy all of our diplomatic and trade resources to ensure Australia's interests are looked after. Failing to do so risks us sleepwalking into an international agreement that favours rich, industrialised nations that already have a competitive advantage in powering low emission, zero emission uh, energy. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I want to take the opportunity to touch on a few subjects in this statement uh, of great concern in my home state of Queensland. This week, of course, we've seen yet another week in Parliament hijacked by the National Party's internal political games. This week, we've seen yet another week in Canberra where the Nationals have spent the entire week focusing on their own jobs, not on the jobs of people in regional Queensland. Now, at the same time as the National Party have in engaged in yet another game of musical chairs about their leadership, yet another petty schoolyard squabble about who gets the top job, at the same time as the National Parties have been fighting each other, coal miners across Queensland and New South Wales have been fighting just to get a decent pay's job, a decent, decent, pay, decent day's pay wage and decent conditions for their job. At the same time as the Nationals have been fighting about who gets the big job, the big car, the big office, we've seen coal miners across Queensland and New South Wales simply fighting to hang on to their job and to get any degree of job security. Now, why is that? The reason for that is because over the eight long years of the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison government, 
supported by a parade of National Party leaders that seem to change every day of the week. At the same time as that has been happening, uh, coal miners across Queensland and New South Wales have suffered from a total explosion of casualisation and labour hire that this government has done nothing about and, in fact, has actually actively supported. Every National Party member and every LNP member in this chamber knows that under their government's watch, casualisation and labour hire has exploded across Queensland and North New South Wales uh, coal fields. Now, what that means for miners is that they don't have job security. They never know whether they're going to get kept on from one day or one week to the next. And in many cases, they actually end up getting paid less uh, than the permanent workers who they work right alongside, even after they get a casual loading. Because this is always the argument you hear from the other side, that it's OK to be casual, you get paid a casual loading, that makes up for the loss of the conditions. Well, I can tell you, anyone who thinks that hasn't spent any time in any coal fields across Queensland or New South Wales with permanent work. So at the same time as we see the National Party caring only about their own jobs, we see coal miners across Queensland and New South Wales worrying about whether they'll actually get to keep their job from one week to the next. But fortunately, not everyone in Canberra is focused on their own jobs. Some of us are actually focused on the jobs of the people we represent. And that's why last night I had the great pleasure of joining our leader, Anthony Albanese, uh, in a virtual town hall with coal miners from around the country, from around Queensland, New South Wales and even some from WA. And we took the opportunity to listen to them, unlike what the government does, who just rolls into town, dressed up like miners, goes and sees the boss but never talks to the workers to find out what they're going through. We took the opportunity to listen to what coal miners have got to say and we learnt even more about the situation that they're experiencing, about not having permanent work, about not knowing from one day or one week to the next whether you're going to keep your job, about being too concerned about losing your job to not speak up about safety issues on site. And we saw what happened there at the Grosvenor mine recently uh, and the inquiry into the explosion, which nearly cost five workers their lives. Um, and as well as listening to those workers, it was a great pleasure to actually have some solutions to put forward in the form of Labor's same job, same pay policy. For Labor, there is a very simple principle at stake, whether we're talking about the mining industry or any other industry right around this country. If you do the same job as someone who you're working alongside, you should get at least the same pay. None of this business of being engaged as a casual or through some shonky labour hire outfit where you get paid less, where you get less benefits, where you get less job security, less sick leave, less annual leave. That has got to stop. And it should have stopped a, lot time, a long time ago, because this government has known that this has been a problem for years. If they don't know that because they take the trouble to go, actually at, go to the coalfields and actually meet with miners and meet with mining communities, who will raise this as the very first issue when you're in conversation with them, they certainly know that because we have been raising it in this chamber year after year after year. And still, we see no action from this government, and we still see no action from their friends in One Nation, who also claim to represent coal miners. In fact, we saw the disgraceful situation recently uh, where One Nation and the LNP ganged up um, to vote for legislation which was actually going to only entrench casualisation in the mining industry, despite all their claims to be fixing it. So the regime we've now got in place from this government, backed in by One Nation, basically leaves it up to the boss to decide whether you're a casual or not. It doesn't matter if you've got long rosters, week to week, same rosters for years to come. If the boss says that you're a casual, then you're going to get paid as a casual and you're not going to get permanent employment. That's what the LNP and One Nation think of coal miners, for all their claims and all their grandstanding uh, to the contrary. It's Labor who actually cares about the rights of mining workers. It's Labor who've actually got the policies to do something about this especially our same job, same pay, and it's Labor who, after the next election, will have the opportunity to implement those policies and actually show who really cares about mining jobs. People in mining computers have had an absolute gutful of the National Party in particular, but the Liberals and One Nation as well, arguing more about their own jobs rather than actually doing something about the jobs in mining communities. 
Labor's not like that. We're actually going to stand up for those communities. We're going to stand up for those workers. We're going to change the law and make sure that they get decent conditions at work and they get the, 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 the job security that this government and One Nation have denied them. Now, the other issue I want to touch on uh, is some changes, very drastic changes, that are coming to Medicare on 1 July. We know very well that the Liberal and National parties don't believe in Medicare. They never have. When the Hawke government introduced Medicare in 1983, the Liberals and the Nationals opposed it. And ever since, they've been taking steps to try to cut Medicare, to undermine it and eventually abolish it. Let's look at what they tried to do order, order. immediately after being elected in 2013. And I know Senator Stoker is sensitive about this. If I'd spent my entire political career trying to kill Medicare, I'd be pretty sensitive as well. Let's look at what they did straight after they got elected in 2013. They tried to introduce a co-payment to undermine the fact that any Australian who is sick can go into a doctor and get free medical care, the best medical care in the world, without having to pay for it. That is how Australia should be. That is, how, that is what Australians love about Australia, is that unlike the United States, which Senator Stoker and many of her colleagues want to model our health system on, you can get free medical care, the very best medical care, whether you are rich or poor whether you live in the city or the country. But unfortunately, that is becoming harder for so many Australians, particularly in rural and regional Australia, because of the cuts that this government has made to Medicare. Again, if you spend any time out in regional Queensland, as I do, you will know that the waiting list to get to GPs are getting longer and longer because of the policies and decisions of this government and that people are paying more and more to go and see a doctor because this government doesn't support having a free universal health system called Medicare. Now, the, I mean, I'll take the interjection from Senator Stoker, who wants to talk about bulk billing Order. rates. Senator Stoker, day after day, just demonstrates how grossly out of touch she is with the Australian public. It might have actually done her own job a little bit of good to spend a bit more time outside in the city Brisbane and travel around regional Queensland, which at least Senator McGrath has the decency to do. Because if Senator Stoker had done that, not only might she have won her pre-selection, but she might have also realised that many Queenslanders actually don't have the benefit of bulk billing, especially people in rural and in regional Queensland. And that is because of the changes that this government has made. And the, th the problem is that the system is going to become worse. Because on the 1st of July, this government is sneaking in nearly a thousand changes to Medicare in its latest attempt to abolish Medicare, to undercut it, to undermine it, and to make Australians pay more for their health care than they ever had to do before. They're particularly coming after surgeries. And in the time I've got left, I'll just mention one case. Only last week on the Gold Coast, or two weeks ago on the Gold Coast, I met with a family, the Van, the Van Dam family. Uh, uh, Richard and his son, his son Damien and his daughter Jessie Rose. These kids have a rare medical condition which means they have to have surgery on a regular basis. Because of these changes to Medicare on 1 July, they and many other Queenslanders are going to pay more. The Liberals will always try to undermine Medicare. Labor will always stand up for it and we will fight these changes. So Senator McGrath. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And, and to those watching and listening, you and I may not often think about the issue of debit payments, but it's an issue that affects just about every Australian every day. About 70 per cent of the six billion transactions made annually in Australia use debit cards. These are mainly made under a dual network, like your MasterCard or Visa with FPOS. They're tapped you know, when you go to your local supermarket, petrol station, pharmacy. Or having a cheeky rum and coke down at the pig and whistle. And every time a transaction occurs through the magic of technology, the merchant pays. And by merchant, I mean small business and ultimately the customer. And with dual network cards, merchants theoretically can choose to use the lowest cost payments network, which is usually FPOS. And this is called least cost routing. However, less than 10% of all transactions are routed through the lowest cost debit network because more often than not banks are tardy in proactively offering least cost routing to merchants, i.e. small businesses. But using the lowest cost payment network saves hundreds of millions of dollars a year and delivers significant benefits for individual businesses. For example, an independent supermarket can save probably around $26,000 a year. 
a petrol station, twelve and a half grand, and a news agent, three thousand dollars. A significant saving if you're running a small business. And while these benefits do vary, users of least cost routing report cost reductions of around 35 per cent. So it would make sense to set the lowest cost payments network as the default for these dual network debit card transactions. It would make sense to ensure hundreds of thousands of businesses don't face the cost burden of higher transaction fees in-store and online. But many merchants, many small businesses who want to do so are refused by the banks. This is unacceptable. When will the banks wake up and stop ripping off people? Is it time for another Royal Commission or a Senate inquiry? Worse, however, it's now that some banks are withdrawing dual network debit cards and FPOS which eliminates choice and prevents merchants from accessing least cost routing altogether. The first problem is that this will further increase merchants' transaction costs and force some to surcharge their customers. And it will also affect the ability of consumers, i.e. customers, to withdraw cash or have Medicare claims paid on the spot. The second problem is that least cost routing is unavailable if a customer waves their mobile phone or device rather than tapping the actual physical debit card. This is because in Australia these devices are not provisioned to allow least cost routing. They only use the international scheme. So again, merchants, i.e. small businesses, i.e. in the end customers, end up paying. And as these payments become more common, merchants end up paying more and more hitting the customer. The third issue is that the international schemes are putting in place new rules and fees that make it very hard, if not impossible, for businesses to use least cost routing for online, card not present, transactions, like monthly payments for memberships and subscriptions. Again, small businesses have to incur these higher transaction fees, increasing their costs and making it harder to compete against the bigger operators. These issues should come as no surprise. The Reserve Bank, in its draft retail payments review consultation report last month, made clear these concerns. They said, and I quote, a widespread shift towards single network debit cards could threaten the viability of least cost routing, end quote, and that if FPOS cannot compete and potentially has to exit the market, this, and I quote, would result in a significant lessening of competitive pressure in the debit market and would likely result in an increase in both interchange rates and scheme fees impacting all merchants." End of quote. In other words, it's going to cost customers more and it's going to hurt small businesses. So small businesses cannot afford for these issues not to be fixed. And while, Acting Deputy President, I am strongly against red tape and I am strongly against additional regulation for the sake of regulation. I am for small business and I am for the customer. And unless banks are prepared to do this, to set the lowest cost payments network as the default, then I'll be calling upon my government to do something about it. And this could include, firstly, making dual network debit cards mandatory as part of every bank's social obligation to competition in Australia. Secondly, set lease cost routing as a default option for all merchants in all payment channels, including tap and go, mobile wallets and online transactions. And thirdly, there must be full transparency of all merchant fees. So I call upon banks. I call upon the Australian Banking Association to wake up and to help. Banks have huge profits. And if they don't help, then I will be asking the Treasurer, Mr Josh Frydenberg, and my government to support these changes. We in the Liberal National Party must always be on the side of small and medium businesses. And we must always be on the side of the owners and employees of small and medium businesses. And we always must be on the side of customers. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd also like to, to touch upon the issue of nuclear technology and nuclear energy. 
uh, which is back again in the news. And I'm proud to say that I am someone for some time has been pushing the case for a national conversation about the benefits of nuclear energy and nuclear technology for, for Australia. In Australia, we have a third of the world's uranium. We are a geologically stable country. And with the advances in modular power units, I strongly believe that we should be looking at nuclear energy as part of our roadmap to zero emissions. If we want safe, reliable and affordable energy, then it is crazy for us to not have a, a public discussion and a public debate about the advantages of nuclear energy. I, for one, strongly think we should have nuclear energy in Australia. But I also understand that this will be a, a hard conversation to have if those on the left of politics in Australia, who are often the loudest in clamouring for zero emissions, are the same ones who refuse to allow an adult intellectual conversation about the one form of energy which actually does have extremely low emissions. So I would call upon those on the left to let's have this conversation about, about nuclear energy in Australia and let's start with by lifting the ban on nuclear technology. We do have a, a third of the world's uranium. We are geologically stable. We are a stable liberal democracy. It goes against all reason for us to not lift the ban. It goes against all reason for us to not have that conversation and to not have nuclear technology and nuclear energy in Australia. And finally, Acting Deputy President, I'm sure you'd be disappointed that if I didn't uh, mention uh, my good friends at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. And I reiterate my calls for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation for there to be a review into the Governing Act and to the charter of the ABC. The ABC essentially is an analogue model operating in a digital age, and we need to ensure that this, tax fund, this taxpayer funded organisation, over a billion dollars a year, is giving benefit and value to the Australian taxpayers who fund it. And we should shift the staff out of the inner city offices. We should sell off Triple J. We should allow ads to be on the ABC to help fund it. And we should open up the staff recruitment process. The ABC doesn't have a God-given right to exist. It exists because the taxpayers of Australia pay for it. And if the taxpayers of Australia and those in Queensland who are increasingly upset with it want to have value for money, then it's time for the ABC to wake up. Otherwise, McGraw, it is time, time for the NACAS. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I rise to speak on vaccine-related issues. Earlier this week, the Morrison government announced what they described as a complete refresh for, the, for Australia's vaccine rollout. That review was revealed at the hearing of the Senate Select COVID uh, Committee on Monday evening. Health Department Secretary Brendan Murphy uh, and Vaccination Task Force Head Lieutenant General uh, Freewin appeared before the committee. General Freewin is now, uh, and I quote, completely reviewing the rollout strategies and the timeframes in what was described as a complete refresh of the plan. He told the committee this review was uh, separate to the normal refinements and recalibrations carried out as medical advice changed over time. It's understandable that the government should wish to review what is the single biggest and most complex uh, inoculation campaign in the nation's history. However, in this case, a root and branch review is absolutely vital because Australia's COVID-19 vaccination plan has proved to be a shambles. As one leading expert in the field, Professor Bill Botwell of the Kirby Institute for Infection and Immunity recently observed, there has been a, and I quote, great failure in procurement and supply. It has indeed been a great failure. 
One would say it's one of the worst public policy implementation failures in the history of the Commonwealth, a debacle of colossal proportions. The Morrison government told us that we'd be at the front of the queue and that we'd be uh, in the leading pack when it came to vaccines. Instead, we're in the slow lane, lagging way behind many developed countries, including the United States, the UK and Canada. Yesterday, it was announced by the White House that the United States will likely just fall short of meeting President Joe Biden's goal of delivering at least one COVID-19 vaccine shot to 70 per cent of adults by July the 4th. If only we had such a shortfall here. Although the Morrison government has had well over a year to get this right, there has been one shambles after the other. At every turn, there have been crippling problems, ranging from a failure to secure the widest range of vaccine supplies, delays in, uh, in international delivery, local production issues and uh, just the delivery of vaccines uh, within Australia. Despite efforts to broaden vaccine procurement, st we still have seen far too much reliance, reliance on the vaccine AstraZeneca that is now limited to a narrow cohort uh, of, uh, of Australians uh, above 60. And that's uh, had um, its and the government's had its reputation trashed, so much so that many people are reluctant to be immunised uh, with it. The government announced more than a dozen target revisions or updates to the rollout timetable since the beginning of the year. The original long-term target was to fully vaccinate all 20 million adults by October. That plan was later scrapped and all targets were abandoned after medical advice recommended against AstraZeneca for under-50s. However, even before that decision, the government had missed every goal for the vaccination campaign. It fell dash, dras, dras, drastically short of its target for February, delivering more, little more than half the 63,000 doses allocated for the first week of the vaccination campaign. The government fell more than 3.3 million doses short in its target to deliver at least 4 million doses by the end of March, a goal later pushed back to early April and then to mid-April. The last goal before the revised AstraZeneca advice committing, committed to delivering some 2.5 million doses by April 5. Australia has only 1 million doses on April 8. So there's the contrast. Now AstraZeneca is further restricted to those of us who are um, uh, over 60 or uh, those, of course, who have already had a vaccine shot, an AstraZeneca shot, such as myself. Now, in the third week of June, some 6,700,000 uh, 6, doses of COVID vaccine have been delivered across Australia. At our current pace of roughly uh, uh, 712,000 doses a week. It's been estimated that Australia would only uh, reach its 40 million doses needed to fully vaccinate Australia uh, or Australia's adult population in mid-May 2020. Sorry, 2022. Um, hopefully, the government will pick up the pace, but far too much time has been lost. And all the while, Australia remains vulnerable exposed to the new, more infectious variants of, of COVID-19 and subject to frequent restrictions and lockdowns uh, as uh, no quarantine system was ever uh, perfect in the case of uh, such a ferociously, ferociously infectious disease. If there's any doubt about the extent of the government's failure in all of this, even the Australian newspaper has editorialised, and I quote, the government is losing credibility with its management of the vaccine rollout and its repeated claims that everything is on track. Things are pretty bad when the, when the Australian prangs a government failure. But it's very hard to miss this one as the cost to the community, to key industries like tourism and international education is huge. So one can only hope that this latest complete refresh of the vaccination program will deliver some results and see a radical ex uh, acceleration of the vaccine rollout. But all the while, the government's failure has been shrouded in secrecy. 
Indeed, as Professor Bottrell has observed, our culture has, of secrecy has got us to where we are today, he told The Current Affair. Secrecy has been characterised by a government, the government's policy of making, uh, at, uh, at every level, uh, secrecy imposed by our so-called national cabinet, uh, created by the Prime Minister, secrecy imposed uh, upon the Senate COVID-19 Select Committee, with officials pleading confidentiality at every turn, and secrecy imposed in relation to freedom of information. Now, I've actually uh, attempted a, an FOI in relation to uh, the vaccine. I wanted to see why it was that uh, a South Australian company with an uh, impeccable track record in developing vaccines wasn't given an opportunity uh, in relation to grants in, uh, back in February, March last year. I FOI'd for the uh, um, Medical Research Future Fund's awarding of uh, a vaccine uh, grant to the, to the University of Queensland, which of course had ties in with CSL. And what did I get back? A volume of blank paper. 30 or 40 documents completely redacted. And I want to alert the chamber to, to something here. Uh, the MRFF is a $20 billion program, a program that I think everyone in here will support. But let me tell you, uh, no one gets to see who makes applications for the, the um, hundreds and hundreds of grants that this uh, organisation or this program uh, delivers. No one gets to see who makes the decisions on who gets awarded these grants, and no one gets to see uh, the result. At least one would expect, if someone is an award of public funding, that the, the, the assessment in relation to their grant would be made public, as is the case with the exact program in the United States, uh, where I say that uh, uh, NIH, which is their program, will gener generally release the following types of records pursuant to an FOI request funded applications and funded progress reports, including award data, and final reports that have been tr transmitted to the recipient organisation of any audits, surveys, reviews or evaluation or of recipient performance. So in the United States, they name the people that are involved in making decisions. There are protections in place. You can't, as a grant application, ring them and harass them or complain to them, but at least you know who they are. And their applications uh, or, or their, their success, the successful applicant can expect to have their grant proposal scrutinised. And that's exactly as it should be. Right now, we have an organisation, and again, the Chamber needs to be aware of this, that grants up to $20 billion of taxpayers' money in total secrecy. It's like sports rorts on steroids run by a collective of people who uh, make a grant to somebody else, knowing that the next time around a grant will come their way. That is totally unacceptable. It is a corruption incubator, and that has to change. We've got a vaccine uh, rollout that needs to be uh, uh, re-examined and, and totally reorganised, but I alert you to the fact that the MRFF need to uh, adopt a position of transparency uh, on, uh, on, on to this task. Senator M. Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I didn't intend to come into the chamber today and stand up to speak about childcare. But after the disgusting and offensive reports about what went down in the government party room yesterday, how could I not, how could I not come in here? and speak about it. It is being widely reported that in that meeting a bloke or blokes in the Liberal National Party room, in a debate on desperately needed increased funding for childcare, said that parents who are accessing childcare were outsourcing parenting. Well, how disgusting. How disgusting. What a stupid, hurtful, offensive statement smearing every parent out there doing their best and every early educator who turns up to work each day and changes lives. And of course, it's not the first of these kind of statements from those opposite. We've had Senator Rennick, who in May 2019 suggested Labor's childcare plan was a conspiracy, 
saying, and I quote, the cynic in me suggests this is another attempt by Labor to strengthen the role the state has in raising a child at the, extent, at the expense of the parents. Senator Rennick, who in June 2020, in a bizarre reference to the Wizard of Oz, said Dorothy didn't tap her shoes together and say there's no place like childcare, she said there's no place like home. And Senator Canavan, who's made his views on childcare abundantly clear when he questioned whether we should be providing assistance for parents with newborn babies. And now yesterday, the reported comment from a member of the government in their party room saying childcare is outsourced parenting. How vile, how disgusting. Now, I don't know who said what in that meeting yesterday. I'm not a member of their party room, thank God. But it is abundantly clear that these views aren't just old-fashioned, they are medieval. What an offensive and ill-informed smear on the parents of Australia doing their best and those in our community educating our children. I'm standing here to say I could not agree with you more. Disagree with you more. I could not disagree with you more. It's disgusting. It is vile. And to the parents of Australia who have their children in early learning, who have made that decision for their families, I'm standing here to say I stand with you. I stand with you. To the mums who are picking up their stethoscopes to head back to work to the front line of the COVID pandemic. I see you. I see you as you make the decision to have your child in care to the dads working in our distribution centres, starting work often early in the morning before their little ones are up who've got their kids in childcare, going into work to keep our economy moving. I see you. I see you dads as well. To the parents who are teachers returning to the classrooms, to those returning to the office, after having their children, to the factory floor, to drive the bus, to the aged care homes, the fire stations, to return to work on our checkouts. I see you. I see you and I feel your fury, your fury at those opposite who have dared to smear you, who have dared to smear your parenting choices. It's disgusting. And to the early childhood educators in our country who go to work every single day to change lives to change lives, to teach our most precious citizens, my son included, to help them grow, to learn, to develop healthily and happily in a circle of security that they are part of, a circle of security which supports families, which supports families, not competes with them, who have been on the front line of this pandemic, our early childhood workers, our essential workers, who have felt unseen and unvalued by this government. And is it any wonder why, when things like yesterday happen, is it any wonder why? These workers aren't paid a fraction of what they deserve for the life-changing work they are doing. Well, to these workers, I say, I see you, I value you, and I will always, I will always fight for you in here against these disgusting and vile attacks from those opposite. And to the parents working in the home, who have many joyful days, yes, and some really tough ones too. I'm sorry they've drawn you into this, into some nonsense, stupid culture war, which you didn't ask to be a part of, that they've tried to pit you against parents heading back into a different kind of work. I see that you're working, that we're all working, that as parents, we're just trying to do our best. As parents, we are just trying to do our best. And you, you come to this place, people like you, Senator Rennick, you come to this place to smear parents. You come to this place to shame order. parents. Senator, Senator Rennick, on a point of order. Point of order. Uh, you're not supposed to mention other senators in the chamber, number one. And number two, no one was smearing anyone yesterday order in the party order. room, so don't come in here order. and Senator make Rennick, unsubstantiated your seat. Senator Rennick, resume your seat. Order! Order! Seriously, Senator Ayres, if I raise my voice like that, I expect silence. I don't want to have to stand. Firstly, Senator Rennick, I gave you the call that I asked you to cease after I heard your point of order and you started debating the point. There is no rule against mentioning senators in the chamber. Comments, however, should be going 
through and via the chair. Senator Smith, I do believe that was a very unhelpful comment to direct and make a personal accusation against another senator and impugn their motive. I am going to ask you to withdraw that particular imputation. I withdraw it. Thank you, Senator, S senator Smith. Now, we're about to head into question time. I appreciate there are very strong feelings, but that particular interaction across the chamber was not edifying for the Senate. There are places to debate strongly held feelings, and that should be done here, but not through that means. So I ask people to respect my ruling when I ask them to come to order. Thank you, Senator Smith, for, the op for doing that, for the operation of the chamber. I call you to continue. Australian parents deserve so much better, so much better, than the smears that we've seen reported to say that they are outsourcing their parenting. How disgusting. I'm here standing for those parents. I'm here standing for the early educators looking after their children. I'm here standing for every Australian just trying to do their best each day. I see your parenting. I see you love your kids. And I see the early educators who are there helping your family in that circle of security together, side by side Senator with Smith, these families. Um, the time for the debate has expired. Questions without notice. Senator Muriel Smith. Order. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, when asked whether the Morrison government will commit to the Murray-Darling Basin plan in full and on time, Senator Rustin said, and I quote, there are many people who have made many comments, but that doesn't change the commitment of this government to remain absolutely focused on the delivery of the Murray-Darling Basin plan. Given your coalition colleagues have today sought to prevent all water buybacks and block the return of the 450 litres of water to our rivers, can the minister confirm not all members of the coalition share that commitment? Order. Before I call Senator Birmingham, on my right, I have asked repeatedly for silence during questions. There was murmuring across the chamber. I would appreciate that not occur during questions. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, in this place, I speak. Uh, speak uh, representing the Prime Minister, representing the government. Uh, I don't pretend to speak uh, for every single individual and their views, but I make very clear in response to Senator Smith uh, that the government stands resolute in its support for the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, for implementation, as we have said, in full and on time. We are proud as a government to have ensured that billions, billions, thousands of billions of litres of additional water entitlement have been secured to support environmental flows across the Murray-Darling Basin. The securing of those thousands of billions of litres of additional water entitlement is enabling the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder to undertake a range of activities in support of environmental assets across the Murray-Darling Basin, not just in your home state and my home state of South Australia, Senator Smith but right across the Murray-Darling Basin in the support and protection of Ramsar wetlands, of internationally significant environmental assets and of the overall sustainability of the river system. But as has always been the case in relation to the Murray-Darling Basin, it is also crucial that the Basin Plan continues to be implemented in a way that seeks to ensure we not only have a sustainable river, but we have sustainable and productive river communities who rely upon it as well. Uh, and that has been something our government has sought to work hard to achieve over the years in terms of prioritising investment in infrastructure uh, across the river uh, to secure those further water entitlements uh, whilst helping those river communities to become more productive, to become more productive whilst returning water to the river, to maintain that production of food order. and fibre that is essential to river economies whilst having that healthy river system. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. South Australian Liberal Water Minister David Spears has said, and I quote, I have spoken with Minister Pitt today to express my disappointment with this stunt by the National Party. The Marshall government categorically rejects the amendments put forward in the Senate. Does this minister reject the amendments from coalition senators? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, th thanks Mr President. The answer to that is yes, uh, Senator. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it is the case that when those amendments come to a vote, uh, I and the government will be voting uh, against those amendments. Uh, that is the government position, and Mr. President, uh, the Order. government does so. 
Order the government does so. Order, Senator Clear Watt. in our position, Senator as Wong. I said in the primary question, Senator Smith, Order, that Senator we Birmingham, support the Murray Darling Basin Senator Birmingham, plan. please resume your seat again. Senator Watt, when I call senators by name, I expect them to heed it. I was calling senators on my left who were busy interjecting, Senator Wong. I expect them to heed it for at least a period. I don't want to have to shout to get the names through the wall of noise. Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, Mr President. Was it, was, it, was the coalition government, was the Howard government that passed the Water Act in 2007? I am pleased that throughout the time, my time in this place, indeed, around the time of the passage of the Water Act, it was one of the first bills that, uh, that I contributed to in this building, that we have maintained a bipartisan position in relation to support for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Order. It's my intention Order. that that is preserved and that is continued. Uh, and that is why the government will continue to support the Basin Plan. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Given the Nationals' demonstrated disdain for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, will the Prime Minister ensure the Nationals do not retain the water portfolio or control of the Morrison government's water policy? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, it's not for me to speculate in relation to ministerial arrangements. But I make clear, as I have, that the government's position in terms of support for the implementation of arrangements under the Water Act, including the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, remains. The government is determined to continue to support basin communities in the way in which that plan is implemented, and to be mindful of the fact that there have been and are genuine concerns from people whose livelihoods and communities depend upon the basin, and that we ought to be sympathetic and mindful of those concerns whilst ensuring implementation of a plan that guarantees all communities that rely upon the river system have a healthy and sustainable river system to support them, to support their communities, to support the productive growth of food and fibre uh, that our economies depend upon, particularly across those river communities, but to support also the healthy, uh, sustainable system into the future. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's technology not taxes approach to emissions reduction is helping Australia not only meet but exceed our international obligations while standing up for Australia and supporting our economy without costing Australian jobs, costing the Australian industry and threatening Australia's energy security? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Thank you very much, Senator Small. And yes, I can. The Morrison government is taking practical action to reduce emissions through technology, not taxes. And our plan is working. I know Labor and the Greens don't like to hear these facts, uh, but emissions are now at the lowest levels since records began in 1990, more than 20 per cent below 2005 levels, and we are reducing them at about double the rate of, our, of, of the average across the OECD and will absolutely meet and beat our 2030 Paris target. And to keep this momentum going, we will invest $20 billion in new energy technologies by 2030, unlocking some $80 billion of public and private investment over the decade. Now, our technology investment roadmap is about supporting a portfolio of technologies so we can reduce emissions across every sector of the economy, so we can create at least 160,000 jobs by 2030, so we can deliver the cheap and reliable energy Australians deserve, and so we can keep the lights on without sending jobs offshore, and so we can secure Australia's future. But just last night in, the, in this place, we saw firsthand the very real danger uh, that those opposite, Labor and the Greens, if they were ever back on the government benches, would provide. They voted against $192 million of investment in lower Order. emissions technology, significant reforms that would have seen even lower emissions and created thousands of new jobs. Even the member for Hunter described Labor's decision last night as ideological craziness. In fact, he has said that, sadly, the hard left, the excessive progressives, as I call them, are just on an ideological bent. Order. Now, Senator McAllister, we know you fit very much in that camp. The excessive progressives are in charge. It's all about dogma and ideology rather than the policies that work, bringing down emissions, growing jobs and securing our future. Order. 
Order. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline why this technology, not taxes, approach is important to supporting jobs in my home state of Western Australia, but is particularly important in reducing emissions in intensive industries like manufacturing, agriculture, transport and resources? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. And Senator Small is right. These sectors keep the Western Australian economy moving, and critical to supporting jobs in these sectors is supporting the technology that allows them to offset, offset or abate their emissions. Now, our changes to ARENA's mandate would have provided $192.5 million in new funding to back technologies like healthy soils, carbon capture and storage, and reduced emissions for aluminium and steel, energy efficiency and clean hydrogen. Now, one in ten West Australian jobs are in the mining industry. So this makes the development of carbon capture and storage technology vital for WA. Yet those opposite voted against it. Now I know that each way Elbo is heading to WA. He is heading to WA next week to hold a sh shadow cabinet meeting. This will be the test for him. Will he be honest with the people of WA and the Pilbara and outline his plan to tax his way to net zero emissions and the impacts of that on the WA and Australian economies? Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. And in light of the minister's answer about how effective our technology, not taxes, approach has been, uh, is the minister aware of any risks to our economy and Australian jobs whilst we set about lowering emissions? Order, Senator Seselja. Well, thank you. Um, well, we saw last night, didn't we, some of those risks? All those Labor senators, all those Labor senators, Order. voting with their Greens coalition partners to block a technology-led approach to reducing emissions. Senator Watt. They voted against their own policy platform. Senator Thorpe. They voted to rip 192 million dollars of new funding for arena programs that would create 1,400 jobs. When it comes to reducing emissions, if it's not technology, it has to be taxes, and they've shown which side they're on. You know, they've stolen. Jeremy Corbyn's uh, slogan, uh, and they've stolen some of his high taxing policies. So taxes are in Labor's DNA. They are absolutely reckless. They've abandoned the 2.2 million Australians working Order. in energy intensive industries. They've sent a clear message to Western Australian families and families around Australia. Labor will always put politics above people and ideology over jobs. Order. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I refer to an article in the Australian Financial Review entitled Just 30 per cent of aged care staff vaccinated against COVID-19. The article goes on to state that this refers to at least a single dose. More than four months after the vaccine rollout started, how many aged care workers have been fully vaccinated with both shots against COVID-19. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and uh, the article in the Financial Review is a little out of date, Mr President. Uh, there are 33 per cent, or 85,272 uh, residential aged care staff who have received a first dose of a vaccination. Uh, according to the latest data that I have, Mr. President, and of those 85,272, 40,354, or 15.6 per cent, have received a second dose of their vaccination, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, um, uh, we continue to work cooperatively with the states and territories on the rollout of the vaccine, as uh, I've explained to the chamber before, and as the opposition. Uh, aren't honest enough to acknowledge the, the, we've Order. had to reset the rollout of the vaccine uh, to aged care workers on a couple of occasions based on health advice. Uh, yes, it was our initial intention, Mr. President, to vaccinate aged care workers alongside aged care residents, but we received health advice that that was not safe to do so. So we didn't. We heeded that health advice, Mr. President. Uh, so, so, so we, we then received advice, Mr. President, uh, that uh, with respect to the AstraZeneca vaccine, and we made some changes to the way the rollout was uh, occurring in in that context, Mr. President. So, we've opened up a number of channels to provide access for aged care workforce to uh, receive a vaccination. They can go to their GP, Mr. President. They can go to a Commonwealth vaccination clinic. They can 
uh, be su supported through uh, their provider. And quite a number of providers are actually providing their own vaccination services in-house as a part of a uh, request for tender that remains open for Order. aged care providers to operate. Mr. President. Order. Uh, they can go to a state vaccination clinic and have priority for that vaccination process. So we continue to work Order, uh, cooperatively Corbett. to ensure Time aged care workers have access to vaccines. Expired. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. More than four months after the vaccine rollout started, how many home care workers have been fully vaccinated with both shots against COVID-19? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, at this point in time, Mr. President, based on the data that I have, 18.3% uh, of uh, home care workers have received a vaccine, and of that 18%, 4.3% uh, of them uh, have had a uh, second dose, Mr. President. These are very early numbers because those numbers are being reported to us um, at this point in time voluntary, voluntarily, voluntarily uh, by home care providers. Uh, that process will be made. Uh, uh, compulsory uh, in coming weeks, Mr. President. Uh, so we continue to provide access to all of those who are providing support to senior Australians through the pr various processes that I mentioned to you in my answer to the previous question. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. The government's own aged care workforce task force re recommended in 2018 that a national registration system be implemented to track aged care staff working across multiple facilities. Can the minister confirm that this has still not been implemented, despite around 70 per cent of aged care workers remaining completely unprotected against COVID-19 and last year's COVID-19 outbreak in Victoria being sparked by aged care workers working Order. across Senator multiple Walsh. facilities? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, as a part of our response to the uh, Royal Commission report on aged care quality and safety, the government has announced a workforce registration program across all of the aged care system, uh, as a part of the uh, as as a part of the uh, reforms that we announced in the budget, Mr. President. So uh, we have acknowledged that that's required, uh, and we are working to ensure that that actually is the case. It is an important thing for us to understand, Mr President. Uh, we've, we've order. Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Yes, point of order, direct relevance. We didn't ask about the announcement. We asked about the implementation. Um, you've reminded the minister of that part of the question. There was other parts after it, but it did all refer to that particular program. I, I don't believe I can rule a minister not being directly relevant when he's talking about the actual program. That goes to the content of the answer, which can be debated after question time. Senator Colbeck, to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we've we've uh, conducted a number of uh, processes and consultations with the aged care sector to uh, ensure that we have a system in place that uh, is effective and and has the attributes that we want, Mr. President. The Royal Commission made a recommendation with respect to uh, a certain form of registration process. Uh, we didn't accept that recommendation. We're going to utilise a system that currently exists so that we can get it up. Uh, and operational as quickly Order, as possible. Senator Colbeck. Senator Davey. Very much, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Can the Minister please outline what the Liberal and Nationals in government are doing to support more women into leadership positions and further close the gender pay gap that Labor is always worried about? including through initiatives in the women's budget statement. Order. Order. I will call the minister when there's silence. The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey uh, for her question. The improvement of women's economic security and supporting more women into leadership positions is a key priority for the Morrison government. The 2021-22 Women's Budget Statement includes a $38.3 million expansion, for example, of the successful Women's Leadership and Development Program, funding innovative projects across Australia that support women into leadership roles, including, as I know Senator Davey recognises, the importance of uh, in regional Australia. Mr President, in the Morrison-Joyce Cabinet, seven women hold Cabinet positions, the highest number Order. ever, Mr President. 
uh, including three of my colleagues here in the Senate uh, sitting with me today. Four additional positions in the ministry or the assistant ministry are also held by women. Those cabinet and ministry members are all members of the Cabinet Task Force on Women's Safety and Economic Security. We're also supporting women's leadership in the public sector, including with a 50 per cent target for women on Australian government board positions, and we are on track to meet those commitments. Our women's budget statement also includes a $17 million investment to support world-class sporting events and development programs for women and girls in both football and basketball. We know that sport can be greatly beneficial to women's leadership, for players, for administrators, for coaches and for volunteers. We warmly welcome the FIFA Women's World Cup coming to Australia and New Zealand in 2023. Order. Nepal World Cup. Across Order. Australia, I note, importantly, that the gender pay gap is at a record low level of 13.4 per cent, and we are committed to driving that even lower, Mr President. I particularly want to welcome the leadership of the Director Order of the Workplace Gender left. Equality Agency, Mary Woolridge. She will play a key role uh, in that work in the coming months and years, and she is highly regarded uh, for her contribution in this area. Order. Senator Payne, time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline the support that is provided through the Women's Leadership and Development Program that you just mentioned. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. Across Australia, over 60 organisations will receive support under the Women's Leadership and Development Program to deliver projects that improve women's leadership and development across five key areas job creation, economic security, workforce participation, leadership, and safety. The program funds projects including Women Building Australia run by the Master Builders Australia to support more women into building and construction. Then there's Titters in Business in Mango Hill in the Moreton Bay region, which supports Aboriginal women in urban, regional, rural and remote locations in starting their own businesses. The Tasmanian-based Brave Foundation, which builds support and acceptance around expecting and parenting teens as they seek employment. Mr President, I reviewed the, uh, the, the, the electorates across Australia in which uh, the WLDP program uh, is supporting, uh, supporting organisations like those I've already mentioned. It doesn't matter whether it's Bendigo or Durack, whether it's Order. Grey or Senator the Yari, right across Australia, we're supporting women's leadership. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please explain what our government is doing to promote women leaders? through Australian government board positions and other key appointments. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, because Senator Davies' question is a very important and timely one. We know that gender diversity on boards, for example, contributes to more effective and innovative decision-making and outcomes. Uh, in December of 2020, women held a record 49.5 per cent of Australian government board positions. We have strategies uh, in place to meet the target of 50 per cent, and I'm personally committed to continuing to increase gender diversity and to reach that target. As a coalition government, we've appointed a number of women to senior leadership positions, including the outgoing secretary of my own department, Frances Adamson. Secretary Adamson has done a, an exceptional job as the secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I want to acknowledge her leadership, her own commitment to diversity, uh, what she has brought to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the change that she has overseen in the department over the 36 years of her role in DFAT is exceptional. I, attended her speech at the National Press Club today with Senator Birmingham, Senator Selger and Senator Wong to acknowledge that leadership. Order. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. While the Liberal and National parties are squabbling over net zero by 2050, global leaders are focused on the main game of re reducing pollution by 2030. This is the critical decade. If the Nationals agree to the Prime Minister's preference for net zero by 2050, won't that just confirm that delay is the new denial? The Leader of the Government, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Um, well, I, I am slightly flabbergasted by, uh, by that question that seems to insinuate that the Greens, who I thought argued very strongly and passionately for commitments uh, to net zero by 2050, uh, now seem to be deviating from that position. Now seem to be saying they have an alternate position. 
Now, indeed, the Prime Minister has said he wants to see net zero achieved as soon as is possible. So, in that sense, Senator Waters, if, uh, if you're saying would before 2050 be preferable, well, indeed, if it's possible, if it's possible to be achieved in a world in which we get that delivered through the type of technology, not taxes, approach uh, that our government is outlining, through the type of cooperation around the world that we are seeking to strive and achieve in relation to investment in those technologies that are necessary to reduce emissions. But in terms of the short term, Australia can hold its head high as being a nation who hasn't just made commitments in relation to emissions reductions, but has met those commitments and exceeded those commitments. And often we have done so in terms of meeting and exceeding those commitments in a way far clearer, far, far stronger than some of those countries that the Greens or others cite. Now, Australia is a country that beat its Kyoto era targets by 459 million tonnes. Our emissions are down by over 20 per cent in the period from 2005 to the end of last year. 20 per cent down for Australia's emissions, and that compares with 6.6 per cent across the OECD average. That's a track record that shows Australia has been making change and we've been able to do it and achieve it in a, as a country while still growing our economy through seeing growth and investment in technologies. That's precisely what our government is committed to continuing to pursue. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The coalition repealed the price on pollution before it was set to link to the European Union. Had you not done so, Australian farmers today could be earning $80 a tonne by storing carbon in the land. The coalition has already lost Australian farmers $1.4 billion of new export income and will cost another $11 Order. billion before the end of the Order. decade. Why are you and your coalition partners acting against the interests and profits of Australian farmers? I remind senators again that I need silence during questions, and there were interjections from both sides of the chamber during Senator Waters' question then. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Well, indeed, this side of politics well and truly stands up for Australian farmers. We have made sure that we invest in the type of soil carbon capture in soil technologies that can help Australian farmers, can help to achieve reduction in emissions, but in achieving that reduction in emissions, do it in a way without applying taxes that could hit Australian farmers, Australian businesses, Australian industry and Australian households. What's obvious in Senator Waters' question just then is that the Australian Greens want to see a tax come back. The Australian Greens want to see a tax come back. And what was obvious from the voting record of the Greens last night is that they oppose investment in soil carbon. Apparently they oppose investment in hydrogen technologies as well. Mr President, I find this Order. astounding that the Australian Greens, having come into this chamber yesterday, along with the Labor Party, to vote against more investment in hydrogen technology, more investment in soil carbon, now come in here Order. and are asking Senator instead Birmingham, for us to go to a tax route. The answer has expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. With Japan, our biggest customer of coal and gas, lifting their 2030 ambition to 46 per cent, and South Korea, our third biggest customer, lifting theirs to 40 per cent yesterday, are you really going to give the climate-denying National Party the trade portfolio? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, Australia's 2030 targets will see our emissions per unit of GDP fall by some 70 per cent. Achieving our 2030 target will see emissions per capita fall by almost 50 per cent. That's the type of scale of activity that Australia is committed to and is taking and, based on our track record, will meet and exceed yet again. But under a coalition government, we'll meet and exceed it by investing in technology that helps farmers, like soil carbon, by investing in technology that helps energy regions of Australia, those whose jobs depend upon energy sectors, through investment in areas like hydrogen. And the actions taken by those opposite last night, so roundly criticised by Mr Fitzgibbon, as Senator Sajilja outlined before, the actions taken by those opposite don't help to get regions to transform to a hydrogen economy. They don't help farmers to transform in terms of use of soil carbon. All you've done is stand as a roadblock to the type of action you say should be occurring, and Order. you should all be ashamed Senator of the vote you cast. Senator McGrath. Hey. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Hey. 
The Beetaloo Basin has potentially enough gas to supply Australia's needs for decades, offering the chance to grow a vibrant manufacturing industry in northern Australia while lowering carbon emissions. Can the minister inform the Senate what the Liberal Nationals government is doing to unlock the Beetaloo Basin's gas reserves to support our economic recovery while lowering emissions? The minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator McGrath, um, but particularly for his interest in the benefits that can be generated for Northern Australia by the extraction of the amazing resources that exist in the northern part of our country. Um, and, and like uh, that, one of the very, very important projects is the, uh, the development, the gas development in, in the the $224 million Beetaloo Strategic Plan. The plan will help to deliver on Australia's long-term gas supply Order. and dramatically improve our energy security. The Beetaloo Subbasin is one of the largest undeveloped resources of onshore gas anywhere in the world. Um, it's estimated that there's over 200,000 petajoules of shale gas in the sub-basin. If you want to put that into some sort of context, that is, uh, would amount to only 15 per cent of that amount would actually supply Eastern Australia their entire market for in excess of 15 years. So the sub-basin holds extraordinary potential for Australia uh, because of the quantities of oil it has in reserve. And under this particular program, we will be able to accelerate Order. a number of projects and to deliver approximately 10 exploration wells in the sub-basin in the next 12 months. The plan will bring in addition $150 million of additional private investment. Um, this plan is a plan to support Northern Australia, and it also enables us to deliver things like um, strategic road corridors, which will not only support 400 jobs but also uh, support the northern part of Australia. But we're also making sure that we deliver benefits for Indigenous owners and making sure that there are Indigenous jobs, Indigenous business and Indigenous opportunities. Gas is essential for our manufacturing sector, just as it is essential for our homes and to fire up our barbecues and for lowering emissions. And that's exactly what the Beetaloo Basin can do Order. for our nation. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Order at the rear of the chamber, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Rice. Senator McGrath. Can the minister outline more broadly how the development of gas is not only essential to supporting exports and domestic manufacturing, but also lowering emissions? Order. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, Australia's resource and energy sectors not only are leading when it comes uh, to developing new technologies, but we are also leaders in making sure that we adopt cleaner production processes. So this includes Australia's gas industry, which is well paced also to meet the demand, the growing demand in our Asia Pacific region. So the government is absolutely committed to supporting innovative producers by embracing technologies such as carbon capture, use and storage to deliver on our emissions reduction targets, which we are absolutely committed to. Um, and we will continue not only to have a responsible approach but a pragmatic approach. Exactly. We are absolutely committed to, to technology and innovation being the backbone of the delivery of our energy future, and we are not going to tax the Australian economy out of existence on some ideological pretext. This government is absolutely committed to investing in things such as the carbon capture use Order. and storage Senator projects. Senator Rustin, time for the answer has expired. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate on how a technology not taxes approach, including adopting nuclear technology as mentioned in the government's technology investment roadmap, could assist in lowering Australia's carbon emissions while growing our economy? Order. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, our technology investment roadmap. Um, is absolutely designed to make sure that technology is the absolute core of everything we do going forward. So making sure that we, uh, we watch for technologies, international developments, to make sure that Australian households, Australian businesses, all Australians are able to exercise the choice so that they can avail themselves of latest technologies where it makes sense to do so. And it's only sensible to evaluate 
and deploy any technology that can bring down emissions but at the same time deliver affordable, reliable and dispatchable energy for all Australians. This is because, as I said, we are committed to a technology delivery into the future. We are not going to tax our way uh, to, a, uh, to a clean energy future. We are going to innovate our way there. And that is why we oppose those opposite in their attempts to try and destroy our technology facilitated Order. energy future. Order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Attorney General and concerns the government's failure to deliver on its 2019 election promise to legislate a National Integrity Commission. What is the Attorney's response to the open letter to the government from 59 eminent Australian jurists, including Mary Cauldron QC, former High Justice of the High Court, Tony Fitzgerald QC, former Federal Court Judge and head of the Fitzgerald Inquiry, no less than 13 former State Supreme Court uh, ju justice, uh, court and, uh, and uh, appeal court justices, and others, including Nicholas Cowdery QC, former New South Wales uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, and Geoffrey Watson SC, former counsel assisting in the New South Wales ICAC, saying, and I quote, "Enough is enough. The establishment of a national integrity commission with teeth is long overdue." The government has kept the Australian public waiting for 922 days and has found time to tackle a great number of uh, the government's self-described priorities outside the coronavirus response, but has yet to find time uh, for this one. Order, Senator Patrick. Order. I'll call the minister when there's silence. The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for your question. And, uh, Mr President, in the first instance, what I would say to Senator Patrick Order. is that I disagree with the premise of your question. Uh, the Morrison government is delivering on our commitment to establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Uh, Mr President, the government has already put in place Order. the funding required for when the Commonwealth Integrity Commission legislation is passed. Uh, Senator Patrick, you would be aware that in the 2019-20 budget, the government committed $106.7 million of new money to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. This was in addition to the $40.7 million Order. in funding for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, which will transfer to the Commission, and that is a total of $147.4 million. The government has already implemented phase one of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission by expanding the jurisdiction of the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity to cover four additional agencies, those agencies being the Australian Taxation Office, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority and the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. Uh, you may also be aware that in the interim, the government has also allocated $54.4 million to support this year the expanded jurisdiction, which means that the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity staffing levels will increase from 64 to 110 ASL in the 2021-2022 financial year to support its expanded work. The Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, including resources and staffing, will be assumed by the Commonwealth Integrity Commission uh, once it commences. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, Madam Attorney, there are just seven sitting weeks of the Senate's rema remaining this year. That's uh, 28 sitting days. That's probably only nine gag motions from uh, Senator uh, Birmingham. Will Will the Attorney General uh, commit to introduce the Government's Integrity Commission Bill on the first day of sitting on 3 August for this important matter that, uh, that, that, such that it can be subject to uh, debate? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, Senator Patrick, a nationwide consultation process on the legislation to establish the Commission has recently been completed. Uh, there were approximately 333 written submissions received and 46 Order. consultations, meetings and roundtables that occurred during the consultation period. Uh, the government will carefully consider the feedback 
received through this extensive Order. consultation process to inform further refinement of the draft legislation before it is introduced into the parliament. Uh, but I would note that it is important, uh, not only due to the scale of the reform, uh, but so that Australians can have confidence that the Commission will operate effectively. Uh, the purpose of the body, Senator Patrick, uh, is extremely serious, and as such, the government does need to consider uh, the feedback Order. that has Senator been provided Cash. to Time it the through answer the consultation has expired. Process. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Ernie, isn't it the case that the government has delayed a federal ICAC for so long to ensure that the Commission will not be operational before the next federal election? Hasn't that been the government's plan all along? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you. And no, Senator Patrick, I completely reject uh, what you've stated in your question. I've already taken you through how the Morrison government is already delivering on its commitment to establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. I have advised you that a nationwide consultation process uh, has just finalised. Uh, it had received over 333 written submissions. Uh, there were 46 consultations, meetings and roundtables that occurred during uh, the consultation period. Uh, I think you would agree, Senator Patrick, that this uh, significant legislation is a piece of legislation that we have to get right. Uh, it is important not only due to the scale of the reform, uh, but so that Australians can have confidence uh, that the Commission will operate effectively. And as I've said to you, uh, the government will consider carefully the feedback received through this extensive consultation process to inform further refinement of the draft legislation uh, before it's introduced into the parliament. Senator Gallagher. To the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. On Monday, the minister promised to provide the Senate with the government's document outlining how many vaccine doses will be provided across Australia month by month until the end of 2021, saying, and I quote, I am happy to provide that information to the chamber. I will come back to the chamber as soon as possible with that information. Why has the minister failed to provide the document to the Senate in line with his commitment and in direct contravention of yesterday's OPD, unanimously supported by the Senate, including by the government? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it, it's actually not correct to say that I've refused to provide the data, Mr. President, because my letter Order. to the Senate uh, yesterday says the final, da final data will be released once finalised by the Coordinator General over coming days. So, Mr. President, there is a commitment from me and from the government to release the data. This data is the state's data. It's it's be, it's being managed. It, it is well, Mr. Mr. President. Um, as I said in my letter yesterday, the Coordinator General of the Vaccine Rollout, Lieutenant General JJ Fruin, is currently consulting with states and territories on the um, on the vaccine horizon information, including each jurisdiction's breakdown of allocated vaccines across horizon allocation periods to the end of 2021, Mr. President. And, Mr. President, my advice is that that information has been published uh, now on the um, uh, Inspector General's website, and I'll provide it to the Chamber at the end of question time. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Lieutenant General Fruin told the, the COVID-19 Select Committee on Monday with respect to the vaccine information, I quote, I've also provided these documents directly to the states and territories. Given the Commonwealth provided its document to First Ministers, why has the minister claimed in his inadequate response to the Senate's OPD, quote, will be released once finalised, when the document requested by the Senate has already been handed over to the states? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, the evidence given on it to the committee on Monday night talked, uh, uh, talked about the consultation with the states with respect to the release of the data. My letter to the Senate indicates that that process is being undertaken, has been undertaken. Uh, the data is now available. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary, final supplementary question. The Morrison government has broken its promise that all Australians would be fully vaccinated by October, 4 million would be vaccinated by the end of March, all of 1A would be vaccinated by Easter, 
and 6 million Australians would be vaccinated by 10 May. Is the government trying to keep this information secret, and will the government commit to the same information that was provided to National Cabinet on Monday being made publicly Order. available through Senator the Senate? Gallagher. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as, as I've indicated to the Senate, the data is now available. Uh, I will bring the documentation to the chamber presented at the end of Order. question time, Mr. President. Uh, uh, the information uh, is information that's been consulted on with the states to provide an indication of, it, of, the, of the vaccine availability out to the end of 2021. It is important information for the, uh, for the Australian people to understand, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, had Mr. President uh, Senator Gallagher listened to my previous answers. She would have understand, understood that the information is now available. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for South Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, <laughs> Senator Colbeck. How is the Morrison government ensuring more older Australians receive the support they need in aged care? Order. Order. I'll call the minister when there's silence. The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator McLaughlin for his question. Mr President, the Australian government is investing $272 million to support senior Australians to access the aged care services that they need. We will deliver uh, an investment in all services Australia centres around the country to provide general information per, in person face-to-face -face about aged care services available to them and assist people to use My Aged Care Online channels from the October 31. New, the new face-to-face -face aged care specialists will be available in 70 service Australia centres in all states and territories and include mobile service centres to reach rural and regional areas. This service will help people with the end-to-end -end process of accessing aged care services, including Financial, financial information support. We will also be linking up Services Australia and My Aged Care call centres so callers can easily be transferred between the two services. These simple but important measures are designed to make it easier for senior Australians to access the information they need to be in control and make their own choices as they age. Mr. President. We are investing $93 million to induce introduce a network of up to 500 local community care finders to improve engagement with vulnerable senior Australians, including people who are homeless. There will be $65 million to provide greater access to translating and interpreting services for culturally and linguistically diverse Australians. We have allocated $7 million to assist advocacy organisations provide better service and this government, Mr. President, remains committed to providing senior Australians with the care they need and deserve as they grow older. Thank you. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise what other measures the government is implementing to support independent advocacy and greater choice for senior Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government's investment in aged care includes $94 million for expanded independent advocacy. This funding will more than double the aged care advocacy workforce to more than 150 advocates nationally, delivering around 15,000 more information and advocacy cases each year. This will improve access to face-to-face -to -face and virtual aged care advocacy for senior Australians in outer metropolitan, rural, regional and remote areas of Australia, as well as for home care recipients and culturally and linguistically diverse Australians. This investment will add also more than 1,000 local network and education sessions to build the capacity of older people, their families and representatives to exercise greater choice and control. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister outline the government's commitment to older Australians with our $17.7 billion record investment in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Australian gov government is delivering a once-in-a-generation 
change through our aged care reform package, the largest ever investment in aged care and the largest ever response to a Royal Commission. The government listened to the experiences of Australians who gave evidence to the Royal Commission and is taking decisive action to implement the recommendations with reforms to deliver vital services, improve quality care and viability in aged care. Mr. President. New home, package, home care packages have increased from 60,308 under Labor in 2012-13 to grow to more than 275,000 in 2024-25, an increase of 357 per cent. Residential aged care funding is $15 billion, up from $9.2 billion in 2013. Mr. President, every year under a coalition government, home care packages are up, residential care places are up, Order. and aged care Senator funding Colbeck. is up. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. I refer to reports that in yesterday's joint party room, chaired by newly re-elevated re Deputy Prime Minister Joyce, that coalition senators Canavan and Rennick and MPs Mr Christensen and Mr Young spoke in opposition to the government's own childcare policy oh, dear. With, uh, proposal, with Senator Canavan making clear he would vote against this legislation. Oh, How many coalition members oppose the government's childcare policy? The Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I sincerely thank Senator Urquhart for that question. Allow me the opportunity to talk about our policy on childcare, because of course I am never, and I would never comment order. about Senator, deliberations Senator, within Senator Reynolds, the party please. room. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The minister's refusal to be directly relevant is apparent in that first response. Uh, uh, thank you. Oh, order. Would you like her to speak, order. or do Senator, you want to Senator give? Senator Selger, please. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sisselger. Wong, please. Your point of order. Uh, the question went to. Oh, would, you like, would you like to finish? And... Yeah, you order. go right ahead. Senator, if we could stop. If, if, interjections, order. Interjections don't need to be made, and interjections don't need to be responded to. Order on my left and my right. Inter Senator Sisselja, please. Senator Seselja, Senator Wong, points of order are to raise points of order. Interjections should not be made. They should not be responded to. Senator Wong. Direct relevance. The question went to how many coalition members oppose the government's childcare policy. Um, Senator, Senator Birmingham, on the point of order. Mr. President, on the point of order, and you can tell there's a camera in the chamber today. Um, now, uh, now, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, this question from Senator Urquhart clearly went to matters that included the content of the government's childcare policy, and Senator Reynolds is entirely within orders to be responding in ways that address the content and the approach of those policies that Senator Urquhart was asking about. Okay, so, if I could rule on the point of order. Um, Senator Wong, you reminded the minister of the conclusion of the question. The earlier the, order, the earlier part of the question um, asked the minister uh, about reports regarding a party room discussion um, that, in my view, did go to the content of policy. I'm not in a position to ever rule whether a minister is being directly relevant in eight seconds, in my view. Um, so I'll call the minister to continue. But to be directly relevant, in my view, the minister can go to the content of policy that um, may or may not or was reported to have been discussed in a coalition party room meeting, or to the second part of the question which you mentioned. It was quite broad in that sense. Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And as I say, I, I will certainly not be talking about the confidential uh, deliberations of our party room, but I'm delighted to talk about the outcomes of that party room and the legislation that we bring into this chamber. So Order. Let, me, let me share with you some of the things we've been doing since in government. We're spending 77 per cent more than Labor did in government on childcare, a record $10.3 billion this year, including $9 billion to subsidise the fees set by childcare services. And today, over 280,000 Australian children are in childcare today. And wonderfully, 
women's workforce participation has reached a record high of 61.8 per cent in March of this year, up from 58.7 per cent. We overhauled the childcare system in 2018 to introduce one subsidy. The hourly fee cap we introduced is working to keep downward pressure on fees, with 87.5 per cent of services charging under that hourly cap rate in centre-based daycare. But we know on this side of the chamber what really matters to parents, and that is their out-of-pocket costs. Order. We have kept Order. our out-of-pocket costs low. Order on Still my left. I'm having trouble hour, hearing the minister. One dollar an hour cheaper on average than before we introduced the package in 2018. Down from $4.87 to $3.93 per hour. Order. And in this budget, we are providing an additional $1.7 billion to further help Australian families with more than one child five and under in those years where we know Order. they are Senator the toughest Reynolds, for working families for the answers. to Answer look has after expired. their children. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. It is reported that one male MP angered some female members by suggesting working women who use childcare were outsourcing parenting. How many male coalition members think women are outsourcing parenting? Order, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator Urquhart for another opportunity to talk about the wonderful record this government has and how we understand the aspirations and the order, desire for order, Australian Senator parents. Senator Reynolds, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr. President, direct relevance. I mean, the minister's clumsiness is demonstrating what she's doing. She's saying, "I'm not even going to. I'm going to ignore that question. It gives me an opportunity to talk about our policy." Oh, uh. I, I make the point again that unlike. Unlike the other place, I don't call ministers to order in my, from the chair. Myself, I wait for a point of order to be raised. This question was about uh, reports about a claimed statement and then asked, if I can read my own handwriting, how many, I believe, male members of the coalition uh, supported that statement. It's, it, it was the use of a reported phrase that is pejorative in nature. I'm going to give the minister some latitude. However, I will say I do not think this is as broad as the previous question and allow the opportunity to provide an explanation of policy that was prevented to the, presented or reported to be presented to the party room. So I call the minister to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, I reiterate my thanks to Senator Urquhart for this question, something which is at the heart of passion uh, of it both parties and the coalition. And again, as we saw demonstrated in the party room yesterday, we did have a robust debate on an important policy issue to Australian families. And that is what Australians expect. And that is what marks the Order. difference between this side and that side of the chamber. Now, let me tell you what we did uh, discuss in relation to the legislation that is coming before the parliament. This is to provide an additional $1.7 billion to further help Australian families with more than one child five and under, in the years that are the toughest for parents, for both parents to stay in the workforce. So what we did discuss is by increasing the subsidy for families with a second Order, or third Senator child Reynolds, five and time under. time for the answer has Mr. expired. President. Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. It's reported that Senator Hughes responded to the revolt by saying that, and I quote, thank you boys for telling us how to best raise our children. Not all of us want to Order. sit at home with our three-month-old watching Bluey. Why are coalition members criticising women who work and trying to tell women how to raise their children? Order. Order. Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. And can I say, I think we all love Bluey on this side of the chamber, a great Aussie classic. Order. Um, and I, again, I congratulate Senator Hughes. Uh, and everybody else who participates in the debate on this side, because we discuss the issues that count to Australian families. Order. And as I started to say, Order. by increasing the subsidy for families, uh, 250,000 Australian families will be better off, on average, by $2,260 per year. And that is exactly what we discussed in the party room yesterday. We also discussed the issue where, under this plan, a family on $110,000 
with two children in full-time care will be $120 better off per week. And that, Mr President, is what this side of politics is all about. It is providing choice and control of Australian Order. families and for women to stay connected with the workforce. Order on my left. Here, here. Order on my left. Order. Senator Reddick. Oh, okay. Right up. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. And, and can I add, I did stay home and raise my children for four years, and they were the happiest Order. days of my life as a stay-at-home parent. Okay, my question. Order. My, my question is for the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison's government economic plan is delivering new jobs across Australia? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Rennick for what is a fantastic question to take us home on this Wednesday at Question Time. And in the first instance, I, can I actually acknowledge uh, Mayor David Good from the city of Gosnells in our home state of Western Australia for the Western Australian Senators. He is someone self-employed his entire life and someone who absolutely believes in the value of good economic policy. So great to see you here today, Mayor David Good. And Mr President, the Morrison government's economic policies uh, they are seeing our economy rebound from what was a devastating 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, just last month in May, what we saw because of the economic policies that we're putting in place was the unemployment level in Australia fall now to 5.1 per cent. And again, that exceeded all market expectations. Mr President, this doesn't happen by accident. This happens because the businesses out there, the small businesses, the medium businesses, the large businesses, they are able to lever off the policies that the Morrison government puts in place to prosper, to grow and to create more jobs for Australians. And that is what we are now seeing. We now have around 130,000 more Australians in work than we did prior to when COVID-19 hit Australia. That is again showing that the Morrison government's economic policy is working. We also know that the recovery plan that we're putting in place it is putting confidence uh, into Australians. We're putting up their hands and saying, I'm ready, willing and able to work. And what we saw again in the month of May was that the participation rate actually increased by point three points to 66.2 per cent. So what we're now seeing is unemployment is now down to the lowest level since 2014. Again, there's still more work to do, but certainly the policies that we are putting in place are having a positive effect on the economy. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Uh, how is the government's economic plan, including lower taxes, helping support Australia's economic reco recovery from COVID? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, when it comes to lower taxes, uh, that is just in the DNA on those on the coalition side of government. Because if you recall at the last election, colleagues, $387 billion in taxes was promised to the Australian people by the Labor Party. $387 billion in additional taxes was a promise made by the Labor Party to the Australian people at the last election. And all I can say is thank goodness the Australian people put their trust and their faith in the coalition government. Because you see, then COVID-19 hit. Can you honestly imagine, colleagues, if those opposite had been elected to office and had then imposed an additional $387 billion in taxes on the Australian people. It would have absolutely crippled businesses across Australia, crippled small and family businesses in particular, and then they would have been hit with the COVID-19 pandemic. Lowering taxes, whether it's for business or for Australians, Order, it's in our Senator DNA. Cash. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. <laughs> sorry. How has the government skilling and jobs agenda helped Australians sorry, by supporting job creation to deliver economic opportunity? <laughs> Senator Cash. 
Well, Mr. President, the Morrison government, we are all about opportunity for Australians. And again, that is reflected in the employment figures for the month of May, where we saw employment absolutely exceed the creation of market expectations. But of course, in uh, vocational education and training, uh, in the skills uh, part of the portfolio, we've provided an additional $2.7 billion to extend the boosting apprenticeship commencements. What we want to see is another 170,000 new apprentices and trainees brought on board to Australian businesses. We have extended that policy through now until March 2022. That's because we understand businesses out there, they do need our assistance, and this is a way of assisting them to bring a new apprentice, a new trainee on into their business. And encouragingly, we've actually seen since we first announced this policy. It's now 157,700 new apprentices, colleagues, have been brought on. New apprentices, 157,700 have been expired. brought on. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Colbeck. COVID vaccination allocations horizons provided to state and territory health CEOs by the Coordinator General of the National COVID Vaccine uh, Task Force on the 19th of June 2021. Senator Colbeck. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Walsh and I. Oh, Senator Gallagher, sorry. Sorry, did you hear that? Yes. I, said, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Walsh and myself. Uh, thank you. Uh, We've been asking for this information, which I understand the minister has just tabled at the end of uh, question time. Thank you. We've been after this information since uh, Monday, and the Senate actually passed an OPD um, to require the minister to table it, which was not followed. Uh, and then we've had a series of letters, and now it has been. It has been uh, tabled. Look, I would hope, and obviously we're going to have to take our time to read this, but I would hope that this information is the information that we were seeking and hasn't been modified by the government in any way at all. So we will take our time to have a look at that. I note um, our focus on the vaccine has been around the commitments the government has given and then failed to meet. So this is an important document to make sure that we are getting uh, the vaccine and the amount of vaccine uh, supplied, over, particularly over the winter months, to ensure that everybody who needs to be vaccinated should be vaccinated. We already know there are still people in Category 1A who remain unvaccinated. There are still people in Category 1B who remain unvaccinated because the Commonwealth has failed to roll out this vaccine program efficiently and effectively. I have no idea why they decided to hold so much back and ensure that they, they were responsible for rolling it out, because it's clear that the states and territories have the infrastructure and the ability to roll out the vaccine in a much more ef efficient way than the Commonwealth has been proven to be. And this has meant that particularly vulnerable groups, uh, people who live in residential aged care, people who receive home care packages, people in disability group homes, those staff that work in those homes, the families of those who visit people who live in those homes, are now exposed to much more significant risk from the outbreaks that will invariably come uh, across the country because of a number of failures, not just the vaccine, but the failure to put in place a national quarantine system that allows uh, returning or travelling Australians to quarantine safely and not pass the virus on. And we've had a number of, of breakouts from uh, quarantine. But our concern has been the failure of the Commonwealth to meet its own targets. Remember, these are not targets that anyone set but the government itself. So the government went out and said, we will vaccinate 4 million by the end of March. We will vaccinate all Australians, fully vaccinate it was, two shots by the end of October. We will do residential aged care and the workers who work in it in six weeks by Easter. And there will be 6 million Australians vaccinated by early May. None of that have been met, none of it. None of those targets the government set itself have been met. And now they've brought in uh, 
military leadership, essentially, to take the responsibility away from the Department of Health. Um, the Department of Health, in a pandemic, who have been guiding this, have basically been told to stand aside and let the general uh, Fruin take over, which clear even strategic communications. So we've seen a, a very diminished role for health, all because the Commonwealth failed to plan and failed to execute a rollout strategy that kept Australians safe, particularly vulnerable Australians, older Australians, Australians living in aged care, workers <coughs> in those sectors, people over the age of 50. They know all the data overseas from serious outbreaks shows that these are the groups that need to be protected. And this is the vulnerability we face going into winter. The hospitals in Australia are already full. They're full and they're not even at their busiest point in time yet. I think hospital activity peaks in September. We can only hope that as many people roll up their sleeves and get this vaccine as can be done in the next three months, we must hope that the government numbers, if they are to be believed, actually do get supplied to the states and territories so that they can run the program and that we reduce some of the risk that Australians face going into this winter period. I imagine for many Australians this is an extremely scary time for them, mm. hoping not to catch COVID, hoping to be get safe and hoping to get a vaccine. And these are important numbers. I hope the government has released everything that they've provided to the states and territories. We'll be looking at these closely because transparency is key to holding you to account to deliver for Australians when it comes to the vaccine rollout. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, um, Deputy President. Um, after 20 odd years in the military, one thing I have learned uh, is that the old saying that no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy is true. Um, you can plan, you make your plan on the basis of your analysis of the situation and assumptions, but when facts change, Someone who is going to win the battle is the person who is prepared to be flexible, use the basis of that planning uh, as the basis for new plans to respond to situations. And so it is globally, as we look at the changing situation with COVID, that the very best laid plans will have to change as the facts change on the ground. And so with ATAGI being the independent expert group in Australia who advises the government and national cabinet, so governments of our states and territories as well, about uh, the efficacy of vaccines, that those considerations, coupled with supply considerations that at times are outside the control of the Australian government, so we look at some of the well-advertised situations where uh, supply has been limited in terms of exports from Europe and other places. Uh, those are factors that will impact on a plan and a good military, a good government, a good deliverer of an outcome in what is a global pandemic uh, not seen for 100 years is one that can adapt to the circumstances and the facts as they arise as opposed to sticking rigidly with a plan or, in fact, being unwilling or afraid to articulate a plan up front, that the whole concept of delivery is looking at the circumstances, making a plan on the information available and then using that information to adapt and move forward. And so the information that is considered by National Cabinet includes those supply constraints, includes the information from ATAGI about effectiveness, uh, and then provides the best available information to people who are delivering services in the interests of the Australian people. So the Coordinator General of Operation COVID Shield, who is Lieutenant General Fruin, uh, and part of the reason I believe that the military do play a critical role in times of national disasters like floods and fires and pandemics is because they are good at planning and adapting and delivering. And General Fruin uh, has updated the planning projections for Pfizer and AstraZeneca doses for the <coughs> jurisdictions for the remainder of 2021. Uh, and as delivered, that information is valid. But the reality of life is it may change. And rather than complain about the fact that the facts have changed, 
What is important is that people know how to adapt and optimise available resource. But what General Fruin has indicated is that the Commonwealth is fast-tracking plans to expand the number of access points for Pfizer. By the end of July, all 136 Commonwealth vaccination clinics and around 1,300 GPs will be administering Pfizer, and many more primary care providers will be offered the chance to administer the mRNA vaccines as the supply of Pfizer significantly increases and the first supplies of Moderna arrive in September and October. So General Fruin was able to indicate that with the adaptation that has occurred, using that basis of planning to respond to the new facts on the ground, Australia is still on track with the expected supply picture to offer every eligible person in Australia a first dose of COVID by the end of 2021. First dose of a COVID vaccine, I should say. So it's important to understand that. It's also important to understand that many vaccines have actually already been delivered. Uh, a record Monday for vaccines. Last Monday uh, we had 63,000, uh, 119,000. These are the kind of figures we're now getting, and 128,000 on this most recent Monday shows that Australians are taking up the vaccine. Uh, and that's a really important thing, because it now means that more than 65 per cent of over 70s are protected, more than 45 per cent of over 50s are protected, and more than one in four of the eligible population over 16 are protected. So facts will change, but good planning means you can adapt to the new facts and continue to deliver the outcome that Australians Senator need. Fawcett, your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Very much, and, and I do really want to believe Senator Fawcett, and perhaps if he was the Minister for Health and he was a he was managing the portfolio instead of the hapless Minister Colbeck, uh, Australians might indeed have some degree of confidence. But what we've seen today in question time, in answers to questions from my colleagues Senator Walsh and Senator Gallagher, is once again this pattern of game playing, game playing with information that is about a game with people's lives. And we saw the game playing from this government and the false premises on which they proceeded and their failures to deliver and implement proper processes to protect Australians cost hundreds of lives in Victoria. And as I stand and speak here as a senator for New South Wales, our state is going into another very challenging period. Potential lockdown certainly changes to our practices because this virus remains. And Senator Colbeck gave answers to questions this, in his uh, response to those from, uh, offered from Senator Walsh, where he seemed to be very proud of these figures. 33 per cent of aged care workers have had their first dose. It's better than zero, but it's a long, long way from where it needs to be. And it's a huge distance from where this government promised Australians they would be. Only 15 per cent of the people who are working in aged care across Australia have had their second dose. Now, I can only hope in New South Wales that the Delta variant, which is out in our community and causing so much concern, doesn't end up with an aged care worker in an aged care setting or we're in all sorts of problems. And the reason that we're in this situation is because this government isn't telling the truth. It isn't telling the truth to the Australian people. It isn't coming here and telling the truth, and it isn't doing the work that needs to be done to provide the necessary protection for the Australian peoples. If you've got somebody going to a home, to a home of someone you love, a home care worker, you want to be really hoping in Sydney that on the watch of this government, who are responsible for rolling out the vaccine to home care workers and aged care workers, that that delta doesn't get into your home care situation, because only 4.3 per cent have had their second dose of all the home care workers. That's the bit of the job that this government was supposed to do. This is the bit of the job that the government stands up and says, yes, we're responsible for that, we're responsible for aged care, and they promised. They promised they would do this job properly, but they didn't. In response to a question from his own side today, Minister Colbeck pretended once again 
that they have accepted the Aged Care Commission uh, recommendations. But that is at odds with what he said in response to the question from Senator Walsh, because when she asked what was going on with the registration of people who are working across multiple sites, he had to tell the truth. And the truth is the government rejected that recommendation to set up a system to monitor who is working where, just like they didn't know who was vaccinated amongst the aged care workers. They've got no idea about how many people are working across what sites. And then he sort of faffed on for ages trying to pretend that they've got some system in place. It is required, he said, we are doing consultations. We're going to use—notice the future tense, not even the present tense and certainly not the past tense. They have not established anything. We are going to use, he says, a system already in place to get that up and running. Well, there is an absolute failure of responsibility. The government had one major job this year, and that was to effectively roll out the vaccine. It had a particular responsibility in the aged care sector. They have failed, and it's cost lives. I fear that the complacency of this government, who thinks it wasn't a race against this deadly disease, is going to cost more lives, especially with the Delta strain out and active. We lag behind countries like Fiji, Azerbaijan, Panama, just to name a few. They've got better vaccination rates than Australia. This is hurting our economy, it's hurting our families, it's hurting our aged care. It's time the government did their job and told the truth. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Once more, we rise to speak on uh, the vaccination rollout in this place, and once again, we have those opposite attempting uh, to play politics, which what is a very complex, a very important, uh, a multi-jurisdictional rollout of vaccinations across Australia using different varieties of vaccines in an, environment, in an environment where the health advice has changed a number of times. And that is exactly what those opposite do not want to talk about. The health advice has changed to a significant degree on a number of occasions, including uh, just last week when, uh, once again, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, was, was changed in terms of its, recommend, its age recommendation for Australians. I was booked in. I've said this in this place before. I was booked in for the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. I'd, I'd chosen to do it at the start of our winter recess, so uh, if there was any uh, potential uh, side effects. I'm not worried about an adverse reaction, but if there are any potential side effects, I wouldn't be uh, travelling to Canberra uh, in the imminent near future. Um, now, as a result of the changed health recommendation, that has uh, since been changed to a Pfizer vaccine, and that's going to be slightly later. Obviously, when the health advice changes, the rollout is going to change, and those opposite playing politics on this, uh, it's not only unhelpful, but it does play into the hands of those who wish to raise doubt about the vaccine efficacy. And I think those opposite should take that into account when they do play these political games. Now, obviously, when Atagi came to, um, to the government uh, and changed their recommendation on AstraZeneca so that it was now recommended only for people aged 60 and over, uh, things needed to change. The experts at Atagi have made it clear that for those Australians who have had their first dose of AstraZeneca, it is strongly recommended that they do have their second dose of AstraZeneca, given the risks from the second shot of the vaccine are much, much smaller. Now, on receiving the advice for the change of age, uh, the government acted quickly, very quickly, within half an hour, in fact, of receiving that advice. The government announced it publicly, and then uh, obviously that has flowed on through uh, the various jurisdictions to ensure that um, changes are made to the vaccine rollout and people are informed if their particular circumstances, as mine did, changed. Um, now, obvi obviously, there are other outcomes from the National Cabinet meeting. 
the Coordinator General of Operation COVID Shield, Lieutenant General Fruant, provided each state and territory government with planning projections of Pfizer and AstraZeneca doses for their jurisdiction over the remainder of 2021. Obviously, this allows the state jurisdictions to plan their individual rollouts. The Coordinator General confirmed the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine allocations are provided on a proportional population basis. The Coordinator General confirmed that the Commonwealth delivers all first dose allocations to states and territories with matching second dose allocations delivered three weeks after first doses are administered. Of course, this is important. This ensures that states and territories have control over allocation of first and second dose administration based on their supply schedules. Uh, National Cabinet also noted that the Commonwealth is fast-tracking plans to expand the number of access points for Pfizer. By the end of July, all 136 Commonwealth vaccination clinics, 40 ACCHSs and 1,300 GPs uh, will be administering Pfizer. Many more primary care providers will be offered a chance to administer mRNA vaccines as the supply of Pfizer significantly increases and the first supplies of Moderna arrive in September and October. The Coordinator General also confirmed that based on expect, expected supplies, Australia remains on track to offer every eligible person in Australia a first dose of COVID-19 vaccine by the end of 2021. Once again, the government's and my message to all Australians is make sure you are booked in for your first shot. Make sure you are vaccinated. That is the best way to protect our loved ones, protect our community and return to normal in this pandemic. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. This is, uh, I think, the third time in recent weeks which I've taken note on similar topics around the rollout of vaccines in aged care in response this time to questions from Senators Walsh and Gallagher. And it's frustrating me. It's frustrating me that I'm doing that and it's a sign that we still have so many unanswered questions on our side about what's happening with the vaccination rollout, about what's happening in aged care, and about how it impacts residents in aged care and workers in aged care. The government has two jobs, two jobs when it comes to this pandemic. Quarantine and the vaccination rollout. And on both jobs, we are just seeing failure after failure, delay after delay, and excuse after excuse. Today in question time, we saw Senator Colbeck again try and blame the states for a failure to provide data in time, at the certain time, as was requested by the Senate. And it's not the first time he's blamed the states and territories for his errors, for his failures, for the failures of the Morrison government when it comes to the vaccine rollout, when it comes to quarantine. And the impact of this is very, very serious. The impact of this, just look at New South Wales. Just look at what's happening in New South Wales. And I echo Senator O'Neill's comments and concerns around what's happening in New South Wales at the moment. People are scared, people are worried, particularly the families of those who are in residential aged care, the workers who want to keep the residents they care for safe, in-home care workers as well, workers in our disability sector. This is dangerous. It's dangerous and because the government is botching it, people are feeling more scared than they should have to. We've heard today only 15.6 per cent of residential aged care workers have received their second dose, meaning only 15.6 per cent of residential aged care workers are fully vaccinated. 15 per cent. Well, this is the front line. We saw what happened in 2020 in aged care. Australians watched in absolute horror as COVID rampaged through aged care homes in Victoria especially, where over 600 Australians died. They were horrific, horrific scenes which shook all of us, which shook all of us. And the lessons learned 
lessons learned should be that we cannot wait, we cannot delay. This is a race. The Prime Minister says, the Prime Minister says it is not a race, but it is a race. It's a race, and Australians want it to be happening quicker, happening faster and happening effectively. They want the implementation going better. And we ask questions about the numbers, we ask questions about the data over and over and over again because this matters. Because how can you possibly track the implementation of something so important if you can't even answer basic questions about who's had the jab and who hasn't? If you can't even have basic delineations between what you're responsible for and what the states and territories are responsible for. And you can't even come into this place and say, yeah, I cop that. My bad. I've made a mistake. I'm going to take responsibility now. Australians are worried that on your two jobs, quarantine, vaccination rollout, you're failing and it's costing them. It's costing our country. It's costing our future. It's going to impact how we come through this pandemic, without a doubt, without a doubt. And Australians are right to be, be worried. Now, I, I join Senator Brockman in my absolute support for making sure that we take these vaccinations. As soon as I'm eligible, I will be getting vaccinated, and I, I really look forward to the opportunity to do that. More Australians want to be vaccinated, but we need to get this rollout right so that they can be. And we need to get this rollout right so that the people who are most vulnerable in this pandemic, those in our aged care homes, those working there in disability care also, are safe, can keep those around them safe. That's what Australians want, but they need the government to step up to the plate on their jobs. The question is the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move to take note of the answers given uh, to my questions to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, um, Senator Birmingham. Now, I asked about climate ambition. And I asked why all of the fuss squabbling over 2050, whether it's preferably or not, between um, this Liberal government and their coalition partners in the National Party, when all of the science says that that is a distraction, it is an excuse for inaction and that delay is the new denial. 2030 is the year that we should all be talking about. That's what the science says needs to happen. That's what most of the world is talking about. The G7 just made recommendations last week about taking serious action in this coming decade, including phasing out fossil fuel subsidies and including, importantly, seriously increasing participant countries' 2030 targets. Many of them were doubled. Our government didn't double its pathetic 2030 targets, and of course the opposition doesn't even have any 2030 targets. So this whole phony war between the Liberals and the Nationals as they squabble over what the new division of ministerial responsibilities are going to be with their new leader at the helm um, is a massive distraction and is really letting down anyone that cares deeply about delivering a safe climate um, for existing humans and future generations and who cares about creating a prosperous economy with all of those jobs that will flow from a clean economy. Now, naturally, I didn't get um, uh, an answer to that question. I certainly got a whole lot of words, but Ed, I don't think you could describe them as an actual answer to that question of the fact that 2050 is uh, uh, talk of delay is the new denial. So I then asked about the impact on farmers of the repeal of the carbon price. This government loved to champion that um, they repealed the carbon price, but actually we've had the numbers crunched. And if, um, because as people would know, the carbon price was set to link to the EU scheme before it was appealed. If it hadn't have been repealed, our Australian farmers would be bringing in an absolute mozza. And the figures, to be more specific, are they could be earning $80 a tonne in today's prices by storing carbon on the land. So the coalition has already lost Australian farmers $1.4 billion of export income by um, getting rid of the price on pollution, um, and it's going to cost them another $11 billion by the end of the decade. So again, this nonsense from the National Party, who used to claim to represent farmers but now clearly just prioritise the interests of coal and gas companies over everybody else—and um, you know, there's no denying that anymore. 
they claim that they once represented the interests of farmers, but actually they are denying Australian farmers the opportunity for an additional revenue stream. Um, and their continued denial and inaction on the climate is actually imperilling um, farmers' ability to keep producing food and fibre for us and the rest of the world. Um, I, I, do, I don't understand how you can still have climate denial uh, in the Chamber of Parliament in 2021, um, particularly not from a party that actually like often lives in rural and regional Australia, and where many farming groups keep saying to them, we can see the impacts of the climate crisis on our land, on our productivity. We want something done, and we want that option to be paid from sequestering carbon on our land. I don't understand why the National Party in particular, but uh, the, the governing Liberal Party, aren't listening to the people that they purport to represent. Um, again, I didn't get a real answer to that question. Um, it was the usual sort of talking point um, stuff and a whole lot of new slogans that obviously the focus groups have said you know, really work, but rural and regional Australians are not going to be duped by this assemblage of word salad. They want action on the climate crisis. They can see what it's, ha what, what it's doing to their farms already and they can see the opportunities um, for international carbon markets. But they're not getting the representation from the Liberal and National Party. Um, the last point that I made was whilst this squabble is happening about who's going to be in charge of what ministry under this new um, leadership of, of Barnaby Joyce, most of our trading partners are taking serious action and making serious commitments to increase their carbon pollution reduction targets. Japan um, have announced that by 2030 they want a 46 per cent reduction, and South Korea, who is our third biggest um, energy customer, have just yesterday lifted their targets to 40 per cent. So it's rumoured, of course, that the trade portfolio might go to the Nats as some kind of deal um, in making them go quiet on 2050. Well, do you really want climate deniers? holding the trade portfolio when our closest energy trading partners are taking this issue seriously and are increasing their 2030 targets. It's not a game, folks. This isn't just sloganeering and, and power-mongering. This is um, the world's climate. This is agricultural productivity. This is the future of the reef. This is the safety of our nation's health. There is so much at stake here. For this issue to continue to be politicised um, is just absolutely woeful. Question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Just finding my... Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to various bills, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. I also table statements of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated in Hansard. The granted leave is granted. Senator Dunningham. Thank you. I've. Uh, so you're, you're not giving leave to have the statement incorporated into Hansard, is that? Uh, you want, you're asking the minister to um, uh, read out the list of bills. Do you have that, minister? We have that to hand. Uh, we have. Uh, here we are. We have it here. The COVID-19 disaster payment funding arrangements bill 2021. The Hazardous Waste Regulation of Exports and Imports Amendment Bill 2021, Telecommunications Legislation Amendment International Production Orders Bill 2020, Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response Bill 2021. Yeah. Um, leave was granted to incorporate the statements in Hansard. I take it. Yes. Thank you. Senator Dunningham, you have another you notice of motion. I do. I give notice in general terms, understanding Order 76.6 of my intention to give a notice of motion for the next day of sitting relating to the resetting of formal business processes in accordance with the note circulated to senators today. Okay. Are there any other notices of motion? I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I'll commence by calling the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General business notices of motion 1097-1133 in the name of Senator Hanson Young, 1164 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, 1167 in the name of Senator Waters, and 1169 in the name of Senator McAllister, 
all to the next day of sitting. And committees have lodged an extension notification as shown at item 10 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I will call Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President, um, I was hoping to move, or seek leave rather, to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Henderson. Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Henderson for today for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. The ayes have it. There being no other matters, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, um, and I will be dealing with these in the order they appear on the notice paper. Just for the advice of the whips. First is business of the Senate matter number one in the name of Senator Waters. Uh, thank you very much, President. I seek leave to amend business of the Senate notice of motion number one before asking that it be taken um, as a formal motion in the terms that have been circulated in the chamber is simply deleting paragraphs B and C for the benefit is, of all. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. I amend the motion in the terms uh, circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, um, Senator Waters. Uh, I move the motion as amended. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. It is unnecessary for this matter to be referred to committee. The Beedaloo Cooperative Drilling Program has been carefully considered and is a key plank of our plan to bring on new gas supply to help address domestic shortfall, maintain affordability, and continue to grow a strong economy. The Northern Territory's Beedaloo Subbasin is one of the largest undeveloped onshore gas resources in the world. Development has the potential to create 6,000 jobs by 2040, transform the Northern Territory's economy and supply gas into domestic markets for decades to come. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Question is the business of the Senate motion number one be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 24. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, don't go far. I'll be ringing the bells for a minute from this point. Senator O'Neill, business of the Senate matter number two. I thank you, Mr. President. And I ask that business Senate notice of motion number two relating to the adequacy and efficacy of Australia's anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regime uh, be referred to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee for inquiry and report be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator O'Neill. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. Austrac is a world-leading financial intelligence agency and regulator of anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing. In the last five years, Austrac enforcement action has resulted in more than $2 billion in civil penalties from Tabcorp, CBA and Westpac. In addition, uh, total tax liabilities raised using Austrac information in the last decade comes to more than uh, $2.6 billion. The government has provided Austrac an additional $104.9 million over four years to uplift its capability, meaning more non-compliance can be detected, investigated and addressed. Recently, Austrac commenced enforcement investigations against several casino operators and the National Australia Bank. Austrac is continuing to innovate and leverage its domestic and international partnerships to get the best results to detect, prevent and disrupt AML, CTF and other serious crime. The question is the motion moved by Senator O'Neill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Lambie, remote business of the Senate, matter number three. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number three be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to, Senator Waters? President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, President. Over the past fortnight, the Greens have proposed a robust, independent mechanism to look into Minister Porter's suitability to hold a ministerial position. Our commission would have allowed issues surrounding allegations of Minister Porter's behaviour and any implications for compliance with the ministerial standards to be considered at arm's length from politicians by a former judge with expertise in managing evidence, the presumption Order. of innocence, conflicts of interest and confidentiality. But government senators, one nation senators and Senator Lambie blocked even the introduction of that proposal. Uh, this referral proposed by Senator Lambie will send those same questions to a Senate committee made up of partisan politicians dominated by government members. It is not a great forum for this important issue, but it would be better than nothing. So on that basis alone, we will be supporting this referral. 
question is the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 26. The, the votes being equal, the question is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator Rice, Business of the Senate, motion number four. Um, thanks, Mr. President. Um, could I actually postpone Business of the Senate, notice of motion number four until tomorrow? You're seeking leave. Seeking to leave to do that. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. Senator. Oh no, sorry. Um, Senator, business of the Senate number five. Is that is that still? Was that the matter that was withdrawn in the postponements earlier? No, that's the reference. Ah, yes. Sorry, I'm just getting. Now, I, I notified yesterday, senators, that at some point I would be declaring the substantive part of this motion the reference, not simply the date, and that changing the date would not allow it to be con continually brought back before the Senate. I'm giving, this, I'm giving senators notice now that a further date change to this motion I will consider to be putting forward the same question because this will be the third time it has been dealt with. So I just thought I should advise senators of that before this vote. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I shall take that um, under consideration for future days. But um, for now, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number five uh, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. Question. I'll give the whips a moment. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point to Senator Urquhart to tell for the ayes, Senator Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 27. The matter is resolved in the negative. We'll now go to government business matter number one, the introduction of legislation. Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that government business notice of motion number one be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunham. I move that the following uh, bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to courts and tribunals and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read for the first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to courts and tribunals and for related purposes. Senator Dunham. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and uh, move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 3 August 2021. I'll now go to number 1134 uh, in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1134 relating to Ita Buttrose and the ABC be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The Australian Government recognises the importance of the ABC. Further, the Government recognises that the ABC has content and operational independence, which is enshrined in legislation. To support the ABC, the government provides more than $1 billion in funding to the ABC, which increases each year over the current triennium. The government appointed Ms Buttrose as chair of the ABC and continues to support her in that role. The government recognises the importance of the ABC serving all Australians and welcomes the recent decision from the ABC to move up to, uh, to, move up to 300 staff to Parramatta in line with our advocacy. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. So I've been asked to do a four-minute bell, but I again remind senators the standing orders say that there are one-minute bells between divisions, so there will be a four-minute bell at the request of the whips, given the changing arrangements. So reset the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Smith tell off the noes. Results for division is ayes 26, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator McKim, your motion number 1141. Thank you, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1141 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Hanson, did, were you seeking the call? Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Right, thank you. I want to make it clear that One Nation is 100 per cent opposed to the changes to the responsible lending laws proposed in the National Consumer Credit Protection Bill, and I am on the public record in that regard. One Nation has made it clear to the Greens that we had forwarded instructions and, in fact, have now received the first extensive draft amendments which delete any reference in the bill excluding banks from their current statutory or regulatory obligations. We do recognise there are other provisions of the bill which we, in part, also propose to amend to enhance the protection for consumers. One Nation has advised the Greens accordingly and requested it defer this notice pending the circulation of our draft amendments to the bill. For the above reasons, One Nation will not support this motion. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes and Senator Smith tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 27. Votes being equal, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator Seward, your matter number 1161. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1161 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The pro proposed changes to Governance Standard 3 seek to redefine the standard to capture the offences of trespass, vandalism, theft, assault, and intimidation. This will empower the ACNC Commissioner to investigate such breaches of the law by charities and take enforcement action if warranted. Charities will still be able to undertake advocacy actions consistent with their charitable purposes, provided it is conducted lawfully. Registered charities that act lawfully and do not use their resources to promote others to engage in unlawful activities are already complying with the proposed changes. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawood be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Watt, number 1162, or Senator Urquhart on Senator Watt's behalf. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1162 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. 1163, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1163 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. I'll go with Senator Waters, then I'll come to Senator Dunham. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Australia is in a national domestic and family violence crisis, yet stories of inadequate policing responses and terrible treatment of victim survivors persist. On at least two occasions already this year, women in Queensland have been murdered after repeatedly seeking police help. There is a clear need to improve gender balance in organisations responding to DV incidents. The Queensland Anti-Discrimination Act and the Federal Sex Discrimination Act confirm that affirmative action policies can be a legitimate way to redress gender imbalance. However, as the most recent Wajia Gender Equality Insights report highlights, setting gender equality targets is not enough without cultural change to attract and retain women. Without genuine efforts to change the culture within the Queensland Police Service and give women confidence that it is a workplace that will respect them and those that come to them for help, gender equality will not be achieved. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a one short minute. statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Recruitment arrangements are a matter for each individual organisation and employer to determine. The Morrison government maintains that all workplaces are responsible for complying with relevant state, territory, and Commonwealth laws in relation to recruitment and employment practices. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Roberts teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 3, noes 35. The matter is resolved in the negative. We will now come to 1165, the name of Senator Dean Smith. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1165 relating to the Korean community in Western Australia be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. I'll now go to 1166. I understand Senator Scar is moving this on behalf of Senator Can You're moving this on behalf of Senator Canavan, Senator uh, Scar. I am, uh, I am Mr President, and I also ask that the names my own name and also those of Senators Rennick, Stoker, McGrath and MacDonald be added to the motion and I seek leave that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. Okay, so I uh, now come to 1168, the name of Senator Senator Thorpe and McKim. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I inform the Senate that Senators Keneally and McCarthy will also sponsor the motion, and I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1168 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, as is the case with all migration matters, it's not appropriate for the Senate to deliberate on individual migration cases. This is irrespective of the case or the profile of any individual or family in question. Furthermore, senators will be asked to vote about a case without the full facts in front of them, and as is the case in this circumstance, where there are matters currently before the courts. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim and others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. I'm looking at the whips. One minute. All right, ring the bells for four minutes, but I again give senators a warning. The standing orders, if they are outside, they need to stay nearby. Pairings not in the standing orders. It's a courtesy of the chamber. Yep.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator McKim and others be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 27. The votes being equal, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Gallagher. Move that, pursuant to contingent notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Wong, that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent motion 1162 in the name of Senator Watt being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith tell off the ayes and Senator Patrick tell off the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 51, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now put I'll now allow Senator Gallagher to move the motion. Thanks, Senator Mr. Gallagher. President. I move um, motion number 1162. Question is that motion be agreed to, Senator Dunningham? Government statement on this motion. Thank you. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. Question is that motion number 1162 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator, Ur Senator Urquhart teller for ayes and Senator Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 27. The, matter be, the votes being equal, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senator Dunningham. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move general business notices of motion numbers 1165 and 1166 leave together. Is oh, sorry. And for the motions to be determined without amendment or debate. Leave granted. Leave is not granted. Senator Dunningham. Uh, Mr. President, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would, pre uh, would prevent general business notices of motion numbers 1165 and 1166 being moved together immediately and de determined without de uh, amendment or debate. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith tell of the ayes and Senator Lambie tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 54, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Dunningham. Move the motions and ask that they be put yes. separately. I've got multiple requests to have them dealt with separately. Senator Waters, you're going to seek the call? Oh, okay. I'll now put the motion. I'll commence with number 1165 in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Those in favour of that motion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll now go to Final matter, which is 1166, moved by Senator Scar on behalf of Senator Canavan and others. Uh, those in support of that motion say aye. aye. Senator Waters. I seek leave to table a one minute statement or to give it verbally if you feel like having a listen for a minute. Leave is granted to table the statement, Thank Senator you. Waters. All Senator right. Green. Ripped one more. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I'll now put the motion. The question is that motion number 1166 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1166 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith tell off the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell off the noes.
Senator Reddick. Order. Senators Rennick and Green. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 26. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. Senator Watt. My attention that Senator Rennick was taking a photograph of opposition senators during that uh, division. Um, uh, well, I understand I, that I, is not permitted. There, I, I can say that no photos. I didn't see anything. No photos are permitted to be taken in the Senate chamber by senators. There are, or, there are photo rules for the. Um, taking of photos and their publication, which are available on the parliamentary website. Um, if anyone has taken a photo, I would encourage them to delete it immediately. Well, I was. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, order. Order. Senator Rennick, did you take a photo in the chamber with your phone? Oh, well, I, I, sorry. Hang on. Sorry. I, Whenever a question is asked of a senator when it comes to a matter of conduct in the chamber, the chair always defers to the answer given by the senator. If a photo was taken, it is out of order. Um, I'll, that concludes. The confidence that Senator Rennick is going to observe your um, well, ruling, I, 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 I trust that you will follow that up. Um, if a photo is published in the chamber, then that would be a breach of order. Um, I will assume, and I take every senator at their word when, when, I'm, when I'm asked to address a senator on conduct inside the chamber, I always take a senator at their word, as have previous chairs. Um, there, there, are, there, is footage of the ca there is footage of the chamber that can otherwise be used, and I think many senators have taken advantage of it, but photos can't be taken by senators in the floor of the chamber. Senator Gallagher. Mr. President, just on that, I mean, my understanding on the guidelines and procedures around that are that it's the possession of the photo as opposed to the publication of the photo that might be relevant here, and in which um, case. Can I, I think it's could, a publication. I, off the top of my head, I would have to check. Could the you rules. have a look at, yes, at I the difference between the rules? Both. Go to the publication of photos primarily. I'm going to look at the clerk. <laughs> yep. I mean, I might say that. It wouldn't be the first time I've seen senators pull out a phone in a way that might, I might let me finish, that I might suspect they've taken a photo. The rules have always, in my view, related to the publication of such photos, whether that be on social media or otherwise. Is that matter concluded? But I, if I'm wrong, I'll come back to the chamber. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75, the question of which would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter was received from Senator Dodson. 
Pursuant to standing order, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The division and dysfunction within the Morrison government with the Prime Minister's preference for net zero emissions by 2050 countered by the statement of Nationals leader Mr Barnaby Joyce that the Nationals have always been opposed to a net zero target. If the Nationals supported net zero emissions, we would cease to be a party that could credibly represent farmers. I'm, is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. And with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. Um, what a week uh, it has been, uh, really. And while uh, this place has been focused internally, as it always is, uh, and the National Party has been focused uh, on itself. We've seen a couple of themes emerge uh, from the fracas, the self-absorbed, self-indulgent, self-interested fracas inside the National Party. The only uniting theme that these characters can design that explains their behaviour is their opposition to the Prime Minister's crab walking towards the most basic of commitments. Uh, around climate change, emissions, energy and jobs, and the capacity of those opposite to develop a policy framework is so weak, so poor, that they have had 19 different energy policy frameworks over the course of the last eight years. Now, According to the movie review aggregator Rotten Tomatoes, the worst movie that ever got a sequel was the 1999 flop Baby Geniuses, a favourite of Senator McGrath's, I'm told. The critics' consensus read, flat direction and actors who look embarrassed to be on screen make Baby Geniuses worse than the premise suggests. Not dissuaded from their 2 per cent Rotten Tomatoes score, 2004 saw the release of Super Baby's Baby Geniuses 2 which received a 0 per cent score. The critics' consensus read, A startling lack of taste pervades Super Babies, a sequel offering further proof that bad jokes still aren't funny when coming from the mouths of babes. And so we turn to the modern National Party and rejoicing Barnaby Mark II. This week has seen the return, un unheralded, Unwanted. Senator Ayres, it was a fairly difficult reference, but you were referring to a member of the other place. Yes. And in this contribution from here on in, I expect you to refer to them in the proper way. Mr. Joyce, the member for New England, is who I was referring to. So, if if uh, if that assists, I will absolutely do that. So this week has seen uh, Mr. Joyce's return. The first, the original, was bad. What will the sequel bring? Today's MPI debate is about the new and old Deputy Prime Minister's position on the target of net zero by 2050. So the Prime Minister has been experimenting with his climate rhetoric this year. I say experimenting because nobody knows quite what the Prime Minister means. The Prime Minister of Britain and the Liberal backbench certainly think that he means one thing the National Party believes another. And surely Australian people, ordinary people, who overwhelmingly demand a sensible approach on climate and emissions and jobs and energy, have no chance at all of understanding what on earth it is that the Prime Minister is talking about. When the Prime Minister says it is his preference to get to net zero by 2050, what on earth does he mean? When he says new energy economy, what are the real-world policy consequences for people? The Prime Minister is so tied up in his own spin that nobody knows what he means, least of all himself. But the once and future leader of the National Party has had some interesting observations about a net zero emissions target. Last month he published an opinion piece in the Northern Daily Leader outlining his thoughts, the thought leader of the National Party. And given that the Prime Minister will finally have to sit down and negotiate a fresh iteration of this secret coalition agreement, it's worth some close examination. The title of this opinion piece, 
Climate socialism will trump private rights. Unfortunately, it takes about half of the op-ed to get to climate change. But firstly, we've got past what passes for amateur philosophy from the member for New England. He says, the cornerstone of a modern franchise of freedom relies on the state to protect private ownership. The disenfranchisement of freedom relies on the state imposing on your ability to act independently. It's got the kind of overheated quality of someone trying to prove that they had done that week's readings. Then he goes on to say, COVID itself has been brilliant at the disenfranchisement of personal freedoms. You can't travel from one place of no disease to another of no disease because of the dictates of the state. What on earth does this bloke mean? What on earth does he mean? It's the kind of febrile stuff that's out there on the funny old chat rooms, the ultra-right chat rooms out there. And then he goes on to say, the conservative side of politics has to be the champion of private ownership. The power of the state deadens the dynamics of the individual, which paradoxically makes the nation weaker than it would be if it was freer. What on earth is this rubbish from this bloke? But this is what passes for ideology for the bloke who wants to be the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. I was informed by my staff that the Weatherboard Nine podcast, remember that, you'd all be on it, the Weatherboard Nine po podcast, Mr Joyce and Senator Canavan, we never know which one's Weatherboard and which one's Iron, we do know that that particular podcast, even for young right-wingers, the kind of characters who sit in their basements listening to this kind of stuff, even for them it puts the board into Weatherboard. I was informed that Weatherboard 9 is 40 minutes of this kind of rubbish. Finally, he begins to ramp up to a point. The discussions about the proposed 2050 zero emissions target will impose on the individual the next raft of caveats. Once again, it will stand next to the moralistic framed existential crisis of global warming. This impossible journey to zero emissions can only be embarked on with a whole new raft of impositions on private assets. I mean, really, not even Senator Rennick would understand what that was all about. It must be a surprise to the National Farmers Federation, who have endorsed a net zero by 2050 target. It would have to be a surprise to Meat and Livestock Australia who are planned to achieve net zero by the end of the decade. It goes on, climate socialism will trump private rights long before it would or could have any effect on the mercury. I mean, this is just free form, like a sort of uh, hallucinogenic trip uh, that Mr Joyce is unfolding here. The state will look to you, he says, for thanks that you can now go to Anzac Day or church. Net zero emissions, according to Mr Joyce, is going to take Anzac Day away. How on earth can the Prime Minister come to agreement with a man who thinks that net zero emissions is the equivalent of the villain from Braveheart? How can the Prime Minister hammer out a deal with a man who thinks that net zero emissions is going to steal Christmas? Well, Mr Joyce, Mr. Joyce doesn't represent farmers. He doesn't fight for country communities. He only stands up for one person. Mr Joyce will only ever stand up for Mr Joyce. And I find the Deputy Prime Minister's rhetoric particularly unusual, considering his track record as Agriculture Minister. He's very exercised about property rights when he's in the local paper, but he's much more flexible about property rights when it comes to the National Party's role in the Murray-Darling Basin. When Four Corners exposed that billions of litres of water had been stolen from the Bowen Darling, the then Minister for Agriculture, who's responsible for this scheme, was entirely unconcerned. He said, it's an issue overwhelmingly for New South Wales, an echo of the Prime Minister's approach to vaccine delivery or quarantine. But to an audience of irrigators that night, he told the truth. He said, we've taken water, put it back into agriculture so we can look after you and make sure we don't have the greenies running the show. Well, 
It wasn't put back into agriculture. It was put back into mates of the National Party. Some bits of agriculture got the benefit of that very loose approach to water allocations. Is it any surprise that it barely took a week of his return for the National Party to start undermining the agreement that shares our nation's rivers? Their surprise amendments in the Senate bring the $13 billion Murray-Darling Basin Plan to the brink of destruction, pitting farmer against farmer and state against state. It's a self-indulgent display from a self-indulgent party led by a self-indulgent man. His paranoid vision of personal freedom comes at great cost to country Australians, to Australian agriculture and ultimately to all of us. Senator Small. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'd like something from Sesame Street. Today's MPI seems to be brought to us by the number 2050 and the letter D. D for division and dysfunction over there on the Labor benches, because the Labor Party will do anything, it seems, to paint over their own internal divisions, whether it's on coal, on gas, on energy, on emissions reductions and the investments that this government seeks to make and they stand between. Labor talk a big game about a climate emergency, but in the same breath they vote against solutions and the necessary steps that we seek to take. Not 24 hours ago in this chamber, the Labor Party sided with the Greens to vote against $192.5 million in additional funding for ARENA, and that's investment in Australian innovation. They voted against more EV and hydrogen charging stations. They voted against more energy efficiency and a competitive heavy industry in Australia. They voted against carbon capture and storage, and they voted against their own national policy platform, which they adopted not even 90 days ago at their federal conference. Meanwhile, we are seeking to take real and practical action to deliver lower emissions whilst we protect our economy, we protect our jobs and we protect investment in Australian businesses. We have strong targets. We have an enviable track record and a clear plan. Our, uh, sorry, our approach is driven by technology, not taxes. So we are not divided, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. We are very unified that our plan will deliver lower emissions, protect Australian industry, protect Australian jobs, and the only thing that stands between that and realising it is the Labor Party. Emissions are at their lowest level since 1990 when records began. But that hasn't been uh, you know, brought about by a massive increase in the power prices that Australians pay. Indeed, wholesale power prices are at their lowest level in nine years, following 19 straight months of falls from the introduction of the big stick legislation that this government introduced. Household retail prices are 11.2 per cent lower than they were a year ago, and we are delivering the needed investment through the Snowy 2.0 and the Curry Curry gas power station to ensure that Australians pay affordable energy prices today and tomorrow. This is a government, Mr Acting Deputy President, that recognises that whilst ambition is important, achievement and outcomes are actually what matter. We are one of a handful of countries in the world to have beaten our Kyoto-era commitments. We beat our 2020 target by some 459 million tonnes. And not only that, our emissions have fallen faster than the G20 average, faster than the OECD average and much faster than similar developed economies like Canada and New Zealand. So again, Mr Acting Deputy President, this is a government that is unified with a strong track record and a plan that the Labor Party oppose. On a per-person basis, our 2030 target is more ambitious than those of France, Germany, Canada, New Zealand or Japan. So we have an ambitious target, we have a, a, a proactive policy agenda, and that is an ambition but not a cap. We want to meet and exceed those targets. The latest emissions projections, published as recently as December 2020, show that we are on track to do exactly that. As the Prime Minister has said, we are a nation that wants to get to net zero, and preferably by 2050. 
But we're committed to doing that through technology and not taxes. That's the approach that's yielded results so far, and it hasn't sacrificed jobs and industries on the altar of labour vanity. Instead, this government is focused on the how, and that how is breakthroughs in technology that will be needed to make net zero emissions possible here and around the world. Updated forecasts uh, with respect to our 2030 Paris targets show that we are uh, improving our baseline position by some 639 million tonnes, which, as I told the Chamber yesterday, is equivalent to taking Australia's 14.7 million cars—that's every car in the nation—off the road for some 15 years. But not only that, focused on the, uh, focused on the present, we have an impressive plan. We've, we've got momentum leading into Australia's technology investment roadmap, uh, and our commitment is clear. We're going to keep electricity prices low, we're going to keep the lights on, and we're going to be doing our bit to reduce global emissions without wrecking the economy. These are the results that we're seeing thus far, and this is the plan that we have. Advancing that next generation of low emissions technologies is crucial to actually fully realising our plan under the Paris Agreement. But that's exactly what was voted against by both Labor and the Greens yesterday. Not only did they vote against $192.5 million of investment in renewable technology, they also voted against 1,400 green jobs here in Australia. Australia's experience has been that when new technologies are economically competitive, Australians take them up at a great rate. And that's why here in Australia we're seeing the adoption of renewable uh, energy at ten times the global average, four times faster than China, Japan, US and Europe as a whole. Australia now has the highest solar capacity of any country in the world. And that's where we can go with our technology roadmap. That comprehensive plan to ensure that not only do we realise the benefits of the technologies today, but we continue to realise those benefits tomorrow. So accelerating technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, carbon soil measurement, low carbon materials in steel and aluminium and long duration energy storage are the sorts of innovations that will unlock emissions reductions into the, into the future. And that's exactly what was opposed in this chamber last night by those who seem to have forgotten it with this fallacious MPI today. So Australian electricity prices are coming down. Emissions are coming down. Jobs are secure. Industry is developing. Technology is developing. And we're future-proofing our energy markets with the gas-fired recovery as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our competitive advantage as a nation has always been premised on cheap, reliable energy, and gas is fundamental to that as we move through a transition to a net neutral future, preferably by 2050. Our comprehensive plan of 13 measures in the gas market to establish an open and competitive hub model based on the Henry Hub will in fact unlock supply, ensure efficient transportation, and empower consumers, importantly, because this is an industry that employs more than 900,000 Australians, Mr Acting Deputy President, and we will not risk their jobs and their economic security with a big taxing, big government agenda like those opposite. Labor are completely divided by this issue, and this motion is yet another attempt on their part to paper over the cracks over there, to distract from their complete lack of energy and climate policy action where it counts. They are all talk about targets and ambitions, but they have no plan to get there. The contrast to this government, with both a strong track record, a world-beating story to tell and a plan to take us to a net neutral future, could not be starker. Labor can't tell you how much their policies will reduce emissions by. They can't tell you how many jobs it'll cost. They can't tell you how many more electric vehicles we'll have on our roads or indeed if we'll have carbon capture and storage at all. But yesterday in this place, they all lined up over there to vote against $192.5 million of investment and 1,400 jobs in this important space. That is something that, I ref that reflects 
the Labor Party are all at sea when it comes to energy policy, when it comes to being net neutral, preferably by 2050, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Labor Party oppose our Curry Curry gas-fired project. They voted against our arena investments, and yet they've got no plan and no story to tell. With that, I think Australians can be very confident that it's the Morrison government that will protect their jobs, that will keep their power prices low, that will keep their jobs safe and will deliver uh, the sort of future uh, that our children would want to see. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. You're, uh, you're from a very proud farming background. Uh, my father was a farmer, and I was even a farmer myself for nearly 15 years. And farmers grow things. Farmers understand that one of the most critical variables for their success is the climate, uh, is the weather. And there's something going on with the climate, Acting Deputy President. It's called climate change. Some people call it global warming. There's a lot of names for it, and it's a scientific fact that the planet is warming. And as the planet warms, we get more extremes in our weather, which presents more risk for farmers. Now, if you ask a farmer what is one of the biggest risks to their enterprises, they'll probably say in different parts of the country different things. Certainly in large parts of the country, it's drought. It's lack of rainfall. No, no, no disputes around that. We may say pests and diseases or biosecurity risks uh, in other parts of the country. Some may say heat waves. Some may say flooding. So on and so forth. Even fire is a severe risk now to many agricultural enterprises. All these things are linked to our changing climate. Yes, they've been there throughout our history, but the science is indisputable and undeniable. The variability is changing. Our ecosystems and habitats are changing. So farmers have to adapt. For a party to claim that they represent farmers in this place, the National Party, in coalition with the Liberal Party, for that party to claim they represent farmers and not have a clue on climate change. In fact, I take that back. They actually do have a clue on climate change. They don't believe it's real. They don't believe it's man-made. They don't believe that we need to act. It's a total betrayal of the Australian farming community. Farmers want climate action, and it's been great to see in recent days the farming community calling out the Liberal National Party uh, on this duplicity. Now, I would like to say today that I believe taking action on climate change is an opportunity for farmers, a significant opportunity. And I did find it very interesting this morning when I read, and of course this is, uh, this is all hearsay in the media, that uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce is interested in doing a deal with uh, Mr Morrison provided farmers get paid for taking climate action. So I would like to talk about an initiative that the Greens and Labor government brought in. When the carbon price was established in 2011, an offset market was simultaneously established called the Carbon Farming Initiative, which allowed land managers to secure carbon on their land and then sell those permits to the polluting entities liable to pay the carbon price. It was a way to encourage farmers and incentivise farmers to reduce Australians' emissions through financial rewards, because agriculture wasn't covered by the carbon price. In 2012, the Labor Green government agreed to amend the package to enable Australia's carbon market to link with the European Union's carbon market commencing from 1 July 2015. Had this proceeded, it would have enabled Australian farmers to turn their marginal land into more productive income-generating assets through changed agricultural practices and revegetation to earn carbon credits. During the two years of the scheme, Australian farmers and land managers produce 1.9 million tonnes of abatement worth as much as $43 million, assuming a $23 carbon price. However, once the Abbott LNP government uh, pulled the package and cancelled climate action, as they did right across the board, the opportunity for farmers for export revenues was removed. Now, we've done a, an analysis that the actual total cost of farmers had this uh, carbon farming initiative proceeded is approximately $12.4 billion over the last five years. And we know the EU 
have put this back on the table in our negotiations, and the US administration is also talking about potentially penalising Australia because of our lack of carbon initiatives. And of course, if Senator, ex Senator Joyce, uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce in the other place, our Deputy Prime Minister, wants a good scheme, wants a good initiative, he has to look no further than this carbon farming initiative, because we could easily bring it back. Uh, in fact, that's something I think we should do, and then maybe we can have this debate about how we can turn uh, climate action into a significant uh, opportunity for farmers. I think it's also worth talking about the costs of inaction, the costs of political inaction. Uh, Acting Deputy President, every environmental problem Every environmental problem we encounter is first and foremost a political problem. It might come from a business activity, it might come uh, from a business decision, it can come from a whole range of things, but it is the role of government. It is the role of government. It shows us how much you don't understand, Senator Scar. If the natural events linked to climate change and rising emissions, that's come from a business activity. A natural event like an extreme weather event has come from rising emissions. It's called global warming, which comes from a business activity, just to reinforce that for your, for your benefit. Governments have a role to price externalities. Governments have a role to regulate business decisions that cause environmental problems. I challenge you to find one that doesn't have its source in economic or business activity. And if it's a government's role to solve these problems, if it's a government's role to solve these problems, then that's what we need to do, and that's not what we're doing. This government has been in place now for nine years and has had no policy on climate change, no policy at all, and it shows. As we saw with the UNESCO yesterday, uh, it's been recognised by the world that Australia has a lot more to contribute in the global leadership uh, arena of climate change acting on emissions, acting on uh, stopping fossil fuel projects, acting on having binding targets, not only for 2050, weak 2050 targets, but for 2030. And coming up with unicorn technologies and delaying tactics and distracting tactics is not going to get the job done. It's what we've seen for the last decade. It's simply unacceptable to go down this road. And the people who will, be, will suffer the most are farmers, Senator. acting deputy president. Senator Dale. Senator Thank you, Mr. Look, I rise to make my contribution on this debate too. And I want to go back a couple of steps. And I want to go back a couple of steps to a couple of weeks ago when the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, was off to visit the Queen in London and he was on his world tour and he was doing some G7 stuff and off he went. And he gets to London and then uh, we, we saw that he had a large entourage of media, a huge media contingent following him, and then there was one big blank space on the diary, which no one knew what was going on, and we saw, because the local Cornwall Bugle had leaked out the story, none of the Aussie media, uh, uh, media were supposed to know about this, but this is, see, this is typical of our Prime Minister. Our Prime Minister continually likes to keep things secret. And we know that from when Australia was on fire and we were trying to find, we as a nation were trying to find the leader, the Prime Minister, where is he? When he was holidaying in Hawaii. Now, not that that's a problem holidaying in Hawaii, but whoever thinks it's a great idea to holiday in Hawaii while the nation's on fire and then tell everyone to keep it quiet, I don't know where his political radar is. But once again, his lack of political radar, I'm talking about the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, pops up again in Cornwall, where he's off to visit some grave sites, which a lot of families in Australia would love the opportunity to go overseas, not only to visit grave sites, like Mr Morrison was finding his 37th removed great-grandfather or something I don't quite know, and I'm led to believe he didn't find anything, so he went looking for a long-lost cousin who died at birth or something, I'm not quite sure. But, hello and behold, the Cornwall Bugle took a photo of the Prime Minister actually popping in to the local Cornwall pub, having a watercress sandwich and a pint. Nothing wrong with a pint of beer. Nothing wrong with a pint of beer. Everyone's got to eat. But once again, what sort of image does that send back to Australia? What sort of... Where, 
we're in the, a, a, let alone a prime minister, even us humble uh, senators would think, where is this smart to think? Our nation has been in lockdown. Our nation has closed off overseas. Well, closed off most people going overseas and most people coming back, depending on who you are. Some people seem to get out all right and some people seem to get back in. And If you're playing sport, well, then you can run around. That doesn't matter. That's another story or, or tennis or something like that. What message did that send to the Australian public that there's our Prime Minister with his watercress sandwich and his pint wandering around a graveyard but making sure none of the Australian media knew that this was a good idea? When we have thousands of stranded Australians desperate to get back to our country, their home, Australian citizens, they can't get back here. There's many, many relatives who are desperate to come back and see family. And we all know someone. We've, we've all got all us senators and the, the, that mob on the other side have all been written to on many occasions about families being separated and not being able to get back. But our tactless uh, uh, radarless Prime Minister and God Almighty, I don't know if his advisers were pulling their hair out or they were kept in the dark too. I probably think they're good people. They just had no way. Well, he, he told them to shut up and don't say a word. Where in the hell does this all come from? A leader of a nation. So we shouldn't be surprised. Although it did raise one eyebrow with me and Senator, or the Deputy President, uh, Acting Deputy President, you and I have been through a lot of shenanigans in this bill. Not you and I personally, but we have witnessed, and if we did, I wouldn't tell anyone anyway, Deputy, Deputy President, but we have witnessed many shenanigans and disruptions and knives after dark and backstabbing and leaders falling and others rising up and careers being destroyed. We've seen many of these. But I did raise my eyebrows when I saw, well, there's the Prime Minister in London visiting the Queen and some, some rocks or something. And at the same time, tweeting out he was going to meet with the US President. And I'd be pretty proud if I was the Prime Minister having a one-on-one -on -one with the US President. And lo and behold, that didn't even happen. He, he ended up in a threesome. Okay, we know that, and that looked a little bit awkward. But that's when it all started to unfold. When all of a sudden the Prime Minister, I think uh, Prime Minister of London, England, uh, 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 Mr Johnson, uh, with Mr Biden, they were congratulating Mr Morrison on heading towards uh, net zero uh, reductions by 2050. And <laughs> didn't the hand grenades go off back here? <laughs> oh my goodness me, didn't they go off? And then I wake up to Phil Curry's story on the Fin Review on Saturday. It's on. Here we go again. And even I thought we were over this at least for at least for a couple of years, but no, it was on again. We've got a couple of civil wars going on in this building. We've got civil war going on between the Nats and the Libs, and that's always been going on. We have a civil war going on between the Nats and the Nats. I, <laughs> I said to the caravan, I, I really want to hear it. what there's no civil war going on in between the, in the Nats at the moment. No, that's why there's people out there, dead men walking, I think was the story and what goes on. And we see the rise to the top again. Here comes Mr Joyce. He's back. OK, Mr Joyce is back. Mr Joyce, the champion of the farmers. Well, where do I start? So we know, we know very clear where the gnats where the gnats are on Mr um, uh, Morrison's view of net, uh, net zero carbon by uh, 2050. We know where we are. He's made it quite clear. We've had all the lieutenants out there, Mr Pitt, Ms. Uh, Senator McKenzie, out there on the after dark stuff on Sky and all that, sending out one hell of a kaboom to the uh, Prime Minister when he was offshore. But I must ask this question, and, and I have been on the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee for actually my anniversary comes up next week, 16 years, and I'm pretty happy to say, and I've been the chair of that 13 years, and uh, I've talked to a few farmers, and I don't pretend that I'm a farmer, I'm not. But I, I, I think to myself, well, I know last week I was doing a dairy inquiry on Friday, and the uh, red meat industry and the, uh, were all there, and they're talking about how we got to get to net zero. We know the National Farmers Federation's um, stance on net zero. This is the National Farmers Federation, who I would have thought, well, I know they joined at the hip with the Nats. Well, they were until I until the, I heard the latest. But I just want to share with the Senate, if I can, please, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And you know more about farming. You've forgotten more about farming than I'll ever know. I give you that. But this is the the 
the NFF's media release of the 20th of, of August 2020. And, and they say the heading is net, NFF calls for net carbon zero by 2050. And uh, this is it. Australia's peak farm body has thrown its weight behind an aspirational economy-wide target of net carbon zero by 2050. Members of the National Farmers Federation have voted in favour of the landmark policy, which includes strict caveats regarding fair implementation and economic viability and an online meeting this month. NFF President Fiona Simpson said the strengthening of the NFF's climate goals was a strong reminder of the role farmers already played in tackling emissions. And she quotes, or I'll quote what she says, Australia's farm sector continues to be a leader in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Ms Simpson goes on to say in the past decade, <coughs> excuse me, Agriculture has consistently reduced its emissions intensity and net emissions within the Australian economy. The red meat sector, for example, has a target of being carbon neutral by 2030 and is already making great headway on research and new technologies that will enable that transformation. However, despite progress in the farm sector, Ms Simpson warned the goal of and the, 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 UN, the number is NCZ, well, anyway, you know what it is, it's the, the call for net carbon zero, would be just an aspiration without ongoing innovation and policy support. She goes on to say, we need to equip farmers with far better tools for evaluating and reporting on individual business emissions, Ms Simpson said. Then she says, this will require new investment in research and development so we have more robust baseline information, new pathways to reduce emissions and fewer barriers uh, to participation in carbon markets. Action on climate change is a central part of the NFF's 2030 roadmap, which sets a vision for agriculture to reach $100 billion in farm gate output by 2030. And the last statement is there is a huge potential for Australia to be a global leader in low emissions agriculture. Now, my question here is I would love to hear the Nats explain to the Senate and to the people of Australia that if you represent the farmers and rural and regional Australia, um, you are joined at the hip with, well, you're joined at the hip with a couple. You've got the National Farmers Federation glued this side. You've got the Australian Trucking Association, who, who, who I'm not part of, glued on the other side of your hip because that's been the dumping ground for failed gnats for years. How does or how do you explain the Absolute difference in opinions on net zero by 2020. I'm dying to see the Nats and the Libs go to an election with two different, completely different climate policies. Senator Stirl, please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. I thank Senator Stirl very much for that, uh, Dorothy Dixer. Um, uh, I will have about 10 minutes to explain why net zero emissions would be a very bad deal for our nation's farmers and especially for our rural communities. And they, and those conclusions that I make no problem, thank you. Uh, are just from very simple calculations and estimates from bodies like the CSIRO uh, and other uh, respected economic modelling. Uh, I want to start, though, by the fact that often with these motions, when, uh, when there is a quote from somebody, um, you could almost guarantee that that's a a misleading quote, or at least a, a quote which a lot of detail has been left off. And I, I know that in this case because while the motion identifies the culprit as Barnaby Joyce with this quote, in fact the words were jointly authored by myself and Barnaby in an opinion piece in February this year in The Australian, where we do say we did say the Nationals have always been against a net zero emissions target, a target we've always been against, uh, stress, and, uh, and uh, we could not credibly support, uh, represent farmers if we would adopt such a target. The paragraph just preceding that quote, which wasn't included in the motion for reasons that will become obvious, the paragraph before that said in our opinion piece, the problem is that cows and sheep have a tendency to burp and fart large amounts of methane, a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Every cow emits about 2,300 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent gases a year. The CSIRO estimated last year that to reach net zero emissions, 
We would need to start with a carbon price of $30 a tonne now. Even a relatively small cattle producer runs about 1,000 head. So they would be up for a $70,000 a year cost under a net zero policy. Now those that do advocate for net zero emissions do so quite often quite glibly. Uh, there's a lot of hand waving. It's going to great benefits. There's going to be lots of jobs. There's not a lot of detail about exactly what net zero emissions mean or how we're going to get there, but it's all going to be fantastic. Just believe me. It is the pitch from those pushing net zero emissions is the policy equivalent of the steak knife salesman on late night TV. There's always more. There's always more. It's always fantastic. It's so good. It's so good. It can hardly be true because it's not true. It's not true. Those figures I just quoted, they're just the facts. How will, how will farmers pay the 2.3 tonnes per head per year that they, their cows emit right now? How will they pay for that? Because what we didn't quote in that op ed is actually the CSIRO and their modelling. It starts at $30 a tonne. It starts at $30 a tonne. It grows to $250 a tonne uh, by the end uh, of 2050. So Senator Stirlow there spent 10 minutes talking, oh, we'll get, to, we'll get to net zero emissions by 2050. Now NFF says it's fine, it's fine, fine. I don't think he knows these things. He doesn't know. He said he wasn't a farmer. He doesn't know how much, it, how much a cow emits. He doesn't know the fact that if, you, if you're going to charge someone over $200 a tonne uh, for, the, for the methane that comes out the front end of a cow, you are then going to be up for that thousand a head cattle farmer. They'll be up for $400,000 a year. $400,000 a year. What are they going to do? What are they going to do, Senator Stirl? How's that going to work? Who's going to pay for that? Well, it will be paid for uh, at, your, at the self-service checkout at Woolies. When you go there and, and swipe your rump steak and it comes up, You'll have to put your pin in. You'll have to put your pin in because it's going to be over 100 bucks. It's going to be over 100 bucks. Every shop will be over 100 dollars, and you, you won't be getting any free transaction approved. That's what will happen to Australian consumers if this comes off on the CSIRO's own figures. They're the CSIRO's figures. And look, worse, worse than this, worse than this. That's the impact on farming. But of course, of course, such a policy to get rid of emissions from our economy, from our coal industries, from our gas industries, from our factories which we want to get more back, we want to get manufacturing back, don't we? They're all going to be paying for it. They're all going to be paying for it. And, and there's been no, absolutely no detailed economic modelling put before the Australian people about those costs. The CSRO did some costs on what the carbon prices would be, but not on, not on a proper modelling on what the impact on jobs, what the impact on uh, wages would be to the Australian economy. In fairness, the New Zealand government did do, they did do such modelling. They did a computable general equilibrium modelling, which has its flaws, but it gives you a broad estimate. They did some modelling on what it would mean to the New Zealand economy if they were to reach net zero emissions by 2050. They made some pretty outlandish assumptions about um, some technology being able to halve methane emissions from sheep and electric. I think all the electric vehicle fleet, half the freight fleet, was going to be electric. But anyway, they made some some pretty generous assumptions. But even with those assumptions in the modelling, <laughs> their modelling showed that by 2050 the New Zealand economy would be 10 to 20 per cent smaller, 10 to 20 per cent smaller, a fifth potentially smaller uh, than today, that there would be a 2 to 4 per cent loss of jobs in New Zealand as a result of net zero emissions. Now, if you translate that to Australia, if a 4 per cent loss in employment in Australia, that would be 400,000 people. So before we just glibly roll off the talking points that all of you get in your morning inbox that net zero emissions is going to create jobs, it's going to be great. Just remember that the respectable, detailed modelling that's been done would show that, five, uh, that the half a million odd Australians would lose their jobs. Would lose their jobs. Now, after that modelling, guess what? After that modelling was, was conducted, the New Zealand government exempted agriculture from their target. And in New Zealand, in New Zealand, half their emissions come from agriculture. <laughs> So their net zero emissions target is literally half pregnant. Half of it doesn't even exist because they're not even going to try and reduce emissions in half their economy. Yeah. I mean, this is why this is all a marketing pitch. Not real. It's not pragmatic. And if there's one thing I know about people in the bush and the country is they hate people with spin. They can see through this. They can see through this from a million miles away. That this is all, and you're better than this, Senator Subsell, you're much better than this. This is all slick marketing spin from corporate offices in Sydney because the people that will be make money out of net zero emissions, the people who really make money, will be those bankers in Sydney. They're loving it. 
They're loving it. Why did the Australian Financial Review have five stories on Tuesday morning bemoaning the fact that Barnaby Joyce was back, bemoaning the fact that net zero emissions might not come in? Why would the Financial Review be upset about that? Because our financial executives stand to make a lot of money out of net zero emissions. Because you have to define net zero, you have to create certificates, you have to trade them. And that's where the bankers make a lot of money. Good luck to them. It's a career. It's a career. But that's not what I want for our country. What I want for our country is that we bring back manufacturing jobs in this country, that we stop getting ripped off by China and signing up to deals uh, which they don't comply with. But we do, we do. Because the other thing that other speakers here that contribute to this debate need to answer is if we do sign up to this, because the whole intent of this is to lower emissions across the world. I mean, it doesn't matter what we do so much, but I accept if the rest of the world is doing things, we've got to be a good, uh, good contributor. But the whole point is for the rest of the world to act as well. It won't mean anything if they don't. Um, if we can't answer this question, Senator Stell put a question to the Senate, answer this question. If we can't trust China to comply and cooperate with the health inspectors investigating coronavirus, how do you think we can trust them? to cooperate with the climate cops that will have to enforce any net zero emissions deal. Is that real? Are people really thinking that the Chinese Communist Party can be trusted when they say they're going to reduce emissions, going to achieve net zero emissions by 2060? Is that a real position that people are putting? Do you really believe the Chinese Communist Party when they say that? Do you really believe them when last year they installed 38 gigawatts of coal fired, new coal-fired power stations last year in China? 38 gigawatts, double our, our, our coal fleet in one year. And then, and they, and then when they go to Davos, when, when Xi Jinping goes to Davos, he'll say, I, I, I'm, I'm subscribing net zero emissions, and all these bankers who want to make money out of it, lap it up. Oh, how great. How great that China, how great that China is come and seen the light. What a load of rot. What a load of rot. We have got to make sure we are not naive as a country right now. We cannot afford it. We cannot. Maybe in previous eras we could, but unfortunately the next gener generation of Australians may face a tougher time of it than what we've all uh, been growing accustomed to in our relative prosper prosperous and peaceful era. Because we can see the threats in our region, the aggression in our region, and we need to make sure we adopt policies as a country that are made here in Australia, not made in international agreements overseas for a class of people that want to make money off trading. We need to make policies in Australia here that will bring back manufacturing jobs to this country, that will make sure that we can be a country that can defend ourselves, uh, support ourselves and not be beholden to international agreements that worked, are worked out in overseas capitals that, do, that betray the interests of the wor average working men and women of this country. That is what we need as a nation. Uh, and that is what I know Barnaby Joyce is focused on, the Nationals Party is focused on, because we will always put Australia first. In this chamber here, there are flags here that represent this country, Australia. And so in this, in this chamber here, we should pass laws that are, represent that flag and this country, not the interests of those around the rest of the world. Uh, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, if we're going to talk about division and, and dysfunction, let's talk about the real cause. It's climate change ideology. It's an appalling, unaccountable ideology. It's the ideology which insists on reducing emissions at any cost, up to and including the demise of Australia's manufacturing, resource and agricultural sectors. It's the ideology which is based on little more than computer models which have, time and time again, never panned out in reality. It's an ideology which has empowered other countries to demonise Australia and threaten its economy and its very sovereignty. And it's the ideology which has stalked the coalition and Labor who have allowed themselves to be led by the nose to abandon the farmers, the miners and the businesses of our nation. The Nationals have once again been hopelessly compromised by this ideology. Memories appear to be very short in this place. In 2019, Queensland voters were decisive in delivering the coalition another term, and they sent a clear message the Nationals, in particular, will ignore at their peril. Queensland voters rejected climate change ideology. Queensland voters rejected the instability and dysfunction it has caused in Australian governments. They are sick of the major parties playing politics with this ideology. So they are not going to look kindly on this wishy-washy, will they or won't they approach by the Nationals to net zero by 2050. Never say never, says the Minister for Agriculture about net zero. Different eyes, 
saying the returning Barnaby Joyce. Farmers need a commitment. They need the Nationals to come clean, not after a new coalition agreement, but right now. And the Nationals in support of paying farmers to not farm? What's the point of the Nationals if farmers aren't farming? They're abandoning their traditional base for a few cushy ministerial jobs. Farmers aren't going to tolerate this much longer. It's not just their livelihoods, but the life they and their families choose which are at risk. The Nationals have failed them on water reform in the Murray-Darling Basin. The Nationals failed to support the dairying industry in its crisis, and this is supposedly the party of farmers. Farmers' livelihoods and our food security must not be risked. The world's population is growing. Australia can and should play a leading role in feeding it. Our farmers are among the world's best. Yet here are the Nationals looking to tie the farmers' hands behind their backs by paying lip service to net zero. We need to let farmers do what they do best, growing quality food, looking after their land and injecting hard-earned export dollars into our economy and our rural communities. And it's so pleasing to hear Matt, Senator Canavan say, we need to get manufacturing going. That's been my saying for the last 25 years. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Mm -hmm. Senator Lyons. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, there you have it. We've just heard from uh, two senators uh, before me who are both uh, climate deniers. One of them is um, a senator who's a party uh, in government. The other is from a party that clings like a barnacle on a ship to the Liberal National Coalition. Um, and what we've seen since the return of Mr. Barnaby Joyce is um, chaos and dysfunction and nothing but looking internally. We saw a disgraceful debate in this place this morning on water. We saw the Nationals cross the floor on water yesterday. Uh, they've all been out regurgitating um, their issues about how they don't believe in the science of climate change. Well, I'm not interested in talking about the Nationals. Uh, but I do want to highlight the damage that the Morrison government, by refusing to commit to targets and by refusing to put a date on when we will um, have a proper carbon policy in this country, are damaging our country. And, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, one of the things that I do as a senator for Western Australia is I actually talk to farmers. I talk to farmers. I go out and listen to them. And they tell me. And I want to talk about a group of farmers and primary producers in Western Australia, uh, professionals and other organisations associated with primary production who are on the land and who have a view about what's happening. So I want to talk about a group who came together to form uh, a group they've called Ag Zero 2030. These are real farmers, not uh, pretend senators that we see in here who somehow uh, claim to speak for farmers. These are real farmers, real primary producers, professionals associated uh, with primary production. Ag Zero 2030. Look it up. So uh, they came together because what they want to see and their aims are to support our industry and communities to proudly and successfully adapt and thrive into the future while protecting and preserving our land and climate. Help WA play its part in global efforts to limit global heating to 1.50 per cent. Meet consumer preference. Retain market access. Retain access to capital investment. This is what farmers in Western Australia are saying, not the rubbish you, you hear from those opposite, not the rubbish, sadly, that you hear from the Morrison government. Let me just repeat those last two. Retain market access. Now, I just heard a senator in this place, a government senator, talk about uh, 400,000 jobs that are going to be lost. Here's farmers saying, actually, what we want to do through having a target on zero carbon emission is retain our markets, protect our land uh, and um, retain access to capital investment. So I'm not quite sure who the Morrison government and, in particular, the, the Nationals claim to represent. But it's certainly not these farmers in Western Australia, and it isn't, uh, it isn't primary producers. The National Farmers Federation They want to see action um, on uh, carbon. They want carbon zero, and they've put a date on it. 
But I don't know why um, the Morrison government is allowing a handful of national centres who are clearly out of touch with what farmers and primary producers want to uh, control the agenda. And we've heard the awful sorts of comments that, that they've said. Um, you know, uh, just recently, Mr. Keith Pitt and I heard this myself. Said um, he didn't think uh, the Nationals would be supportive of a net zero plan. He said, "I'd think it'd be very unsupported." That was on Monday. Well, I'm sure the farmers who I've visited uh, in Western Australia, in the Central Wheat Belt, in the Great Southern, uh, in Esperance area, are appalled. I know they're appalled when they hear that. They are out there. Um, working hard as farmers do, day in, day out, looking for support from the federal government, looking for some hope that, that their land, the work they do, is valued and that there will be real action on climate change. And they tell me over and over again how disappointed they are. And I learned from them. Um, not only did WA lose its a barley market because of the shenanigans of the Morrison government, and that's what farmers have told me. Um, but we've got farmers in Western Australia saying, "Please um, do something on climate change." Well, it will not come from the Morrison government. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Scar. Well, Mr. Acting Deputy President, Senator Lyons must be speaking to different farmers than the ones I'm speaking to, and I must say, my good friend, Mr. Keith Pitt, Mr. Keith Pitt uh, is himself a farmer is himself a farmer, so there you go. Um, a real-life farmer with a view with respect to what is responsible climate change policy. Senator Ayres made the first contribution to this debate by talking about movies. And can I tell you, Mr Acting Deputy President, listening to this debate, I can see a sequel coming. I can see a sequel coming, a sequel of the 2019 federal election. That's the movie I see coming down the road, a sequel. And let me tell you what happened in the 2019 election in my good state of Queensland. This is how the workers voted. This is how the workers voted in my good state of Queensland. In the seat of Flynn, which includes Gladstone, home of the Boyne Island smelter, and a lot of other hardcore manufacturing industries, emission intensive, the Senate vote in Flynn, Labor got 21.5%. 0.5 per cent. That's how the policies of the Labor Party resonated with the workers in the traditional, used to be, used to be a traditional Labor Party seat based around Gladstone of, of Flynn. 21.5 per cent. Let's go north to the seat of Dawson. Again, it used to be a traditional Labor Party seat. 19.5 per cent. 19.5 per cent of the vote the Labor Party got in the Senate in what was Blue Collar Heartland and Mackay, etc., 19.5 per cent of the primary vote. That's what your workers, that's what your workers think of the modern day Labor Party, which has walked away from their interests. It's walked away from their interests. And then we go to another, what used to be traditional Labor Heartland, Capricornia, based around Rockhampton. Labor Party Senate vote, 22.4 per cent. 22.4 per cent. So that's what the workers in North Queensland and Central Queensland think of the Labor Party's policies with respect to climate change. They're more interested in their jobs and the welfare and future of their towns and their families. So when Senator Ayres talks about movies, I can see a sequel coming. I can see a sequel coming. Because I tell you, I've been listening to the remarks from those opposite, the guffawing, etc., about Senator Barnaby Joyce, etc. I can tell you his message resonates. It resonates with the workers in North Queensland, Central Queensland, and areas like where my Senate office is based, in the federal seat of Blair, federal seat of Blair, home to many ex-coal mine workers, home to many ex-workers from railway workshops, proud people, blue-collar workers, and a lot of those workers don't identify with the modern-day Labor Party and their right not to identify with the modern-day Labor Party. I'd love to hear what the Acting Deputy President, Senator Stirl, says uh, behind closed doors in Labor Party meetings. There was a lot of discussion about what happens in, in my party's uh, party room meeting earlier today. I'd love to be on the, a fly on the wall 
when Senator Stirl no, no doubt speaks a lot of common sense, a lot of common sense behind closed doors about how important it is that the Labor Party stay true to its worker heritage. But it started to move away from that heritage. The person, the person who's prepared to come out and speak publicly, of course, is Joel Fitzgibbon. Joel Fitzgibbon in the Hunter. And what did he say? What did he say just yesterday? in relation to what the Labor Party did last night in this place, voting against a number of sensible reforms which would allow money to be spent on clean technology, including carbon capture and storage, etc. This is what Joel Fitzgibbon said, and I quote from an article by David Crowe, June 23, in the Sydney Morning Herald, and I quote from uh, Mr Fitzgibbon. We shouldn't be picky. It's not just about windmills and solar panels, he told radio station 2GB. It's about all sorts of other innovation, including electoral vehicle charging station rollouts, improving the efficiency of heavy vehicles, and capturing the carbon so that we can use capturing the carbon so that we can use gas and coal to generate energy without polluting the atmosphere. All these things will make a contribution, and we shouldn't be fighting about which innovations we choose. We should be using as many of them as we can. Mr Fitzgibbon went further in the interview by saying it was, and I quote, and I want to give the, I want to give the last word in this debate to Mr Joel Fitzgibbon of the Labor Party of the great Hunter region of this country. He said it's ideological craziness for Labor to oppose those changes. Thank you, Senator Scully. The time has expired. Uh, now, um, the time for discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents, and the documents are listed on page five of today's order of business. Is anybody seeking recall? Senator Walsh? Uh, yes, thank you. I move that the Senate take note of document number one, Fair Work Act 2009 quarterly reports, and seek leave to continue my remarks. So the question is that the Senate take note. Sorry. I should seek is leave granted first? Thank you. It is granted. Now, the question. Too easy. Are there any other speakers? Senator Wish Wilson? Uh, yes. uh, Acting Deputy President, um, I'd like to take note of the Auditor General's report for 2021, uh, number 45, Performance Audit Management of Commonwealth Fisheries, Australian Fisheries Management Authority, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave, is leave, gra leave is granted. Thank you. If there are no other. Senator seeking the call. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I, I would like to take note of uh, document number five under government documents, table 22nd of June 2021, Recycling and Waste Reduction Act 2020, um, the Minister's priority list. Um, I would like to speak on this, uh, this for a few minutes. Um, just to remind senators, uh, just before we broke uh, for Christmas last year, in the very last week, the government brought forward legislation uh, called their Waste and Recycling Reduction Bill, um, and it was uh, heralded as being the biggest reform to the waste and recycling sector in a decade. Uh, the Greens put up two significant amendments to that bill, um, which were backed in by um, millions of Australians, uh, and that was to ban prob problematic single-use plastics. Uh, as well as to set binding targets for industry in packaging to meet by 2025. Uh, the packaging targets um, under the Australian Packaging Covenant are voluntary, uh, and as was pointed out in this place by many speakers, uh, the Packaging Covenant in its previous iterations had never met these targets. Uh, they were happy to say to the committee in evidence that they believe they would meet their 2025 targets, so we uh, wanted to mandate those targets in here. Now, uh, sadly, the Senate was tied. Uh, One Nation, uh, as they often do, flipped at the last minute and we weren't able to amend that bill and send it back to the other place. But I just wanted to highlight that I was pleased that while the, uh, one of the elements of, of this document under the minister's priority list is uh, a, an addition of um, uh, problematic single-use plastics, or what's deemed problematic and unnecessary single-use plastics have been added to the minister's product list. Um, this is still a voluntary 
agreement. This, the architecture, the framework that we're dealing with here is that the minister is essentially giving notice that this is a priority packaging list that they would like to see dealt with by the industry. They would like to see, for example, in this case, um, if you look at the action under actions recommended, a nationally coordinated industry phase out uh, in place by June, December 2022 uh, for the following problematic and unnecessary single use plastics through elimination, redesign, replacement and innovation. Uh, I won't go through that in detail, but there's obviously polystyrene, EPS loose packaging there. There's packaging that's not certified compostable, including uh, you know, landfill degradable or other claimed degradable plastics, EPS consumer food, beverage service containers and polyvinyl chloride, um, PVC. Uh, this is a great start uh, if this is a genuine attempt uh, in collaboration with the packaging industry to phase out these single-use plastics. I mean, the thing about these problematic plastics is no one wants them. The recycling industry don't want them because they can't do anything with them. They contaminate waste streams and make it inefficient and uneconomic. Um, the industry uh, don't necessarily want to produce them. Um, they're good for nothing, really. Uh, we don't need them. So it would be great to see uh, this phased out. Um, Acting Deputy President, uh, your state's one of the many states that have done the right thing and introduced state-based laws to uh, phase out single-use plastics. Uh, sadly, my state hasn't done that yet, Tasmania, the so-called clean, green and clever state. Um, but other states have. South Australia's uh, very advanced on this. Queensland's well underway. New South Wales are looking at phasing, certain, phasing out certain single-use plastics. Uh, and that's a good start. It may well be that the states beat the Commonwealth to this game. And I've just a little bit of cynicism. I'm trying to be very optimistic and positive here. Uh, this has appeared once the states have done a lot of the groundwork, but nevertheless, it is good to see the federal government is actually uh, elevating the priority of phasing out single-use plastics. They are, without a doubt, the biggest scourge in our ration. These kind of products are what we find uh, when we clean beaches. It's what we find in our rivers and streams. It's what we that they very quickly break down into microplastics, which we're finding all through the ocean, including in seafood. Um, it doesn't matter what your political colour, what age you are, what your demographic is, everybody wants to get rid of this rubbish. Right? It's just not doing anyone any good. Uh, and we can do better. Right? There's better alternatives out there. That's more jobs in research and development to produce biodegradable products, properly biodegradable, properly compostable products. Um, they might be a little bit more expensive at the moment. Once they're mass-produced, um, they'll be a lot cheaper. But I would always say to Australians to try and refuse plastics in the first place, try and reuse them as much as you can before you buy any of these kind of things. So um, good congratulations to the government for actually elevating, uh, removing some single-use plastics. There are many others we deem necessary to remove, especially ones we do find in the ocean that aren't on this list, but uh, it is a good start. And, uh, Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Are there any other senators seeking the call? If not, we shall now move to uh, item 14, tabling consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I present additional information received by the Community Affairs Reference Committee on its inquiry into fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Senator Walsh. On behalf of the chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, I present Scrutiny Digest 9 of 2021. Thank you. Are there any, any other senators seeking to call? If not, uh, yes, Senator Davey. Uh, on behalf of the chair of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee, Senator Ebetz, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the customs amendment banning goods produced by Uyghur Forced Labor Bill 2020. Thank you. Senator Davey. Uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, I present the report of the committee on COVID-19 criminal activity and law enforcement together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings additional information and submissions. Thank you. Senator Davey. And on behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's third report of 2021 concerning the North Queensland Midterm Refresh Program. Thank you. And do you have one more? 
I present the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's Annual Report for 2020, and I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Right. Thank you. And Senator Davey. I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 9 of 2021 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, and I move that the Senate take note of report and I seek leave to continue my remarks. And finally, Senator Davey. No more. Okay. In that case, we shall move. Are you sure there's not one more? Something about pet food? No, it's coming. No. Thanks very much. Okay. Are there any ministerial statements, Minister? I tabled documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the Australian Animal Welfare Standards and Guidelines and COVID-19 vaccine allocations. Thank, Thank you. Do you have to call, Minister? I table a response to a question taken on notice during question time on the 21st of June 2021, asked by Senator Seward, relating to the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, and seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Thank leave you. is granted. Senator McAllister. I oh, know. You're just having a chat with Senator Roberts? Sorry. Okay. Uh, that, Senator Seward. Um, I would like to take note of the response to my question and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was distracted. Sorry. Um, is leave granted? Is leave granted? Sorry, Senator Seward. Leave is granted. Senator, we're in uh, government documents and responses. Oh no, we've moved. Sorry, Senator. Yeah. Senator Fear of Anti Wells. Yeah. Working on the tabling of both the monitor uh, and the annual report of the delegated legislation committee. Senator Sudo shall seek some guidance from the clerk. I would put it to the chamber that uh, um, is it in the Senate's desire to give Senator Fear of anti Wells the opportunity to go back a couple of steps and speak to the report. Agreed? Those of the opinion say aye, against no, done, Senator Fear of anti Wells. Thank you. Um, I will uh, speak first to the delegated uh, legislation monitor of 2021. Uh, this monitor includes details of the committee's scrutiny concerns regarding instruments across a number of portfolios, including instruments relating to paid parental leave, the regulation of bankruptcies and the provision of funding to airlines to enable them to offer discounted fares in response to the COVID pandemic. These are significant issues which very much represent the work that the committee undertakes every day. In this context, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Senate for agreeing last week to the adoption of three vital recommendations made as part of the committee's inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. The Senate's action in this uh, regard is timely. Delegated legislation now constitutes about half the law of the Commonwealth by volume. There are over 31,000 legislative instruments currently in force, making up the law on minor and substantial matters in every field. Delegated legislation does not only deal with matters that are technical and administrative, it is increasingly used to legislate matters of policy significance. While there may be good reasons to delegate legislative power to the executive, there are very few good reasons to exempt such legislation from disallowance. The resolutions agreed to last week go to the heart of the role of the parliament in a constitutional democracy. The constitution vests Commonwealth legislative power in the federal parliament. Parliament's fundamental role is to legislate on behalf of the people. Our system of representative and responsible government established by the Constitution requires the Parliament to hold the executive government to account. In light of this, allowing for legislative powers to be delegated to the executive would seem to be a violation of the principle of the separation of powers. This principle is preserved, however, by the disallowance mechanism. Disallowance is not just a technical process. It is the means by which this chamber retains oversight of delegated legislative power and thus fulfils its role under the Constitution. 
It is important to emphasise that an exemption from disallowance means the parliament does not have the opportunity to scrutinise the laws once they are made by the executive. It also means the parliament does not have the power to prevent legislative power being exercised in a manner not foreseen or not provided for in the primary legislation or in a way that might be considered undesirable. With this background in mind, Resolution 1, agreed to last week in the Senate, sends a strong message to ministers and the bureaucracy that there are only very limited circumstances in which it might be appropriate to exempt an instrument from disallowance. Any claims to exempt exceptional circumstances cannot be accepted at face value or rely on provisions in regulation. The committee considers that there must be rigorous scrutiny of these claims and that such claims will only be justified in rare cases. Resolution 2 requires the Attorney-General to table a statement setting out the rationale for current exemptions from disallowance. In its final inquiry report, the committee discussed grounds upon which it might be appropriate to exempt delegated legislation from disallowance. The committee provided guidance to the effect that exemptions from disallowance can only be justified in exceptional circumstances and for the purpose of technical or administrative matters. But even if an instrument satisfies these categories, it must also not adversely affect rights, liberties, duties and obligations, and should only be exempt if there is an alternative form of accountability. When presenting the final report to the Senate, I remarked that the grounds upon which exemptions from disallowance may be acceptable are vanishing small. The view of the committee has certainly not changed. In coming to this conclusion, the committee considered a range of rationales that have previously been permitted by the parliament when it has passed bills exempting delegated legislation from disallowance. The final report found the majority could not be supported and should not continue to be accepted by the parliament. Of particular concern to the committee is the Legislation Exemptions and Other Matters Regulation 2015, which I will refer to as the 2015 regulation. This regulation exempts vast amounts of delegated legislation from disallowance, regardless of whether there are grounds or even a clear need for such an exemption. The 2015 regulation itself is not only an instrument that is exempt from sunsetting, and hence the parliament will not have the opportunity to reconsider uh, its content, but it is also an exemplar of the failure of the parliament to take seriously its scrutiny functions over many years. During the inquiry, the committee heard from many eminent constitutional scholars. The Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies argued delegated legislation exempted from disallowance through the 2015 regulation is unconstitutional because the parliament is no longer making legislation. It has abdicated rather than exercised its legislative power. The government has previously acknowledged that exemptions from disallowance should only be made in very limited circumstances. The continued use of the 2015 regulation to provide for a wide range of exemptions from disallowance is therefore inconsistent with the government's expressed view. The committee has provided clear guidance on the very limited grounds upon which an exemption from disallowance may be justified. Resolution 2, requiring the Attorney-General to table a statement setting out the rationale for current exemptions from disallowance will allow the parliament to consider whether there are genuinely exceptional circumstances to justify the significant number of current exemptions. I now turn to resolution three. Without disallowance, the only way the parliament can cease an instrument is by repealing or amending the enabling legislation. However, having the ability to overturn the enabling legislation is not sufficient. We must not only retain control over the legislative power we delegate to the government, but also be in a position to supervise the exercise of this delegated power in order to effectively exercise this control. As acknowledged by Professor Anne Toomey, the only systemic way for delegated legislation to be scrutinised is through parliamentary committees. If delegated legislation is not scrutinised, the parliament may be abdicating its power because it simply does not know how legislative power is being exercised. This is totally unacceptable. The parliament must be informed, and to be informed, we must retain a level of supervision over the exercise of legislative power delegated to the executive. Since its establishment in 1932, the committee has been limited by the standing orders to scrutinise disallowable legislative instruments. 
Accordingly, the committee recommended that Standing Order 23 be amended to allow the committee to scrutinise legislative instruments exempt from disallowance. These amendments to the standing orders agreed to last week will go some way to ensuring the parliament can, fulfill, can continue to fulfil its constitutionally mandated function. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our secretary, Glenn Ryle, and all his team, as well as our legal adviser, Professor Andrew Edgar, for all their hard work. Can I also acknowledge and thank committee members, Deputy Chair Kim Carr and Senators Raffaele Ciccone, Perrin Davey, Nita Green and Paul Scar for their support and commitment to the importance of our role as parliamentarians. I also place on record my thanks to the former chair, John Wacker Williams, and senators who served on the committee with him, who started this journey quite some years ago. When we sit in this place, we are not just politicians, we are parliamentarians. We are responsible to our constituents to scrutinise all legislation that comes before us. If we fail to recognise this responsibility and act accordingly, we undermine the compact upon which representative democracy rests for its legitimacy. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor 9 of 2021 to the Senate. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, with leave, uh, I also um, wish to speak on the annual report of the Delegated Legislation Committee. Is leave granted? Seeing no objection, leave is granted. Thank so, you. Anti -wills. I speak uh, on the tabling of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee Annual Report 2020. For almost 90 years, the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee has operated on a genuinely non-partisan basis to scrutinise delegated legislation against the technical scrutiny principles set out in Standing Order 23. In doing so, the committee plays an essential role in ensuring, on behalf of the Senate, that executive-made laws comply with the fundamental principles of the separation of powers and the rule of law. The 2020 annual report documents a significant year in the committee's history. In 2020, the committee began examining instruments in accordance with new scrutiny principles as agreed by the Senate in December 2019. As part of its regular scrutiny work, the committee examined uh, 1,194 disallowable legislative instruments in 14 delegated legislation monitors. Approximately 20 per cent of these instruments raised technical scrutiny concerns. In line with the committee's new work practices, the committee secretariat has begun seeking information directly from agencies in order to assist the committee in determining whether it is necessary to address the issue with the relevant minister. This two-streamed approach has enabled the committee to focus its attention on the most significant scrutiny issues raised at the ministerial level, while allowing other issues to be efficiently resolved at the agency level. The majority of the concerns raised by the committee at the ministerial level related to matters more appropriate for parliamentary enactment and restrictions on parliamentary oversight. These instruments often modified the operation of or provided an exemption to primary legislation. The committee has a long-standing concern that such significant matters should be included in primary legislation, which is subject to a greater level of parliamentary oversight rather than in delegated legislation. In particular, since October 2020, the committee has been engaging with the Treasurer in relation to the significant number of Treasury portfolio instruments, particularly instruments made by ASIC, which modify or exempt person or entities, persons or entities from the operation of primary legislation. I acknowledge that the Treasurer is engaging with the committee on an ongoing basis to resolve the committee's concerns. I note also that this is a systemic concern that the committee will continue to raise in the future. In addition to its regular scrutiny work, the annual report highlights the committee's inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. The committee's decision to undertake this inquiry was based on three principal factors. The committee's 2019 inquiry into parliamentary scrutiny of delegated legislation, the increasing proportion of delegated legislation exempt from disallowance, and the use of delegated legislation to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Increasing amounts of delegated legislation which are exempt from disallowance have been made in recent years. For example, in 2020, 17.4 per cent of delegated legislation made was exempt from disallowance. The committee will continue to monitor this concerning issue into the future, particularly under its new power to examine instruments which are exempt from disallowance. 
The committee made 18 recommendations in its interim report, which was tabled in December 2020. These recommendations are aimed at improving parliamentary oversight of delegated legislation in times of emergency. In making these recommendations, the committee noted that its concerns about parliamentary oversight of delegated legislation made during emergencies are not limited to the COVID-19 limited to the COVID-19 emergency, nor the actions of any particular government. Rather, the committee considers that parliament and governments of all political persuasions have contributed to a system of laws, procedures and practices which diminish parliament's capacity to oversee executive law making. The committee has continued this important work into 2021, tabling its final inquiry report earlier this year. That report will be discussed in the 2021 annual report. I take this opportunity to draw to the Chamber's attention the fact that the government's response to the interim report is now overdue by several months. The committee is concerned that this is contrary to Senate Procedural Resolution 44, which requires the government to table a response to committee reports within three months. I now turn to another aspect of the committee's new practices, the conduct of private briefings with ministers and officials. In 2020, this proved to be a particularly effective means of resolving the committee's technical scrutiny concerns. On 5 March 2020, the committee met with senior officials from the Australian Taxation Office and Treasury to discuss the committee's concerns about the availability of independent merits review of decisions made by the Commissioner of Taxation. Following this meeting, the government undertook to progress amendments to the Taxation Administration Act to extend the availability of merits review to decisions made under, under instruments other than regulations. I am pleased to report that this undertaking was implemented when the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 6 Bill 2020 received royal assent on 17 December 2020. I thank officials and the government for their constructive engagement with the committee on this matter. Finally, noting the committee's long-standing practice of undertaking its scrutiny in a non-partisan and consensual way, I would again like to take this opportunity to thank my current and former scrutiny committee colleagues for their commitment to the committee's important work. With these comments, I commend the committee's annual report 2020 to the Senate. Thank you. So the question is that the Senate take note of the reports of the scrutiny of the Standing Committee of Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, we now resume the um, program. I don't believe we have committee memberships, so we will move to messages. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The COVID-19 Disaster Payment Funding Arrangements Bill of 2021 and the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response Bill of 2021. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is, bills be read a first time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to make provision in relation to COVID-19 disaster payments and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to exempt these bills from the bill's cut-off order. So leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that the provisions of paragraph 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to these bills. So the question is the motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. So we've granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, the question is that the bills be read. In fact, no, not yet. And Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. So the question is that the Minister's motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Resumption of the debate be an order of the day for a later hour. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. 
No, we have more messages. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response Number 1 Bill for 2021, for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. The uh, question is, the Minister's motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. The question is, that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the National Radioactive Waste Amendment Management Amendment Site Selection Committee Fund and Other Measures Bill of 2020. If that completes messages, then Clark. Government Business Orders of the Day number 2, Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate and the amendment moved by Senator McAllister. And Senator Roberts, I believe you are in continuation. Mr Acting Deputy President, I am. To understand the National's confused and contradictory and weak behaviour over many years, let's step back to their predecessors and specifically the leader of the Nationals, former leader of the Nationals, and the Deputy Prime Minister at the time, Mr John Anderson. He was, in, he was presiding when the Water Act was passed in 2007, appeasing the globalists. He was presiding when the government, the coalition government, stole farmers' property rights and went around the Constitution to do so, appeasing the globalists and stealing from the farmers. He was presiding when the carbon trading scheme was first put out as a policy by the Liberal National Party the first policy for a carbon tax, appeasing the globalists. He was in power when the renewable energy target was introduced, when the national electricity market was introduced, when privatisation of electricity assets was stimulated, all appeasing the globalists. He was in place when they introduced carbon farming that increased neighbouring farmers' costs because of feral animals and, and weeds, appeasing the globalists. Basically, to appease the globalists, they destroyed agriculture and the regions. The common factor in all of these is a contradiction of the policy with the empirical scientific data, a contradiction of science, contradiction of reality, a contradiction of the truth. Look at coal, for example, very important to the regions. We took the lead. We were the first to push, Senator Hanson and I, first to support Adani. We went to them and asked them why they're being delayed. We were the first to push coal-fired power stations, the first to raise Collinsville. While we were doing that recently, we see the Western Australian Liberal leader, now defunct, going to policies that are more green than the Greens and more destructive than the Greens. And I put it simply, many Liberals in this place are simply Greens who favour not taxing multinationals. That's the distinction with the Greens. And the Nationals use One Nation words and policies, yet support Trent Zimmerman globalist policies. They follow the globalists. They follow the liberals. Senator Hanson and I have exposed the nationals' dishonesty and gutlessness. The core message from Barnaby Joyce, Mr Barnaby Joyce's leadership vote is that Australia, cities and regions need more One Nation MPs to continue pressuring the Nats. Without us, they out of the globalist liberals. Five years of our presence and at last they're starting to change. Remember Matthias Cormann. Senator Matthias Cormann in the Senate, when I sought the basis repeatedly for his climate and energy policies, he never replied with data, always with the term fulfilling global commitments. Now he's head of the globalist institute called the OECD. The core issue in this debacle that's become the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is shoddy governance, dishonest government, not in the national interest. That's the ultimate reality in the core. Now, good governance needs data and teeth. So let's talk about this bill specifically. 
now that we have the context. Specifically, this legislation creates the Office of the Inspector General, who will be responsible for policing, among other things, water trading. How can this officer police water trading without a register of water trades? Well, he can't. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan is being blamed for environmental damage to the Murray and Goulburn rivers caused by sending water through for water trades at times when the river would not normally host such high flows. The Barwon Darling system is perpetually dry when local First Nations people tell us reliably that the river carried flows eight years out of every ten, dry in two only out of ten. Recent critically important data shows that water inflows into the basin are only down by less than 10 per cent over the last 20 years. Entirely natural. The culprit here is not climate variability. It is much more simple. The culprit here is water mismanagement by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder. The culprit is terrible governance. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority tried to blame the environmental damage on a sand slug sedimentation from gold mining 150 years ago, making its way lazily down the river and reducing capacity. This ludicrous sand slug theory suggests normal volumes of water are causing massive damage because of the sand slug making the river more shallow, increasing water velocity and causing scouring of the banks. The information that we need to have to make better decisions is not available. So how is the Inspector General going to do his job properly is beyond me. We don't have data on how much water is being taken in illegal floodplain harvesting in northern New South Wales. It seems to be hidden. We do not have volumetric data on all the inflows into the basin or at the critical outflow point of the barrages in South Australia. We don't know how much water is being diverted away from the Coorong and Lake Albert in South Australia by the man-made drains built for that purpose. Restoring natural inflows of both surface and groundwater into the lower lakes is probably enough to complete the plan. We don't know how many water trades are conducted. We don't know how much water is transferred from one zone to another without any accuracy. So today I'm, I will be introducing an amendment to implement a requirement of the Water Act to maintain a transparent register of water trades. This provision of the Water Act has been there for 14 years. 14 years. The Council of Water Ministers approved a water trading register in 2008. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority made an attempt to introduce such a register in 2009 and by 2012 had spent $30 million and still no water tra regi trading register. Then they gave up. What a perfect example of the poor performance we have seen out of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority under both Liberal and Liberal Nationals and Labor. I hope the Inspector General can shine a light on the criminal behaviour the self-interest and the cronyism that has reduced the Basin Plan to a nonsense. A nonsense that is destroying people, communities and farming. We must get the bad players out of the Basin so that 99 per cent of honest and decent farmers, irrigators, administrators and water authority staff can get on with fixing this mess. So I welcome the government's legislation, which my amendment makes better and gives the Inspector General data and teeth. We, have, we will soon be introducing, I've already talked in, in the past about seven steps that we'll be taking to fix the Murray-Darling Basin, but we give notice that we'll be talking in the very soon, a uh, couple of next couple of months, introducing a comprehensive water policy based upon weeks of flying over the Murray-Darling Basin, followed by trips listening to people on the ground at mass community gatherings. The water register is needed. We need to give the Inspector General data and people across the basin data. A key step in restoring sovereignty in this country and good governance is this water register, and we will be supporting this bill and then moving the amendment. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr um, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, this bill is about um, implementing the, the basin plan. There's been a lot of talk about what is and isn't the the Basin Plan, uh, what is or isn't uh, included uh, in a very important document for our country. Uh, it's uh, an issue that has been of interest to Australia as long as Australia has been around. Uh, it was, there's a section in our constitution, Sex 100, that is basically there uh, because of debates at the constitutional conventions around the Murray-Darling 
Uh, that, particular, um, con that particular section of our constitution gives the states the rights to manage their own water resources, uh, and they really did manage their own water resources in an independent and uh, on uncoordinated way until uh, this process uh, was kicked off uh, by the Howard government in 2007. It took many years uh, to finalise uh, a plan for the basin. And as I say, there's a lot of talk about what that is and how it came about, but um, I was somewhat involved at the time when the plan went through. I was at the time working as uh, then Senator Barnaby Joyce, Chief of Staff, who was the Shadow Water Minister. And for all the talk this last uh, couple of days about former Senator Joyce and, and now Deputy Prime Minister Joyce, he voted for the Basin Plan. He voted for it. Um, the, the, Liberal National Parties largely voted for it. There was uh, the member for Riverina at the time, Michael McCormack, did vote against. Uh, but it was voted for and supported because of some key promises that were given at the time the plan was created. Uh, there was a lot of controversy at that time, especially when a draft of the Basin Plan proposed to take away uh, more than 6,000 gigalitres of water uh, from our nation's farmers. Yes, it was, Senator Patrick, and I'll take that interjection. Senator Patrick said it was science. Uh, yes, apparently it was. I I'm not a scientist myself. But that brings some really important point here. Uh, science is an input into the Basin Plan. It's important that the plan is based on good science. But it can't make the whole decision here because this plan is about people too. So the science is a very important input. But what happened with that draft plan is Senator Patrick is right. It was science on steroids and science unconstrained from any, any conception of what its impact would be on our nation's people and on our nation's ability to grow food. And I, what I said just then is not a distortion. It is what the Murray-Darling Basin Authority said to this chamber, to the Senate, to the Senate estimates. They said, that they had to, they had to develop a plan that just prioritised the environment, that put the environment first and didn't worry about the economic or social conditions of people. It didn't worry about the almond growers in, 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 an, in South Australia's Riverland. It didn't worry about the fruit growers in Berry and Renmark. The plan ignored them. It didn't worry about the dairy farmers around the lower lakes. It ignored them. It ignored them Order. explicitly. Senator, Senator from Canavan, the just resume your seat. Senator Patrick, when you speak in this place, you are generally given the courtesy of not being interrupted. I would ask you to extend the same courtesy to Senator Canavan. You may disagree with him. You will have an opportunity to put your point of view. Senator Canavan. Don't, don't, um, don't uh, uh, silence him on my behalf, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, he's only uh, <laughs> inspiring me further. But, but there, there are. There, there, there are people in, in Senator Patrick's uh, state of South Australia that rely on the use of water for their livelihoods, for their jobs. The town of Perry would not be there but for the irrigation that comes from the Murray-Darling. I know Senator Rustin from, from Renmark, one of the few senators in this place that, that, uh, that, that lives and, and has an office in, in, in a very remote and rural part of this country. She knows how important that irrigation, that use of water is. And we can't have a plan that is, that is only based on, on what's important for the environment alone, because people surely have to be part of our considerations. And so after that misstep, after that draft plan was, uh, was uh, distributed, it became pretty clear quickly that that was not going to be accepted uh, by the Australian people. And the Labor Party had to bring Simon Crean in to fix up the mess that I think Mr. Burke, Mr. Tony Burke at the time presided over. Mr Crane came in and he promised, he promised everybody that there would be a triple bottom line. Uh, at the time, Mr Crane promised that the economy, the society and the environment would all be considered as part of this triple bottom line, that we would balance all of these factors. That was the promise that was made to the Australian people. That was what the then Liberal and National Government and the Labor Party and others voted for. Now, the Greens weren't happy. I think they might have voted against it. They weren't happy. They wanted the 6,700. But sensible people in this place, sensible people realised that we had to have a balance, and that's why we came up with this plan. Now, there is a controversy about what exactly that meant uh, now. 
Uh, since that time, a lot of water has been recovered, and that's, cost, that's come at a great cost to many communities in the Murray-Darling Basin. We have to recognise that cost. We have to recognise that there are towns and communities in our country that have suffered greatly from the taking back of water from their towns and communities. Over 10,000 agricultural jobs have been lost as a result of the implementation of the plan. Over 5,000 have been lost in Victoria, over 3,000 lost in New South Wales and a little over 2,000 in South Australia alone. Because when things like buybacks happen, you know, it's good that the government buys back the water. There's been other processes where governments sometimes just take rights back from people. We know that. Rural Mr. Senator Macdonald knows that. We've had property rights just taken off people through government regulation, but at least it give government its due. It has paid for the water it has taken back from farmers. The problem, though, is the farmer gets paid. The farmer who sells his water gets paid a commercial rate. Indeed, some do very well out of the sales. But once they take out the agricultural production, once they're no longer growing the fruit in berry or the cotton in deer and bandy or the rice in colliamberly, once they take that out of production, suddenly there are no jobs for tractor drivers anymore. Suddenly the, the, the local feed supply and seed shop don't have the business they had before. Suddenly the tyre shop doesn't have the business before. Suddenly the cafes and restaurants and hotels don't have the business they had before. And that's when you lose all of these jobs in communities and you have that real human impact that sometimes this place people just seem to wash over and gloss over or don't want to confront. So they're the people that I know we have to put front and centre uh, when we consider balancing all of these interests. We have to make sure that we don't lose unnecessarily more and more jobs uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of, of meeting some mythical plan that never existed. And I want to pay credit to my colleagues, uh, myself, I, while I had some history in the, the Basin Plan, I, I now live in central Queensland a fair way from the Murray-Darling and <clears throat> have not been as involved in recent years, but I want to pay tribute to those of my colleagues who do live and work this issue every day of the week. I know uh, in other, the other place Mr Damien Drum and Miss Ann Webster have been working very hard on behalf of their communities in northern Victoria uh, to develop a better plan to develop, make sure we do stay true to those triple bottom line economic, social and environmental principles that were established at the part of the plan. And they have, along with colleagues here in this place and Senator McKenzie and Senator Davey, have developed sensible ideas to amend the Water Act to give effect to that initial promise to the Australian people and especially to the people of the Murray-Darling Basin. Now, centred around the controversy here. Um, in the current implementation basin plan is the so-called 450 gigalitres. So let's be very clear here that this, this 450 gigalitre figure was certainly not science. There was certainly no science behind it, as Senator Patrick liked to say before. There was absolutely none, because what happened after the Murray-Darling Basin Authority at first picked 6,750, I think it was, around that figure, when it first picked that figure, the reaction was was, was clear that that wasn't going to fly, that, that was going to destroy our ability to grow food and destroy jobs and family farmers in the Murray-Darling. So Senator Patrick was indicating he wants to still go to the 6,000 gigalitres figures, just for the record. So, so that wasn't going to work. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority came back, came back with a figure that was their estimate, their, their science, their estimate of a scientific balance of economic, social and environmental figures of 2,750. That was the amount to be recovered, 2,750. That was the one that was accepted by the then federal Labor government and what they took to the ministerial council to seek agreement. Where did this 450 come from then? It didn't come from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. It didn't come from the scientists, Senator Patrick. There was no science behind it. Where did the 450 come from? Well, well, when they took the 2,750 gigalitres to the Murray-Darling to the ministerial council, the South Australian government would not support it, and they had to do a deal. And we ended up with this figure of 450 gigalitres. Now, there was science. There was some science involved in that. Senator Patrick, it is called, it is called political science. That's what led to this figure here. It was a politically scientific figure that was come to, uh, to, to get the agreement and acceptance of the South Australian. Now, in fairness at the time to the then Labor government, the, the, the extra amount of water that was flagged uh, to potentially be taken back from farmers, taken out of food production, was always predicated on the idea that there would be no economic or social detriment to 
to Murray Darling Basin communities. So it was incumbent on, effectively on South Australia, incumbent on those implementing the plan to show and prove that if this 450 gigalitres was extra was to be acquired, it had to have no social or economic impact on basin communities. Well, clearly they haven't been able to do that. They haven't done that. As I said before, the, 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 the work of uh, agencies in this area have shown that 10,000 agricultural jobs, not just all jobs, 10,000 agricultural jobs have been lost as part of the plan, as part of getting back not all, but most of the water to get to the 2750. Right? So, the, so the test has not been met. The basin plan said if you want the extra 450 gigs, you have to not do it in a way or show you can do it in a way where there was no economic or social impact. Well, there has been an economic and social impact. There will be more of an impact if we go for this 450 gigalitres, so we should not proceed with the 450 gigalitres. And anyone who is seeking to implement the Murray Darling Basin Plan in full. Uh, should not be seeking this extra 450 gigalitres because it fails the very tests and conditions that were imposed uh, on, the, uh, on the establishment of the Basin Plan itself. Now, there are other, other things. Uh, the, the Basin Plan is incredibly complex, of course. There are other things that uh, uh, were in the plan um, that are still to be done and, and require uh, some extra work. Uh, alongside the 450 gigalitres, excuse for a lot of the figures here, there was the, the view that instead of getting to the 2,750 figure uh, with more buybacks and or more, even more infrastructure projects, which do um, uh, cost a lot of money, that what we would seek to do is, is through improvements, we would seek to get 650 gigalitres of the 2,750 from greater efficiencies, from so-called works and measures. Uh, about at the time, there was about 2,100 gigalitres recovered or, or, or soon to be recovered when the basin plan went through. And so the idea was to get the extra 650. What we'll do is we'll become more efficient at environmental watering, which made a lot of sense. Which made a lot of sense because throughout the basin plan process, there's been a lot of criticism about farmers being inefficient, a lot of undue criticism about rice and cotton being an inefficient use of water. I don't have time to rebut that particularly ridiculous claim right here, but but. There was always this idea that farmers have got to become more efficient to give more water back to the environment. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but if farmers are expected to be efficient, so should the irrigators of environmental assets too. They should have to become more efficient too, because we can't just, we shouldn't just be wasting water, sending water down the river, where if it doesn't, it doesn't hit a, an appropriate environmental target. And just as you can water a cotton paddock better, just as you can water a rice field better, you can water uh, the lakes and wetlands. Uh, and rivers as well, much, much more efficiently through, through modern technologies. And so the 650 gigalitres was gone away to be looked at to come through through investments in better environmental watering. Now what's happened is there has been 36 projects identified across the basin states, but they're not giving the water uh, that we first thought. And what we should do, and, and look, Senator Patrick is right, there's, there's been there has been mismanagement of the environmental water. There has no doubt been mismanagement of the environmental water. And, and, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know enough about the details, Senator Patrick, but I'm sure there has been some mismanagement in, in the bureaucracy as well. But all my colleagues' amendments would do would give more time and more flexibility for more projects uh, and more ideas to be brought forward. And those opposed to this amendment, what have you got to be afraid of more ideas? Why would you oppose more ideas to more efficiently improve environmental watering? What is the problem with trying to become more efficient at watering our environment? If farmers are expected to be efficient, so should the bureaucrats too. So should they too. So those who, are, who would oppose the national amendments are effectively saying the bureaucrats should be a protected species and not have the same imposed on them as our nation's farmers. Well, I think we should defend our nation's farmers. We should defend our ability to grow food. And that's why I fully support these sensible amendments brought by my national's colleagues. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. And I rise also to speak uh, to this legislation and amendments because there is probably no other topic more important in Australia than water and water management. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the Murray Darling Basin, uh, whether it's in uh, the north of Australia, uh, water is the thing that we all have the most interest in. But water management. Uh, is a very different thing 
when you're on the ground in those communities to when you're sitting uh, in an office in Canberra or possibly even trading water, where it becomes an economic asset that is uh, you know, a very highly valuable uh, product but can drive communities that rely on water assets uh, to the very brink. Now, Senator Canavan has already touched on uh, the uh, removal of farmers and uh, uh, agricultural workers from the Murray-Darling uh, as a basis or following the buybacks of water. Um, this is devastating to those communities, and this was always a central tenant of the development of the basin plan was that there wouldn't be or that there would be a measurement of socio and economic uh, impacts on Australians because there has to be a balance on these things and as we know that the best environmental outcomes are only achieved when communities are thriving and when communities are successful and so the buybacks uh, particularly in the kind of patchwork way that they have happened, the piecemeal way that they have happened, has meant that there have been some farming communities that are no longer viable or are struggling to put together the infrastructure and support that is necessary to support industries, you know, cotton gins, farming processing, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, repairs and maintenance that is needed for uh, tractors and heavy machinery as it operates in those systems. So the practical result of the discussion that we're having uh, is, has enormous impacts on farmers, and you know it is devastating to hear the impact on dairy farmers, who have not been able to. Well, and Senator Patrick, I'll take that because of course you're not interested in farmers; you're only interested in focusing on certain parts of the community. And so I'm here to talk about the people who have the least voice of all, which is the agricultural industries and farmers who grow the food and fibre, who keep our communities vibrant. Senator MacDonald, Senator MacDonald just one moment. Senator Patrick, could you please stop interjecting? Thank you. Senator uh, MacDonald. Thank you very much for that assistance, because it is important that those with the least voices, uh, somebody speaks for them. Uh, and they are doing the job that is the most important for not just Australians but a good part of the world, which is growing uh, food and fibre in the most sustainable way. And you would reflect on what's happened uh, in the cotton industry, in grains, in dairy, uh, in the beef industry, where we're seeing the kind of uh, innovation, practical development of crops and animal production that uses less water, that is uh, highly efficient. Uh, and sustainable, and we should be proud of that. We should encourage that, rather than taking away the very resource that makes them uh, possible to operate in this land. And talking to dairy farmers who have been pushed out uh, by the increasing competition for water uh, is just heartbreaking to hear of those people who, over generations, have developed uh, herds that have had to be sold off, uh, and they move out for a replacement. Crop, mostly almonds, which uh, of course make delicious uh, nut juice. Uh, that's uh, one of the real products that's now come out of the, the competition for water. But what I do want to talk about is uh, we have during estimates a whole day on water, particularly on the Murray Darling uh, Basin. And there was a lot of talk about uh, efficiencies, on farm efficiency programs. And again, I would ask people to reflect on the very practical result of being on farm and what this means. There are not just measures about usage on farm, but better efficiencies of flows, making sure that streams are clear of weeds and uh, obstacles, making sure uh, that water is allowed to run efficiently to the next point. Um, because these are the sort of very practical measures that Australian farmers are able to deliver. And it is enormously frustrating to hear people talk from uh, offices and a long way away about what is the best decision to make when it is farmers who, with their hands in, the, in, the, in our soil and Australian soil, make decisions to grow the crops that we all rely on. Senator Patrick. S Thank you very much, Chair. So, the government has 
uh, made a series of buybacks over uh, many years. And I know that when Senator Wong talks about purchasing 1,000 gigalitres from farmers, this was water purchased during the millennium drought, when farmers and communities were at their lowest, and farmers who sold their water at that time in sheer desperation were told it was the worst decision that they have ever made. How tragic for those people and their families to have to look back at a decision, at a negotiation that they had with their own government and consider that that was the worst decision that they have ever made. Because it is practical uh, efficiency, practical work for on-farm uh, decisions that end up with the best environmental outcomes that we can have. And I reflect on the work that's happened in the reef catchments, where it has been the uh, government uh, signals and messages, the provision of uh, practical um, uh, uh, programs that has allowed Queensland farmers to improve the way water runs off their land, how they apply fertilisers uh, and how they operate on their farms. In fact, that's been so efficient that it has resulted in a 25 per cent reduction in nitrogen runoff. It has resulted in the latest reef water quality report card of an A for improvement for water quality. Uh, and I think that is extraordinary and I have been disappointed that for all the rhetoric, for all the discussion about water use and water quality, there has not been one acknowledgement from those opposite, not one acknowledgement of the work for farmers, of the stress and the heartache of making uh, significant changes at significant cost to themselves. And when those changes of land management has resulted in these better outcomes and better uh, efficiencies of water, uh, and cleaner water, uh, that has not been any acknowledgement. And it's no wonder at all that farmers are really wondering what, their po what the point is. What is the very purpose of them getting up and doing the work they do because they feel that Australians no longer care, no longer even want them to be farmers. And I know that as I travel around Queensland, the number of times that farmers have ended up in tears, in tears, because they believe that nobody believes in what they do anymore. Nobody believes in them. And who's going to provide the nut juice for coffees? Who's going to provide the, uh, the plant matter for vegan food? Who is going to provide the very excellent um, vegetables and fruits and meat that Australian farmers uh, grow? Because without the sort of managed and balanced basin plan, uh, that we are trying to provide these amendments to allow for. Who is going to do that? Because farmers are certainly not. They are broken. They are broken by the crazy costs of water, uh, by the crazy uh, lack of understanding uh, from some parts of our community. So these amendments will achieve environmental outcomes as if the 450 gigalitres was in place, but the outcomes will not be measured by the use of water uh, it will be measured by practical, on-farm, on-land management changes, because we're now seeing this need for a holistic approach, a broader approach to managing the environment. I mean, a, a great example is where you can have an environmental watering event that may see the, the, the growing of a rare native grass. That grass is required by a rare native bird to lay their eggs. But unfortunately, the eggs will all be eaten by wild pests and animals if we don't fence off the grass and provide a safe nesting habitat for the birds. So we're widening the scope to fund fencing required to protect the vital bird breeding events. And I'm seeing this, this kind of fencing approach create incredible outcomes uh, in Queensland, where uh, wild dog exclusions have meant that there are koalas returning to parts of southwest Queensland that previously uh, it was blamed on tree clearing, despite there being little or no tree clearing in those regions, blamed on tree clearing when the actual culprit was the incredible number of wild dogs that were out 
uh, hunting off the land of uh, native animals. Uh, and these dogs grew. They exploded in numbers because of the number of watering points that graziers and farmers had introduced right across western Queensland in what was previously arid and semi-arid lands. And instead, there's now watering points to provide for more kangaroos. And so there is now such a number of roos, such a, a plague of roos, that if anybody has ever driven in the west after dark, you know it's not safe to do so uh, in, your, in a vehicle without a bull bar and some protection, uh, because uh, it is a threat to, to life and limb. And so the sort of projects that we're seeing, practical projects that allow uh, for native animals to, to rebound. And uh, one farmer in Western Queensland told me that the previous year he had only had 300 lambs survive. 300 lambs because he would go out night after night and see uh, lambs torn apart by dogs hunting not for food and not for survival but for the sheer pleasure of it. But after the introduction of the exclusion fencing and the removal of wild dogs hunting purely for pleasure in packs, he was able to, to mark four and a half thousand lambs. What an extraordinary change. And this is the same farmer who tells me that he now sees koalas, koalas uh, that he hasn't seen in his generation. So there, there are many ways to achieve environmental and other outcomes in the Murray-Darling Basin than just buying back water from farmers. There is efficiency of water flows, there's on-farm practices, and there is other ways to achieve the kind of environmental outcomes that everybody wants to see. You know, the disappointing part about this debate is that some would like to see uh, the world in black and white. They'd like to see bad, bad farmers, bad agriculturalists, because they couldn't possibly want to see good environmental outcomes. They couldn't possibly want to see uh, better outcomes in the place that they live, the place where they raise their own children, the place where they may have lived for generations. That couldn't be possible, could it? Because instead, you'd rather paint those people as terrible, terrible people. Uh, that lack of understanding is shocking and it's distressing. And so, I say to Senator Patrick and others here, I do speak for farmers. I do speak for people in the regions who don't have enough voices in this place. And, and that kind Senator of balance Patrick. is what we're trying to achieve through this debate. Because if we truly believe in democracy and we truly believe in good outcomes, we know that good outcomes are achieved when there is a lot of voices and there's a lot of different points of view and we can provide balance. But the sort of science uh, that some people refer to, because saying science over and over again does not actually make it real. <laughs> saying science over and over again, when I hear the Greens and Senator Patrick talk about science, they rarely refer to it back to a point. They refer to some mythical number, mythical kind of magical cloud of science that's going to support their particular uh, potentially uneducated and unuseful view. So I do stand to speak on this. <laughs> I barely feel I need to go on with the discussion that's going on in the chamber. But how healthy to see this kind of debate happening at a grassroots level, because I never interrupt Senator Patrick when he speaks, but somehow my voice is less important than his. It's very discourteous. I ask you not Senator to do Senator McDonnell, that. one moment, because I think you make a good point. Senator Patrick, could you please stop interjecting? It's not that hard. Thank you. Senator McDonald. So I would just finish on this note, that it is the exchange of good ideas, the exchange of uh, of different points of view that gives us the best outcomes for Australians right across this country. It gives us the best results, uh, not just for the environment, but also for the very important people, Australians who live in regional places. Sam, she was first. I under Thank you for just, just one.
Senator McMahon. I'm thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I rise tonight to speak on the Water Legislation Amendment, uh, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. Um, today has been a big day for water, but an even bigger day for the Basin communities. Uh, water is a shared responsibility, and water in the Murray-Darling Basin is a, a finite resource. And not only a finite resource, um, but a fluctuating resource. And um, we, we understand that well. Uh, we on this side of the chamber, in the uh, National Party and uh, the country Liberal Party that I represent, um, understand water as a resource extremely well. Um, water is essential for the health and general well-being of the basin's 2.2 million regional and rural people. 2.2 million. That is a lot of people that rely on this part of the world for their lives, for their livelihoods, for their lifestyle, and for the water that it provides and that it enables them to carry on their activities. Um, but it's not just the people that live there that are reliant on the water. Um, it's, water is, is essential to support our national economy. And the basin contributes $24 billion in agricultural earnings and about $8 billion in tourism in a normal year. Now, that, that is absolutely huge. That supports so many jobs, so many people, and the people that live there and rely on the water for their existence um, also understand the ecology of the basin. They want the basin to remain healthy because when it is healthy, um, their lifestyle, their livelihoods and uh, their production is enhanced and able to, to continue. Um, so the people that live there and rely on it do not want this compromised. Uh, and we know that the water is essential for the natural environment in the basin, including the 16 internationally significant wetlands and the endangered species that inhabit this area. We know this, and we know this in the National Party, and that is why we are fighting for a fair plan that will protect the environment and will also protect the livelihoods of the people that live there and will also protect the production, the jobs and the economy. Uh, to ensure a healthy working basin, water management is, as I've said, a shared responsibility between the Commonwealth and the basin states. A shared responsibility. We, we all have a, um, a place to play in the management of the water in the basin. And that's why we have a plan. It's why we have a basin plan, which is an agreement between all basin jurisdictions that we will manage this finite resource in a sustainable way. A sustainable way that's going to last well into the future and protect this very valuable resource. In developing this bill, the Australian government has worked closely with Basin States to ensure the bill will have their support before it commences. Uh, a really important factor is that we have worked and consulted widely with the states that this will involve. Uh, it was in September 2020 that the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, the Honourable Keith Pitt, announced the government's intention to create the Inspector General of Water Compliance role. This bill will implement the government's commitment 
to strengthen the compliance and enforcement powers in the Murray-Darling Basin. There is absolutely no point in having, having a plan and having water allocations and water rights if this is not complied with and if there is no mechanism to actually enforce uh, the details of the plan. Um, this, is, this is a fundamental reason that, that we have police in Australia. It's no point making laws if you can't enforce them. If you set a traffic limit a speeding, but there's no mechanism for com ensuring compliance and enforcement, then there's absolutely no point in setting the speed limit in the first place. You might as well say, go out and do whatever you want to do. So that, that is why um, we have commit committed to strengthen compliance and enforcement powers. Um, this will give communities the assurance they deserve regarding water management in exactly the same way that um, road users uh, are assured of the acts just, of, Senator, of Senator McMahon. Of a Senator McMahon, just one moment. Senator Thorpe, you can be quiet as well, thank you. Do not interject. Senator McMahon. Thank you. From announcement to parliament, the government has delivered this bill in just eight months. Just eight months. We've listened to what the states, to what the users, to what the communities have said, and we have come up with a bill in just eight month, months. The, this is testimony to constructive engagement with the states and opposition to deliver the accountability and integrity communities expect from their governments. This bill responds to recommendations in recent reports and reviews concerning water management in the basin. Through both the Productivity Commission's 2018 Murray-Darling Basin Plan five-year assessment inquiry report and the 2017 Murray-Darling Basin Water Compliance Review conducted by the MDBA and an independent panel, an independent panel on this review. Uh, as I've said, compliance is at the heart of a fair water sharing system. There is absolutely no point in having a system in place if we don't ensure that those that take part in it comply with it. Um, this bill will establish a strong independent regulator at the basin scale and strengthen the compliance system. This bill creates real deterrence around water theft and illegal water trading offences by establishing criminal and civil offences and strong penalties. Uh, water theft, much like stock theft, is not, uh, not a small crime. It, it is a large crime and it deeply affects uh, those who suffer at the hands of this crime. Um, I, I know from example in the Northern Territory, uh, people often refer to stock theft as potty dodging, as though it's some kind of sport. But it is not in fact a sport, it is theft. And, um, and, and theft is theft, uh, no matter what you're stealing. If someone steals your car, you suffer. If someone steals your livestock, you suffer. If someone steals your water, you suffer. So um, this is why there needs to be penalties in place that will deter people, and not only deter people, from um, committing this crime, but uh, um, penalise those who do. And importantly, this bill recognises that the states are the primary and frontline managers for water compliance, but they are sometimes unable or unwilling to act. The Commonwealth will now have appropriate powers to step in and take enforcement action on water theft. 
The Inspector General will be able to work across the whole basin to strengthen compliance, increase transparency and improve trust. And trust is a, a very important thing that people need to have in this plan and in the regulators and uh, in the compliance and enforcement process. A key priority for the Inspector General will be to encourage greater consistency in the guidelines and standards across the basin so that all water users are held to the same high bar. This role will combine, combine compliance and enforcement powers currently held by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority with the assurance role of the current interim Inspector General. In this role, the Inspector General will listen to the concerns of basin communities to ensure that their voices are heard when it comes to water compliance. The Inspector General will also undertake audits, inquiries and reports in a transparent manner. This gives communities and users confidence in the system. The Inspector General will also work with other basin states to develop more consistent standards and guidelines. Uh, as I've said, compliance is at the heart of a fair water sharing system. All participants need to know that they are being held to the same standard and that they are playing by the same rules. Consistent standards and guidelines will provide the Inspector General with a framework to evaluate the performance of basin jurisdictions, including the Commonwealth, in delivering the basin plan. This bill builds on many years of engagement with Murray-Darling Basin communities and stakeholders. The basin's 2.2 million rural and regional water users will now have the, the assurance they deserve through stronger compliance, greater accountability and strengthened integrity around basin water management. Senator Birmingham. I endorse the bill to the chamber. The question is, the bill will be read a second time. Correct. Oh, sorry, we have second reading amendments. Sorry, so have they both been moved, having just stepped in? Right, so the question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator McAllister on sheet 1340 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, I now have another second reading amendment in front of me. Has it been moved? It has. It's by Senator Hanson Young. It, has, it needs to be moved. Senator Hanson Young, could you move the amendment? I move the amendment. It is uh, on sheet 1339 moved by Senator Hanson Young. The question is that second reading amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Senator Hanson Young seeking the call. I'll... Senator Hanson Young. Sorry, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, I'll withdraw the division. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So, would you like the position noted? Right, I will note the Australian Greens voted for that amendment. So the question now is Senator Patrick. I'd like to be recorded as voting for that amendment. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So recorded. The question, Senator McAllister. I would similarly like to have the Labor Party's uh, support for the Senator Hanson Young's amendment recorded. So recorded. The question is now that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator, I'll call the clerk first. A bill for an act to amend the Water Act 2007 and the Basin Plan 2012 and for related purposes. Now, I need a minister to move the speech or I have to vacate the chair. 
So, Senator, Senator Birmingham. Uh, unless there's another matter before the chair that I can chair, I have to vacate the chair because we'll be moving into. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, to, to facilitate the chamber in the time that we have, uh, can I move that the debate be adjourned? Thank you, Senator. We haven't entered the committee stage yet, so I'm going to call the minister on a procedural matter. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Birmingham. Yeah, I'm, I move the debate be adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I move that the hours of meeting be 9:30 a.m. till adjournment. Uh, the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021, be called on immediately and have precedence over all other business till determined. If by 7:30 p.m. consideration of the bill is not concluded, the questions on all remaining stages be put. Uh, that uh, paragraph C, operators' limitation on debate, understanding order 142, and the question of the adjournment be proposed after consideration of the bill concludes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator O'Neill, thank you for taking the chair for the committee stage. The clerk. Government business order of the day number two, water legislation amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021, consideration and committee of the whole. Uh, is, it is, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Uh, are we there or is somebody going to jump? <laughs> Minister. So, um, uh, could I please move um, amendments one and two on sheet QL183 by leave and together. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Amendments. So, yes. Okay, Senator Patrick. Thank you. I just have one question in relation to this amendment. Uh, this this uh, uh, provides a power to compel uh, uh, documents from the states. Uh, that's my understanding. I just want to get an, an assurance from the minister that there's no intention that these powers would ever be used to pursue a, uh, a whistleblower. Minister. Thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President. Well, uh, Senator Patrick, there is no intention for these powers to be used for that purpose. The sole and express purpose of these compelling powers is to ensure that states and territories provide information to the Commonwealth in relation to the implementation and delivery of their requirements under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. I'd just like to indicate that uh, I think this is a good amendment that gives clarification because the last thing we want is whistleblowers and those who are working tirelessly uh, for transparency and improvement of management of the Murray Darling Basin to be intimidated or working in fear. I think it's absolutely important for states and territories to hand over this information, but uh, it, remain, it should be limited to that. So I uh, thank the government for putting forward this amendment. Uh, Minister, did you seek the call? No. Senator Patrick? Just for the ease of the chamber, uh, division-wise, I, on, that, on the similar basis to Senator Hanson-Young, will support this amendment. The question is that the amendments on the government amendments one and two on sheet QL183 be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator um, Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I, uh, I um, uh, move amendments one to three on sheet one two nine by uh, seven one two nine seven by leave and together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, 
the question is that the amendments on one two three on sheet one two nine seven be agreed to. Uh, Senator McAllister. Well, I do want to place on record how ridiculous this is, because this is what it looks like under the leadership of the new Deputy Prime Minister. We've got the National Party in here moving amendments to gut the Murray Basin Plan against the will of their coalition partners. The amendments before us this evening do things like take all of the science out of that part of the Act that governs a $1.7 billion fund. How disgraceful. It essentially creates the circumstance where that fund can be used for any purchase in rural Australia, exactly the kind of pork barrelling that we have seen again and again from these people. And we are in a position where we are having to gag these people because they are wasting the Senate's time, wasting time bringing on amendments that are immensely complex to an immensely complex agreement with no notice. It is disgraceful and we will not be supporting the National Party amendments. Yeah, yeah. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, the Greens won't be supporting this amendment either. This is a full blown attack on the Murray Darling Basin, on South Australia, and on anyone in this country who cares about the survival of our nation's greatest river. This is an attack from the water terrorists of the coalition, the water terrorists who sit right here and want to blow everything up under the leadership of Barnaby Joyce. Under Mr Joyce, as Deputy Prime Minister, this is what this government looks like. It's being run, hamstrung, blackmailed by the terrorists in the National Party. We will not be supporting this. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. I've just got a couple of quick questions. Clearly, I'm not uh, going to support this, uh, this full frontal attack on the, on the Basin Plan, but I just wanted to confirm with Senator Ruston, with the minister, that the position that's been adopted by the, the nationals in the chamber today, the amendments that have been moved, are not supported by, the, uh, by Minister Pitt, uh, noting that he's a cabinet member. Minister. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy Premier. Uh, Premier. <laughs> Been elevated. No, that's Madam, not me. Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, the, uh, the, the position of the government remains the same in relation to the Murray Darling Basin Plan. Um, as I said, um, in, uh, in many contributions I've made in this place over, the, over time, um, you know, this, this was an extraordinarily ambitious plan. And I think that everybody in this chamber can be extremely proud. Um, of the fact that, that everybody voted to support to make sure that we had a sustainable river system going into the future, a sustainable river system that not just supported the environment but it supported the river communities that rely on that environment. It supported our food and fibre producers, uh, but it made sure that, that it was going to be sustainable for everybody going into the, to the future. Um, it was an extraordinary ambitious plan. It still is an extraordinary ambitious plan. Um, and uh, you know we, we have already committed much and we've achieved much in the delivery of this plan, but we still have some to go. Uh, we still have uh, a period of time. This plan is not due to com be completed until 2024. Um, and, uh, the position of the government um, and the position of the minister remains that we will work tirelessly between now and 2024 so that we can achieve uh, the delivery of the Murray-Darling Payson Plan. We will not give up. We will not stop trying because we are committed to the delivery of the plan. Senator Patrick. Um, noting it's the position of the government to fully support the uh, Basin Plan to fully support the, the 450 in Section 86 AA of the Water Act. Uh, that, 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 uh, that is the position of the government. Uh, if uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Joyce, was to make a statement to the contrary, uh, noting the principles of cabinet solidarity, cabinet responsibility, where uh, if a member of the cabinet disagrees with uh, the cabinet's decisions. Will the prime minister remove him from the cabinet? Minister, thank you very much, um, acting deputy president. Um, obviously, um, the protocols and, and conventions that, uh, that run the government um, uh, remain in place, uh, and I don't think anybody's deviating from those. The question is that the amendments one to three on sheet one two nine seven be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Are those against no? no? I think the noes have it. No. 
Is a division required? Ring the bills for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that amendments one to three on sheet one two nine seven be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy for the noes and Senator Davy for the ayes.
The result of the division is eyes 7, noes 42. The matter is therefore declared in the negative. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, thank you um, uh, Madam Chair. I indicate, noting the um, amendment moved by the government, that I don't intend to move this uh, amendment. Thank you, Senator Patrick. The question is that the bill as amended be uh, Senator, Mac Senator McKenzie? No, that's Patrick's. That Senator Patrick's amendment has been withdrawn. Senator McKenzie. Sorry, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move uh, amendments one to three on sheet one three zero zero by leave and together. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. So the question is that the amendments. Sorry. Clark. Did she move? <laughs> Senator Patrick, sorry, I, I didn't. Senator Patrick, I didn't actually call you, so just wait for a moment. I was checking with the clerk. Um, if I can go back to you, Senator McKenzie, did did you move your amendments? And leave was granted. Um, thank you. Now, Senator Patrick. Thank you. I just wonder if uh, Senator McKenzie will confirm, noting her position, that. Um, <laughs> Senator Davy, Senator Davy, could you re re return to your seat? I don't believe I actually was able to understand the gist of the, the statement because it wasn't finished. I might come to you in a moment, but Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I would just like to understand, uh, in relation to Senator McKen the, the amendments moved by Senator McKenzie, noting that uh, the, uh, the amendments, amendments moved by the National Party tonight are inconsistent with the, the views of the Cabinet. Uh, is this an indication that S uh, Senator McKenzie will not be taking any Cabinet uh, position uh, in relation to the but, uh, the, uh, Senator Patrick, Morrison as Joyce much as government. I'm interested in the question you're asking, I don't believe it is, a, it, it is actually a point of order. Um, the question before us now is that the amendments on sheet 1300, uh, items 1 to 2, uh, be agreed, moved by Senator McKenzie, be agreed to. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four. one minute. One minute. Lock the doors. Uh, the question is that items one to three on sheet one three hundred be agreed to. The eyes will move to my right and the nose to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as the teller for the nose and Senator Davies as the teller for the eyes.
Senator, there being, uh, Senators, there being 41 noes and seven ayes, the matter is declared in the negative. Senators, the time allotted for the debate on the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021 has expired. In accordance with the resolution agreed to this evening, I will now put the questions on the remaining stages of the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. Uh, but first, uh, before we come to you, Senator Hanson, uh, I will now deal with the amendments circulated on the bill, starting with the government amend amendments. I understand there's a supplementary. Well, but there is indeed, I believe, a supplementary explanatory memorandum to be presented. So, Minister. My apologies, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill, or who have been moved to this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I now deal with the amendment circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Uh, the question, uh, sorry, um, did you seek the call? Uh, Minister. So, uh, Senator Roberts, because we've already moved into this phase, you don't actually have to move them. They're considered as moved as I understand from the clerk. So the question that is before us now, the amendments on uh, number one and two on sheet uh, 1200 revised be agreed to. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the amendments on sheet 1200 revised, circulated uh, and moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll just give senators uh, just a couple of seconds to get back to their uh, places, and I'll confirm with Senator Patrick that it's your intention not to proceed with your amendments. That's correct. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So, pursuant to order, I shall report the bills. So the question now is that the remaining stages of the bills be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Water Act 2007 and the Basin Plan 2012 and for related purposes. And pursuant to early, uh, earlier order, we now proceed to adjournment. And we meet again at tomorrow at 9.30. Beg your pardon? Yes. I yeah. uh, my uh, senators, just a moment. If I confuse anyone, I apologise. We are definitely moving to adjournment. Um, so I will hand over to the president. Thanks. The question is, the Senate do now adjourn, and who am I calling? I'll just check my list. <laughs> Senator Green. Mr President, Australia has the potential to be a renewable energy superpower, not only generating renewable energy but also manufacturing the components to ensure that we are world lead leaders in renewable energy production, creating thousands of jobs in the process. But right now, in Keppel Prince workers are outside in Portland, Victoria, where cheap imported wind towers are currently being unloaded to use by the federal government's Snowy Hydro 2.0 project. These wind towers will be used to generate energy for Snowy 2.0, and yet these wind turbines have been brought in from overseas to the only town in Australia that actually manufactures wind towers. How ridiculous is that? Cheap overseas wind towers are being brought in and delivered through the port in the town that already makes Australian-made wind towers. What an absolute disgrace. Keppel Prince has already said themselves that 150 jobs are on the line at its Portland factory unless the federal government brings in new laws to force companies to use local products when building new wind farms. 
At the very least, they should be stepping in to ensure that these wind farms that will be used to generate energy for the snowy hydro support local manufacturing. Keppel Prince have sacked already 15 per cent of their workforce due to this decision. These workers are standing out in the cold right now, fighting to protect their jobs and their livelihoods. The Morrison government had the opportunity to support local manufacturing workers in renewables, and they didn't. It's not that they can't do something to stop this. It is that they won't do anything to help these workers. I ask these questions directly to the officials responsible for Snowy Hydro. And do you know what they said during estimates? The CEO and managing director, Mr Broad, said, I feel for those workers. I feel for them very much. It breaks my heart to think that they can't be competitive, but I'm sure that they are not after a handout. Well, supporting local manufacturing, Australian manufacturing, is not a handout. These workers don't want a handout. They want to be supported by a government that backs them. Snowy Hydro is a government-owned entity. Its executives earn millions of dollars in bonuses and salaries every year, but they can't lift a finger to help Australian workers. There's a lot of corporate buzzwords in the Snowy Hydro supplier code of conduct. There's words like teamwork and decency and courage. But not a single word in that code directs any company that, su that supplies energy to Snowy Hydro to buy any of their content locally. And that is shameful. Labor won't stand by while these towers are paraded through Portland past the very workers who have lost their jobs because of this government's inaction. There's a wind farm in far north Queensland with 53 wind turbines, and every single one of them was manufactured overseas because this government is failing to support renewable energy. Instead of being driven through the regional towns on big trucks, these wind turbines should be being built in the regions by Aussie workers. Over the eight tired long years of the LNP government, they have turned their back on regional manufacturing. And this week, we know that real jobs are being lost, while the nationals, who supposedly support reg the regions, are fighting amongst themselves like children. Regional Queenslanders will never forget that it was the LNP that sent Queensland trains to be built overseas in India, but it was the Labor government that brought them back to Maryborough. Regional Queenslanders will never forget that it was the LNP who challenged the Australian car manufacturing in industry to leave, to go offshore and let the industry die under their watch. Regional Queenslanders will never forget that the Morrison government vetoed a wind farm in far north Queensland that would have created 250 jobs. Not, not the minister, not the local member, Mr Pitt, Mr Ench, nobody lifted a finger to make sure that these jobs would be created. And Australians will never forget that it was the LNP who were choosing right now to let wind towers from overseas drive past Australian workers in Portland. These workers from Keppel Prince deserve the support of their government. The government has continually, continually sold out manufacturing workers, and only a, a Labor um, government will deliver a manufacturing for local workers to make sure that we build uh, the renewable energy components Order. to make us Senator a world leader. Senator Green, time has expired. Senator Abetz. This month, Queensland Labor passed a fact-avoid resolution falsely accusing Israel of ethnic cleansing. This follows a resolution by Federal Labor in March to foolishly seek unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state. And in May, the Melbourne University Labor Club posted a photograph of Ms Carney, a Labor member and a Labor shadow assistant minister, taking part in a pro-Palestine rally in Melbourne. The post was taglined, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. In other words, no room for Israel. Extreme, ugly rhetoric which needs to be called out. But Labor's ugly positioning pales compared to that of its proxy get-up. Queensland Labor's resolution unsurprisingly echoed a video posted by get-up board member and Australian Palestine Advocacy Network APAN activist Sarah Saleh. 
Sarah Saleh's emotive, biased, ideologically blinded, one-sided video used the false ethnic cleansing claim and even charged Australia with bizarrely being directly complicit. Make no mistake, this five-and-a-half-minute video of vitriol was defended by none other than GetUp's national director. And there is a horrible story to this. In January 2009, Anthony Lowenstein, in a post entitled Get Up Takes on Israel Palestine, blogged how he quote, was contacted last week by Get Up to begin an online debate about this subject as a way for the group to dip its toe into the problem if or when the organisation decides to pressure the Labor government over this, the Prime Minister should be worried. End of quote. In February 2016, Palestinian activist Sarah Saleh joined the board of GetUp, which we know is a self-selecting, undemocratic club whose directors are its only real members. Saleh had endorsed many of the racist boycott divestment sanctions actions against Israel. In 2011, she signed an open letter supporting Marrickville Council's endorsement of the ugly global BDS campaign, and in 2014 she criticised Kmart for stocking SodaStream, a BDS target. Joining GetUp's board did not deter Saleh's anti-Israel BDS activity, which she has continued while simultaneously promoting her position at GetUp. At a speech to an Australians for pa Palestine symposium, the month after her appointment to the GetUp board, Saleh proclaimed that, and I quote, we must force Israel into a perennial state of existential anxiety. Really? This is truly unacceptable. Horrible, racist, and yes, sadly indicative of GetUp. The same year Sarah Saleh joined GetUp, she fronted APAN's I Vote Palestine campaign. This campaign ended up rating the Greens the best of all the parties on Palestinian issues. Saleh was involved in canvassing candidates as part of this campaign, but Saleh actually went further than APAN's I Vote Palestine campaign by contributing to and promoting a How to Vote guide for culturally and linguistically diverse communities which compared parties specifically on their support for BDS. This guide noted that, unlike Labor and the Coalition, the Greens supported a limited BDS. This was at odds with the Greens' public position because the Greens' leader, Richard Di Natale, knew the electoral poison such a position would be, and so he asserted that the Greens did not support BDS. The Freelance Guide was compiled by Sarah Saleh along with the Zahi Edries. It was, a, it was posted on an anonymous web page registered to a Zahi Edries. Could this be the same Zahi Edries who is now GetUp's legal counsel and apologist for GetUp's disgusting bird-dogging activities harassing female candidates? So we can see GetUp's anti-Israel stance has been in the works for a long time. Israel is the only true democratic country in the Middle East. She stood with us. We have stood with her. Against all the odds, Israel recently celebrated its 73rd Order. anniversary Senator of independence. Time May for the debate. Has, your contribution has expired. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. I have some bad news for people tonight. It turns out that the pandemic didn't kill the so-called culture wars that are being manufactured again by the far right in this chamber. There are a bunch of senators who will go to any lengths to appeal to the Sky News crowd. Frantic race baiting, attacks on minorities, including trans people, and many other invented threats. It seems that nothing is beyond the pale for these senators. The playbook is straightforward. Pick an issue of basic human rights or social justice and twist it to make it sound as terrifying as possible. Create fear and division. Paint the people's movements for black lives or anti-racism or LGBTQI plus rights or some sort of, as some sort of apocalyptic threat. 
This isn't just a bunch of rowdy right-wingers jumping up and down on the backbench. Just last week, government ministers in here voted for an extremely hateful One Nation motion that targeted transgender children. We should make no mistake that this was a calculated approach to rustle up anti-trans sentiment. 21 liberal and nationals disgracefully sat with One Nation and supported this attack on trans people. What strikes me about the culture wars is how frequently they are direct, directly imported from overseas, and specifically from the United States. You can draw a straight line from the right-wing establishment in the US directly to this chamber. Fox News aired 86 segments about trans people between January and March, with 15 of those stories targeting health care for trans young people. According to the US-based human rights campaign, more than 250 anti-LGBTQI bills have been introduced into state legislatures this year alone. They have said this is the worst year for LGBTIQ rights in the United States, with many of those bills targeting trans people. Brought to you in Australia, courtesy of One Nation and their LNP mates. Another obsession of the right has been critical race theory, which is a study of systemic racism. The government teaming up with One Nation this week to pass a motion to reject critical race theory in the curriculum was an absolute disgrace. It's only been a few short months since the openly racist former President Trump signed an executive order targeting critical race theory and diversity training. Legislators in at least 15 U.S. states have introduced measures this year that will prohibit the teaching of critical race theory or related concepts in school. And by one count, it's just the last, in just the last three and a half months, Fox News has mentioned critical race theory 1,300 times, 1,300 times. So it is no coincidence that Senator Hansen put up a motion to ban critical race theory in Australian schools. It was no coincidence that we saw Senator Stoker attempt to use her new position as Assistant Attorney General to interfere in the Human Rights Commission's anti-racism campaign. We, of course, know that there is nothing new about this trend. The Liberals and Nationals have been borrowing heavily from the U.S. right-wing playbook for decades, and especially since former Prime Minister Howard started using migrants and refugees as scapegoats for political ends. But we should not be complacent. These hysterics, however ridiculous, do not come without consequence. The imaginary enemies you and the Murdoch media create out of vulnerable people, out of minorities, and their movement for justice are real people with real lives and human rights. The division you foster in this chamber becomes racist hate on the streets. The fear that you invent in your questions, your notices and speeches becomes physical assaults on a gay person. The Murdoch media rhetoric you repeat in here becomes a bullying attack on a trans kid in the playground. You should be ashamed. Everyone has the right to be respected and be safe. If you've got a moment to look away from Fox News and its local out outpost of cranks, Sky News, I've got news flash for you. We're not going anywhere. Our anti-racist movement is only growing. We will continue to fight against racism. We will continue to stand up for trans kids. Your petty Order. attacks will not Senator stop us. Faruqi. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. We need to talk about our national curriculum. Students right across Australia are currently leaving school with lower comprehension of basic skills than their contemporaries did only a decade ago. We are also seeing a decline in Australia's educational standings on an international level. In the OECD's program for international student assessment, known as PISA, Australia used to be one of the top 10 countries. We haven't been in the top 10 since 2009. We are currently ranked 29th for maths, 15th for science and 16th in reading. We are now in long-term decline and are lagging behind countries like Poland, Portugal and Slovenia, countries that we used to outrank. 
The Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority published their proposed new national curriculum in April. The news should have been met with positive media coverage, uh, support from federal, state and territory education ministers, academics and teachers praising the inclusion of particular concepts and methodologies. But unfortunately, this couldn't be further from the truth. Indeed, much of the media coverage highlighted concerning key elements of the proposed curriculum. We saw removing of the Australian history, which used to be, which used to be described, uh, sorry, which used to describe our nation as a secular, national, and a multi-faith society with a Christian heritage, and instead stating that Australia is a culturally diverse, multi-faith, -sec, multi secular, and pluralistic society with diverse communities, such as this, those distinct communities of the First Nations Australians. Minister Tudge, uh, along with state education ministers in New South Wales, South Australia and even in my home state of Western Australia went on to criti criticise elements of the review. One of their key criticisms was the exclusion of direct instruction, a method of teaching with over five decades of evidence proving its effectiveness. Instead, the proposed curriculum is still influenced by the constructivism theory, which promotes student-led inquiry learning over explicit learning. And earlier this month, we saw more than 40 people, including maths professors, teachers and teachers, warn ACARA in an open letter that the draft plan to fix the unambitious national maths curriculum will make it worse and that further elimination and weakening of the fundamental skills will contribute to the root cause of Australian students slipping in international comparisons. The students end up knowing less mathematics, they said. Although ACARA has said that the draft curriculum has borrowed from the Singapore curriculum, one of the letter signatories, uh, maths teacher and University of New South Wales PhD candidate Greg Ashman, noted that students in Singapore learn times tables in year two or three. The Institute of Public Affairs recently published polling showing, uh, which also shows that the proposed national curriculum is not supported by everyday Australians. Many parents are worried that their kids are being indoctrinated and taught to apologise and be shamed of who they are. In March this year, a school in Victoria forced boys to stand at assembly as a symbolic gesture of apology for the behaviours of their gender. These aren't small fry concerns. These aren't lone criticisms from fringe commentators. These are some of our best and brightest in the field of education telling us that something is dangerously wrong. There are, a clear, there are clear indicators of a larger problem within the pro proposed curriculum. Our education system should not become captive to social issues that aren't related to the core purpose, nor should it be reliant on the ability of teachers to instil historical nar narratives through their own relative lens. We need to get back to the core purpose of education, Education should be about preparing children to contribute to our community by leading a good and productive life. We should not sacrifice our children to the woke agenda, to the detriment of their ability to think critically, to analyse the world and grasp and apply concepts. This curriculum review is an opportunity for us to work on improving what our children learn and how, to best, and how uh, best for them to learn. I urge anyone who is concerned about what our kids' education and what they are being taught in schools to make a submission to the review. It is easy as sending an email. It is time to Order. get back to basics and stop the peace. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Until last night, I wanted to use this time to record the tragic death last month of Kunmanara Lester, a Yanka Dunjara, Anangu woman who was an esteemed anti-nuclear campaigner. I phoned Kunmanara's sister, Karina, last evening to talk about this address, only to learn that their mother, Mrs Lester, had just died. A double tragedy. I have known the Lester family for many years. Mrs Lester was a wonderful, strong woman, and I very much mourn her passing. Her husband, Kunmanara's father, was Yummy Lester. He was a much-respected anti-nuclear campaigner 
who went blind as a child after the British nuclear tests at Maralinga and Emu Junction in the 1950s. Yummy fought for the McLennan Royal Commission into the testings, which eventuated in 1985. He died four years ago. His late daughter, whom I will call Kunmanara, out of respect, was an ambassador uh, of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. The organisation was born in Melbourne in 2006 and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Kunmanara had two siblings, her sister Karina, whom I spoke to last night, and her brother Leroy. Kunmanara grew up in Alice Springs and then at Memory Community in the APY lands, where she developed her renowned horse, horse riding skills and cattle handling skills. In the early 90s, she returned with family to their traditional country at Wallatina Station in the far north of South Australia and managed the cattle pro project there with the support and encouragement of her father, Yummy. An ominous black mist had rolled across Wallatina after the British atmospheric nuclear explosions back in October 1953. And Kunmanara always believed that lingering contamination led to her acquiring a rare autoimmune disease, which was diagnosed in 2005. That diagnosis forced her to leave Wallatina and move to Adelaide. For many years before Kunmanara had acted as an interpreter for other Aboriginal people with disabilities, illness, cancer and organ failure, which she believed were legacies of the British testing. She continued work as an interpreter in Adelaide and was stirred to action in early 2015 when South Australian Premier Jay Weatherall established the Nuclear Fuel Cycle Royal Commission. Fearing that the government was moving to develop a dump in South Australia for international high-level nuclear waste, Kunmanara was instrumental and influential in the formation of the No Dumps Alliance. Kunmanara's illness drove her commitment to the anti-nuclear cause. Her, came required, her campaigning required extensive travel, including to her APY lands. She was certainly effective. Her sister Karina, in a Sydney Morning Herald profile in June 2017, described her as ambitious, passionate, strong-minded and sometimes pig-headed. The International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICAM, has lauded the work and advocacy of Kunmanara. The organisation says she was a voice for nuclear justice, a carrier of stories and a powerful advocate for a world free from nuclear weapons. She maintained her drive even as her health deteriorated. In 2016, with a suitcase of medical equipment, she joined her sister Karina and others on the Black Miss White Rain speaking tour in Adelaide, Sydney and Brisbane. Kunmanara was a fighter to the end. Her funeral will be held at Wallatina Station on Friday. It'll be a double, doubly sad occasion and I extend my sincere condolences uh, to the family. Kalia. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. If the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, the world's highest rated world heritage wilderness, continues to be mistreated, disrespected, privatised and developed, it could join the Great Barrier Reef with a UNESCO recommendation for an endangered listing. Both these unique, magnificent, enchanting wonders of our natural world are equally affected and suffering from the ravages of global warming under the watch of this climate-denying government. On the same day UNESCO declared the Great Barrier Reef in danger yesterday, the committee has also delivered a hefty blow to the Tasmanian Liberal government's dodgy expression of interest process for the development of the World Heritage Area. And while our Environment Minister, in extraordinary displays of dummy spitting, 
and tantrums in the last couple of days has claimed that she was blindsided by UNESCO's in danger listing, there's going to be no excuse now that she's been put on notice by UNESCO for her and her government's ignorance on what has been happening in the Tasmanian World Heritage Area. In recent days, just looking at the rhetoric, the significant ramping up of rhetoric against UNESCO, it seems this government will go to extreme lengths to shun the IUCN recommendation process uh, and the World Heritage in Danger process. And this is because UNESCO has been one of the only organisations capable of holding our federal government to account and embarrassing them on the international stage for their blatant disrespect of what makes our country, indeed, our world so special. The Tasmanian World Heritage Area meets every single natural criteria for World Heritage listing. It is the tied leader for satisfying the most criteria possible, seven out of ten, sharing the lead with Mount Taishan in China for its World Heritage values. But in a mind-blowing display of audacity, that didn't stop this federal government from attempting to delist 74,000 hectares of this Tasmanian World Heritage Area for logging some of the most magnificent carbon-rich mixed-species rainforests on the planet. That is, before UNESCO called them out and humiliated them. UNESCO has been raising concerns about the lack of strict criteria underpinning the state government's dodgy expression of interest process for tourism developments inside the Tasmanian World Heritage Area since 2016. It's clear the World Heritage Committee's concerns about the EOI process have not been eased by the Tasmanian government's tourism master plan, which once again UNESCO essentially had to hassle the Tasmanian government to deliver. In fact, far from it, they had to call on the state government to speed up the plan, which despite being first requested in 2015 was only released just last month. It's the blatant mismanagement of our wild places like this that has now forced UNESCO to request any development that impacts upon the Tasmanian World Heritage Area's outstanding universal values be referred to them for review. That's a rebuke. Our government, it seems, simply cannot be trusted. It's simply not acceptable for the Liberal Party and the National Party at both the state and federal level to pay lip service to UNESCO's demands. These areas, while we may be the custodian and the manager, are owned by all the people on this planet. It's not acceptable for them to push on with exploiting these precious areas simply for a few developers, a few special interests to profit from and make a buck. Tasmania's wilderness areas are globally significant and need the highest level of protection from threats such as inappropriate tourism development. And the Greens will continue to stand in the Australian Senate and in the Tasmanian Parliament and fight for the communities that don't want to see these areas ruined and exploited. Order. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, President. Well, this week the government has been focused on the numbers, the numbers in the Nationals' party room, numbers that have delivered a reheated, rehashed Deputy Prime Minister in Barnaby Joyce. But Australians, Australians are focused on the numbers that really matter. They are focused on the basic equations that matter to them. And they are asking themselves, am I better off now than eight years ago when this Liberal government first came into office? Are my wages going up enough to cover the rising cost of everything? Are my wages even going up at all? So after eight years, three terms, three prime ministers and three deputy prime ministers, what does this government actually add up to for the Australian people? Well, according to the Productivity Commission last week, it adds up to a country facing the worst decade for living, for living standards in over half 
a century, the worst decade for living standards in over half a century. It adds up to the worst wages growth on record. And just today, the McKell Institute reports that working Australians would be earning $250 a week more if wage growth had continued at the rate of the last Labor government. Australian workers are $250 a week worse off under this eight-year Liberal government. And what else does this tired eight-year government add up to? A record number, a record number of people are working more than two jobs working two jobs, three jobs to make ends meet. Almost a million Australians have to work two jobs or three jobs to make ends meet under this government. And job insecurity is eating away at Australian families. It is the big conversation that people are having right now, today. These are the numbers that Australians really care about. These are the numbers that Australians want their government to focus on. And these are the numbers that matter to Australians today. So here's the real equation on this eight-year Liberal government. Living standards going backwards, wages frozen and going backwards. Massive job insecurity and a government that is focused not on those numbers but on the numbers in their own party rooms. But members of this government come in here and they come in here slapping themselves on the back. They come in here telling each other what a great job they are doing. How good are we, they ask. Aren't we doing a great job? Well, let me tell you that it is the Australian people who are doing a great job right now. It is the essential workers of Australia who are keeping us safe, who are keeping this country running, who are doing a great job right now. It is Australia's people who are doing everything that is asked of them to fight this virus who are doing a great job right now, all while the government completely stuffs up on its main responsibilities, all while this government stuffs up its two major jobs that Australians need them to do. This government has completely stuffed up the two things that the Australian people really need the federal government to take responsibility for right now. They have stuffed up the vaccine rollout. They have stuffed up building quarantine facilities. The two things that Australians really need so they can feel safe, so they can feel secure. The two things that Australians really need to feel confident about the future. Because Australians, after the year that they have had, they deserve to feel confident about the future. Australians deserve to feel confident that there is a plan for their future. Australians should be able to count on one good secure job to get by, not two, three or even four insecure jobs. Australians should be able to count on their wages going up. Australians should be able to count on their living standards going forwards, not going backwards more than half a century. So while this tired eight-year-old government slaps itself on the back, while they focus on knifing each other in the back, on the Labor side, we are focused on the future. Labor will put good, secure jobs at the heart of our recovery, because we know the numbers that really matter to Australians, their jobs, their wages, their living standards and their futures. Thank you, Senator Walsh. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.